You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Barlow, one of the youngest, most brilliant and trusted men in the International Secret Police, has just brought a spectacular criminal case to a successful conclusion. Now he is about to go on a well-earned vacation, and we find him in his rooms with Speed Gibson, his orphaned 15-year-old nephew whom he is raising. He has his hands full, for Speed is the typical American boy, interested in shortwave radio, aviation, and most of all, in the International Secret Police. Because of Speed's interest in the organization and his evident aptitude, Clint has been teaching him as many rules and regulations of the secret police as he could without violating his oath of secrecy. As a result, Speed looks on crime as the height of weakness, failure, and cowardice, and has determined to do his part to end it. His admiration for his uncle and his work drives Speed on to study everything useful to a member of the secret police, for he is determined to join that organization and work with Clint. At the moment, however, Speed is working on a model of the China Clipper while Clint is reclining on the couch, snowed under with travel folders. Oh, oh boy. This is the life. <laughs> Nothing in the world to do but decide where to go on a vacation. Hey, let's see now. Here's Palm Springs, uh, Miami, the mountains. Uh, hey, Speed, where would you like to go best? China. Uh, China? Hey, look here, fella. I can only get away for about a week or ten days. It'd be reasonable. Uh, uh, what's that, Uncle Clint? Uh, oh, no, you didn't hear a word I said. Come back from wherever you are and listen to me, will you? This is important. Gee, I'm sorry, Clint. But when I get working on this clipper model, I forget about everything else around me. <laughs> you imagine you're actually flying in it, huh? I suppose I yanked you back from Wake Island when I asked you where we ought to go for our vacation. Mm, no, I, I believe it was Midway. <laughs> Say, Speed, with your imagination, you could stay right in this room and fly all over the world. Yeah, but I'd not rather really fly, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, flying is my middle name. I've had enough traveling for a while. What I want to find now is a nice, quiet place where there's nothing to do but rest. Oh, heck, that's no fun. Well, maybe not for you, but it's fun for me. On my vacation, I'm going to do nothing but enjoy the beauties of nature. No. Someone's at the door. <laughs> well, so I hear. Uh, see who it is, Speed. If anyone for me, tell them I have gone to China. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's Barney. Hello, kid. Is the mastermind at home? Yeah, he's on the couch trying to find a vacation spot where he can do nothing but admire the beauties of nature. Well, he don't have to go away on a vacation to do that as long as he's got me around. Oh, <laughs> say, when you come around, I see nothing but trouble. Now, you better not tell me that you've just come from headquarters and that the chief wants to see me about another job. Can't a guy drop in for a friendly visit without being accused of everything under the sun? No, I'm glad you came, Barney. Look at my clipper model. Say, that's a beaut, kid. First thing we know, you'll be piloting one of them clipper planes across the water. Maybe. But I'm going to be in the secret police like Clint and you. That's why I've been studying all the rules and regulations and asking you and Clint so many questions. <laughs> well, you've got a flair for it, all right, Speed. But you know, it's the hardest work a man can do. I'll say it is. Especially when you're in the strong arm division like me. That's what you want to work for, kid. Oh, is that so? Oh, listen, you big ox. Brains will get you out of many a fix that Braun never could. <laughs> I thought I'd get you off of that couch sooner or later. <laughs> the first time he's been off of his breakfast, Barney. And you'll notice I didn't use any muscles getting him off either. It was brains. 
Who was it said he had the brains and me the brawn for our partnership, huh? You both have plenty of both, if you ask me. I don't know what that's going to leave me when I start working with you. Oh, now, don't worry, Speed. You have youth, a fresh viewpoint. Say, we've been in the game so long, we're apt to get in a rut. You'll be able to see many things that we may overlook. Well, now that that's all settled, is there anything to eat in this place? No, but that's an idea. Now, what do you say uh, you go out and buy some food and bring it back here? You, oh, yeah? If I get food, I should come back here with it. Oh, please, Barney. Can I go on your vacation with you if I do? Uh, huh? Nothing doing. I see enough of you when I'm working with you. I want to rest in peace. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you'd have been resting in peace long ago. I've gotten you out of plenty of scrapes. Why, the yeah, time... All right, all right now, yes. I admit that I couldn't breathe if it weren't for you. But if you'll only forget the past and stop talking shop. I'm on my vacation, my boy, even if I am still at home. I bet you'll stay at home, too, Clint. The chief will have a new case for you before we can get away. Uh, he will not, because we're leaving tonight. Where are you going? I uh, don't know yet. And I do know it'll be someplace where headquarters can't reach me. Uh-oh. <laughs> so you're going on a vacation, huh? Uh, answer it, Speed. Say I'm not here. But, Clint... Uh, answer it. Hello? Oh, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, he's here. For you, Clint. It's the chief. <laughs> Speaks well for your training, Clint. The kid won't lie even for you. No, sir. Hello, chief. Hmm? Uh, yes, we're leaving tonight. Chief, it's another big job. I wish you'd take it. Uh, what's that, chief? Oh, now, look here, sir. You promised me a vacation, and I'm going to hold you to that promise. Well, if something's up, let the other boys handle it. Why, sure, you're plenty of good men there. Yes. Uh, no. Yes. Uh, no. I wish he'd make up his mind. Shh, I want to hear. Oh, yes, I can reach Barney Dunlap for you. He's right here. Uh, what's that, Chief? You want speed. Gee, the Chief wants me. Right down and listen. Oh, no, I can't do that, sir. I I'm very sorry, but... Oh, yes, I'll send Barney over, but don't count on me. And certainly not speed. Uh, what's that, Chief? The octopus. I'll be right over. Yes, sir. Uh, what's on the fire, Clint? What the Chief want me for, Clint? Uh, the vacation's off, Speed. Come on, Barney. we got to get down to headquarters right away. The octopus gang's at work again. The octopus gang? Suffer and wang doodles. Where to now? Uh, Hong Kong. Oh, where's my tie? Where's that coat? Here they are, Clint. But well, what's the octopus gang? Oh, it's the worst criminal gang in modern history, Speed. No one has ever seen the leader, the octopus, but his organization covers the earth, exactly like the tentacles of a giant octopus. He's diabolical, a genius of evil, with a brain so brilliant that he has successfully eluded every effort made by Scotland Yard, the French Sûreté, and even our own secret police. Gee, he's your public enemy number one then, isn't he? Kid, from all I've heard of him, he's a super colossal public enemy number one. Yes, and his power is constantly growing. He must be trapped. It'll be our biggest job, Barney. I'm ready for it, buddy. Well, come on, then. The chief naturally didn't give me any details on the case over the phone. He just mentioned the octopus. But that was enough for me. But what about me, Clint? The chief mentioned me, too, didn't he? Oh, yes, Pete, but he had the wrong idea. Haven't time to tell you now. I will when I get back. Oh, no, Clint. Let me go with you, please. Now, Speed, what's the most important thing a member of the secret police must know? How, how to obey orders. Well, then, as your superior officer, I order you to remain here until we get back. Yes, sir. And carry on with the China Clipper while we're gone, fella. Gee, Barney, how can I work on a Clipper, model when there's something really big in the air? Well, kid, I don't know. I wonder what the chief wanted with me. Oh, doggone it. So long, kid. I'll bring some food back. Clint always says how fine I'm doing in the secret police studies. But when I maybe get a chance to do some real work, what happens? I gotta stay home. No adventures could ever happen here at home. Oh, now what? Oh, uh, hello. Does Clint Barlow hang out here? Clint Barlow? Why, uh, he's not here. Oh, no. Don't try shutting the door in my face. If he ain't here, that's fine. I'll just come in and wait. <laughs> but not long enough for him to get back. Uh, who, who are you? Just call me Blackie if you must call me something. Yeah. Yeah. Nice little joint Barlow's got here. Well, what do you want with my uncle? Listen, I didn't come here to answer no questions, see? Just keep out of my way and you won't get hurt. But don't bother me none. I I won't, but 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 I gotta make a few phone calls. Keep away from that phone if you want to stay healthy. Well, I I'm speaking of phones. Your uncle was talking on that one just a few minutes ago, wasn't he? I I, I don't know. You don't, huh? And I'll tell you, he was and I wasn't here. Barlow was chinning with his chief about the octopus gang. Octopus? 
Uh, that's a kind of fish, isn't it? Sometimes. Play dumb if you want, Speed Gibson, but you ain't fooling nobody. I heard the chief talking to Barlow about you. You, you heard him? Yeah, your phone wires tapped. I didn't learn much, but what I did hear made me kind of curious. I saw Barlow and his pal leave, so I thought I'd mosey in and learn some more. Well, who are Never you? Never mind. I'm going to take a look around. Maybe I'll find something that'll tell me more than you can. Hey, hey, keep away from that desk. Who says so? Sit down and shut up. Keep your hands off those things. You keep away from me or I'll fix it so you won't worry about what I'm doing here. Huh. What's that on the table? My clipper ship. Yeah? I suppose your Uncle Clint made it for you. No, I made it. It's just like the real one. The body's real heavy. I weighted it so as it'd have perfect balance. Uh, I ain't interested in clipper ships. Well, here's one that'll be interesting to you. Oh. Golly, I knocked him cold. Hey, Pete, let us in. Have your luck in this door. Yeah, I forgot my hat. Suffering wang doodles. Who's this guy? Somebody's put him on ice. And look at Speed's clipper model. It's wrecked. Yeah, I ruined it. Who is this man? He was looking through all your papers in the desk here. And he knew about you talking with the chief about the octopus gang. Said he'd tapped our wires. Let me get the handcuffs on him. Did I do the wrong thing, Clint? The wrong thing? Why, you're the best man of the three of us. Come on, get your coat, Speed. You've got to come along and deliver your prisoner. What? If the chief doesn't make you a bona fide member of the secret police for this, I'll eat Barney's hat. Speed, you're the first person who's ever captured an octopus gangster. Come on, let's get to headquarters. The International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. In the first episode, you remember, Clint Barlow, brilliant young operator of the International Secret Police, was called to his chief's headquarters for details of a new case concerning the activities of the octopus, the most dangerous criminal alive. With Clint was Barney Dunlap, his right-hand man. During their absence, a member of the octopus gang came to Clint's rooms, and in spite of the presence of Speed Gibson, Clint's 15-year-old nephew, sought to go through the operator's papers. Speed knocked the man unconscious with the model of the China Clipper that he was constructing, and now we find Speed, Clint, and Barney in the chief's office with their sullen prisoner, Blackie Spears. Why did you go to Barlow's room, Blackie? I ain't talking. He did plenty of talking to me, Chief Riley. He knew that Clint and Barney were on their way here. Said our telephone wires had been tapped, and he'd heard you talking to Clint. And he arrived shortly after Clint and Barney left, huh? Yes, sir. Well, that means he must have been in the same building. Maybe he took a room there, too. But why? Why was my phone line tapped? Now, how did he know anything was in the wind? The octopus has ways of knowing things, Clint. Almost before anyone else knows about them. Blackie, it'll be a little easier on you if you'll tell us what you know. You're in a secret police. Supposing you find all that out for yourself. Let me smack him one, Chief. No, Barney. Keep your fist to yourself. We'll keep Blackie Spears with us for a while. Maybe he won't talk to us, but neither will he be able to talk to his gang or be able to get word to the octopus as to what's happened. You can't keep me here. No, can't we? You force an entrance into my rooms, admit to my nephew that you tap my phone wires, then you go through my private papers. We can keep you here, all right. Yeah? Well, if it hadn't been for that kid slugging me with his aeroplane, you guys never would have touched me. I'll get you for that, Speed Gibson. You just try anything and I'll sock you again. That's the Speed aren't going to help you any, Blackie. Take him out, Barney. Tell Kelly to put him in solitary. Yes, sir. Come on, tough guy. You can't do this to me, I tell you. The gang will rub you out. Ah, save your breath. We don't scare you. Well, I guess that takes care of Blackie Spears, all right. Yeah, thanks to you, Speed. 
you hadn't used your wits, he'd have gotten away or perhaps shot it out with Clint and Barney when they returned before he expected them. <laughs> That's right, Chief Riley. And all because Barney forgot his hat. Well, he made me sore, going through Clint's papers like that. And the secret police books I've been studying say that you should never give a criminal an even break. <laughs> Something to that effect, Speed. The idea is that the criminal never gives the detective a chance, so it's better to capture him first, disarm him, and then start talking. I sure smashed my china clipper on his head. <laughs> Didn't do his head any good, either. <laughs> Has a lump on it about the size of an egg. Speed, how would you like to fly in the real china clipper? The real clipper? Oh, gee, Chief. Honest? Now, wait, now hold on there, Speed. Now, what do you mean, Chief? Well, you remember I said something over the phone about using speed on this job, Clint? Mm-hmm. And I said no. Oh, Clint. So, supposing you hear the whole story before making a decision, Clint. Our Far East operator sent word by code that the octopus has reared his ugly head in China. Hong Kong, to be exact. Mm, what's his racket this time? Smuggling. Dope and natives. Running dope in and natives out. Doing it on a wholesale scale. His enormous and very effective organization makes his illegal business a lot safer than most legal businesses. And far more profitable. And the best way to combat the evil is at the source. China. Mm-hmm. You want Barney and me to break it wide open, huh? Yes. You're to take the next clipper ship. Leaves day after tomorrow. I've already reserved passage for you. You proceed to Hong Kong at once. Good. Doesn't give us much time, but I've done more and less. Lucky, though, you reserved the passages. Yes, for you, Barney, and Speed. Oh, boy! Oh, now, listen, Chief. Now, Speed doesn't fit into this picture. I wouldn't think of taking him into that hotbed of danger. He's already in it, Clint. I said before that the octopus has ways of knowing things. Perhaps he already knows of Speed's part in Blackie's capture. Once you leave for China, no matter where, you may send your nephew. His life will be in actual danger. Well, that's true. On the other hand, the octopus will never dream that he's traveling with you. In fact, he can have no knowledge that you're crossing on the China Clipper. And this is where your uncanny knowledge of makeup may bring you close to the octopus. Oh, you mean I should uh, use a disguise? eh? Well, you've never been yourself on any job you've undertaken. That's been one of your secrets of success. No criminal knows how the real Clint Barlow looks except Blackie Spears. And his knowledge won't do him any good for a long time. That's right, Clint. You know more about makeup than any actor. Oh, you can change your whole appearance by just adding a little to your nose or changing your eyebrows or taping your eyes. Yes, the stage lost an excellent actor. And the secret police gained its best operator. But I not only want you to travel under an assumed face and personality, Clint, but Barney and Speed as well. No one is to know who you are. Your safety lies in your lost identity. Well, it's an old story to me, Chief, but as for Speed here, Please I Please let don't me know. go, Clint. I can help out in all sorts of ways. I'm counting on you, Speed. Your quick thinking in Blackie's case convinced me that you can help us in the capture of the octopus. You'll never be in the front line, so to speak. That'll keep him out of actual danger, Clint. But you as a boy will be able to see and learn things that an adult cannot. You bet I will. Oh, gee, Clint. Can I go? Can I? Well, after what Chief Riley has said about the danger of leaving you here, and if I can use makeup on you, uh... All right. Yes, you can go. I, I can't see anything else now. We, Oh, boy, what adventure this is going to be. Not an adventure, Speed. But hard, dangerous work. The odds are tremendously against capturing the octopus. But you can't fail. And now, I have here full details as to the course I've laid out for you, Clint. Oh, but first I must swear Speed into the International Secret Police. Are you ready to take the oath, Speed? I... I'm ready, sir. Then listen carefully and see if you're still willing to join our force after hearing the oath. Yes, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you, Speed Gibson, as a member of the International Secret Police, promise to obey and protect law and order in your own country or wherever else your duties may carry you? Will you cooperate with the foreign police after you have fulfilled your mission? And will you, above all else, recognize the code of the secret police? Courage, honor, and silence. And not betray it in any manner whatsoever? I promise, sir. (sighs) You've bitten off a large hunk there, fellas. And I welcome our newest and youngest member. Thank you, Chief. (laughs) What's going on here? Barney, I'm a member of the International Secret Police now. And I'm going with you to capture the octopus. Huh? That's right, Barney. After we get our orders from the Chief, we're off. Off where? Alameda. After I change our appearance with makeup... Alameda, you mean... We're taking the China Clipper day after tomorrow. Well, 
There's the clippers, feed. Isn't it a beauty? Look at that wing spread. Yeah, I hope them wings are spread enough to take us where we're going. <laughs> oh, God, darn this mustache. <laughs> What's the matter, Barney? Oh, this phony misplaced eyebrow you stuck on my upper lip tickles. <laughs> it sure looks like it grew there, though, Barney. And that squint that Clint gave you... I never know you in a million years. Yeah, well, I wouldn't know you either. What with them specs you're wearing and the way Clint made your nose thinner by shading it with grease paint, you look real studious. Not like the guy that knocked Blackie over the head with a clipper model. <laughs> and Clint looks kind of foreign, don't he? With his hair dyed black and curled. He darkened his skin, too, and wearing kind of foreign clothes. Like a Frenchman. Well, now, don't forget that I'm supposed to be your French tutor, Speed. Now, wait. Have you got the whole story straight? I think so. Barney here's supposed to be my dad. We're from Texas. Yeah. He's kind of rich from his oil wells and wants me to grow up a gentleman. And you're supposed to help make me one, teaching me French and manners. The whole thing's crazy, if you ask me. Yeah, but nobody's asking you. You just stick to that story. Uh, what's your name? My... Now I know you're crazy. Oh, not your real one, your assumed name. Oh, um, Fletcher, Jim Fletcher. And speed here is Earl. <laughs> Earl Wells, get it? <laughs> yes, and I'm Pierre Dorset. Now, I'm going to speak with a very slight French accent. And uh, you'd better use a drawl, Barney. Well, what should I use? Well, you talk as you always do, Speed. It'll be safer because you're not as old in the game as we are. You might forget to keep up an accent. Well, anyhow, you're getting an education from your French tutor and by traveling around the world. Hot ziggity! Now, oh, now, don't say things like that. In fact, the less you say in public, the better. Kind of carries out the student idea. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to be thinking instead of talking. Say, they're winding up the clipper motors. Yeah, won't be long now. Yeah, they're warming them up. Gee, I'm so excited, I don't know what to do. Just think, I'm really going to fly in a China clipper. Wait a minute, what's wrong? That man in that blue shirt suit standing right over there? Remember him, Barney? Say, wasn't he in on that jewel smuggling racket three years ago? Right. One of the cleverest smugglers in the business. But we caught him and I thought he was safe behind the bars for a good long time. He must have been paroled. Yeah, but why is he going on the China Clipper at this time? Say, I wonder if he's going in with the octopus on his smuggling. Hmm, we don't even have to wait to get to China before we start meeting up with that gang. Yeah, maybe I'm all wrong. Maybe his going is pure coincidence. And then again, maybe not. Do you think he'll recognize you and Barney, Clint? No, Steve. Our disguise is entirely different. On the board for the China Clipper. Stop at Honolulu, Midway Island, Wake Island, Guam, Manila, and the Orient. Gee, now we can go aboard. Oh, wait, wait a minute, Steve. Let our friend in the Blue Surge get aboard first. What happens when we get to Manila? We'll wait and see what happens aboard the Clipper first, Barney. Can we go now, Clint? The flight crew has gone aboard. Yes, but remember, from now on, when there's anyone else within hearing distance, you're Earl Fletcher, Barney is Jim Fletcher, and I'm Pierre Dorsey. You got it? Yes, Monsieur Dorsey. Monsieur Dorsey. Now watch yourself. Here come some other passengers and... Wait a minute. What do you see? That man in the blue serge suit. He's talking to that little guy in the checkered suit. Yeah, and they're looking straight at us. Clint, that guy has spotted us. He's recognized us. They're going to keep us from getting aboard. He's calling that policeman. Come on, we've got to make it. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. 
As you remember, in the last episode, Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, ace operator in the International Secret Police, and Barney Dunlap, Clint's working partner, were about to board the China Clipper in disguise and under assumed names bound for Hong Kong, where the dread criminal, the octopus, has renewed his smuggling activities. Just as they approach the giant plane, however, Clint recognizes in one of the other passengers a jewel smuggler whom he and Barney sent to prison a few years previously. The man sees them at the same time, says a few words to his companion, who in turn summons a nearby police officer. The boys try to get to the plane, but are stopped by the officer and the smuggler, who claims to be a private detective and who says that Clint, Barney, and Speed have been acting suspiciously and should be held for investigation. For a few tense moments, it looks as if the boys will miss the clipper plane, but Chief Riley has been so careful about their passports, using their assumed names and disguises, and has provided credentials so excellent that the officer at last releases our friends and reprimands the supposed private detective to be more careful of his accusations thereafter. He mumbles something about mistaken identity. Then he and the boys board the plane, and now we find our friends comfortably seated in the clipper, six hours out of San Francisco. Gee, I can, I can hardly believe that we're really flying in the clipper. Seems most too good to be true. I'd hate to be flying without it. We must be plenty high to be above the fog down there, Speed. Yeah. Isn't this swell, Barney? The moon makes the fog look all silver. Folks down on the ocean probably can't see the moon at all or the stars. Up here, they're as big as anything. Well, don't get so excited about it, kid. See, I, I can hardly believe we're really on the China Clipper. Well, you'd better start believing it, Speed, with that jewel smuggler aboard. I'm just as sure he's a member of the octopus gang as I'm sure we're in the air. I think so, too, Clint. Else why'd he try to keep us ashore by framing us with that cop? Yeah, our passports are what saved us. And see that you remember who those passports are made out for, Steve. Now, Barney here is supposed to be Jim Fletcher, a retired Texas oil man. And you're his son, Earl. And I'm your French tutor, Pierre Dorset. Don't forget all that when we're talking where people can overhear us, kid. Well, I won't, Barney. Clint, you look so different with your hair dyed black and curled. And Barney with that fake squint and mustache. You think that smuggler really knew who you both were? Well, I don't know, Speed. Criminals are suspicious of everything and everyone. Now, he may have glimpsed something familiar about us, or, or his instinct may have warned him of danger. Rather than take any chances, he tried to keep us from flying on the same ship with him. Yeah, all that business about him being a private detective and us the crooks. I wanted to turn him over to the cop. Oh, and reveal who we really were. Oh, don't be a chump, Barney. We can't make an official move while we're traveling in disguise and under assumed names. I know, I know. Have to take everything and can't dish anything out in return. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Barney. We'll get our earnings when we reach Hong Kong. Meanwhile, think of all the excitement we're going to have during the trip. Oh, it doesn't seem possible that we'll reach the Hawaiian Islands tomorrow morning. Yeah, these ships are plenty fast. It's only 18 hours flying time between Alameda and Honolulu. And after that, our next stop is Midway Island. Gosh. How long is the stop over at Honolulu? Oh, uh, just about 24 hours. We take off again the next morning, uh, providing the weather is right. And am I going to make use of them 24 hours? No sleeping for me. I'm going to go swimming at Waikiki Beach, eat fish and poi, listen to ukuleles, and maybe watch some of those hula dances I've been hearing so much about. You can do that if you want, Barney. But I'm going to watch that jewel smuggler. And if I have any spare time, I'm going surfboard riding. Boy, I can hardly wait. This is the life, Clint. <clears throat> Lunch at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and now basking on the sands of Waikiki Beach. Yeah, but I wish I could be in that water with speed. <laughs> look, look at that kid right that surfboard in. Oh, he's part flying fish anyhow. You know, Clint, sometimes it makes me stop and think. That kid can do almost everything with just a little practice. Things that it takes me years to learn. <laughs> it just runs in the family, Barney. <laughs> We're just naturally smart. Oh, yeah? If you're so smart, why didn't you fix this phony mustache of mine so it wouldn't float off in water? I want to go swimming. Well, try growing one, then you can. <laughs> Besides, I didn't think you wanted to leave the beach uh, as long as that uh, girl was on it. Uh, oh, you've noticed her too, huh? Well, I noticed her during lunch at oh, the hotel. Yeah. She had a little girl with her then. Yeah, she's still with her, at least near her. 
See, and the water almost in a direct line with speed. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I see her now. Well, I hope she doesn't go out too far. Looks like she can't swim. She's watching speed. Say, look at that big coma racing toward her. Suffering wang doodles. She's lost her foot and she's going out to sea. Well, come on, let's go after her. Oh, speed, speed, Caesar. Hope he can grab her. Speed, speed. Try to keep your head up. I'm coming. I'm coming. Here, here, grab my hand. That's right. Now you're all right. Don't try to swim. Don't try to do anything. Just relax and I'll get you ashore. That big wave knocked me down. No. Don't waste breath. Rockin'. Oh, oh, swell. Then Bonnie are away not to help me. Just come for more, Steve. Look out for that big finger. Ah! Ah! Now, don't be frightened. That wave tilted. It, it brought us in. Yeah, I'll take the little girl. You would have been so tough, but, but for the undertow, he kept pulling against us. Be careful. Careful, hit comes the young lady. Are you all right? I think so, Martin. Oh, sure, she's all right, miss. Just a little waterlogged, I reckon. She'll be good as new when she's dried out. Oh, how can I ever thank you all? And particularly this young man for saving her. Why, Jean would have been swept out to sea if he hadn't been so near her and acted so quickly. Oh, Marcia, I thought I was going to drown. Oh, there, there, darling. You're safe now. And don't you think you'd better thank your rescuer? Thank you. Uh, what is your name? Spear. Um, uh, Earl Fletcher. Uh, may I introduce ourselves? Earl is the son of Mr. James Fletcher, and I am Monsieur Dorsey, the young gentleman's tutor. Oh, I don't need to tell you how happy we are to meet you all. This is Jean Kingsley, and I'm Marcia Winfield, her governor. Oh, uh, uh, Will you and little Jean have supper with us tonight, Miss Winfield? Why, I, well, yes. Probably Miss Winfield will be dining with Mademoiselle Jean's parents, Mr. Fletcher. Oh, no. You see, Jean's father is in China in the diplomatic service. Oh, then it's a cinch you won't be eating with him this evening. So you will eat with us, huh? Well, yes, Mr. Fletcher, we'd love to. And now I'd better take Jean back to the hotel to recover from the effects of her narrow escape. Thank you again. Goodbye, Speed, Clint, and Barney. Huh? Hey, those aren't our names. Why, no, Jean. Wherever did you hear those names? Oh, that's what they called one another when I was being saved, Marsha. How come you heard anything when you were half drowned? Oh, I don't remember calling anybody anything. I was too busy trying to get in. Well, probably the child heard us urging Earl to exercise more speed in effecting the rescue. Under such circumstances, it is only natural that such confusion should occur. Oh, no, Mr. Dorsey. I heard you plain as anything. Jean, you mustn't contradict. And now come along. We'll see our friends later. Yeah, Goodbye. 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 Wouldn't you know a girl here thinks she shouldn't, even when she was drowning? Mm, out of the mouths of babes. The accident of a split second can upset weeps of careful planning. Nothing's upset. Miss Winfield didn't pay any attention to the kid. Well, maybe not. But that girl has brains as well as beauty, Bonnie. And you didn't help manners any, Romeo, by asking her to dine with us tonight. Say, the more we stay to ourselves, the less chance of a split up. Ah, oh, a little supper won't hurt anything. <laughs> we can tell more about that after supper. Would you care for some more ice cream, Mademoiselle Jean? No, thank you, Mr. Dorsey. I'd like some more. More? You had two dishes already. Another one and you'd never leave this table. <laughs> well, you wouldn't mind staying in Honolulu, would you, Earl? Well, it's swell here, Miss Winfield, but, but I'm looking forward to the rest of our clipper trip. Midway, Wake, and Guam Islands, Manila, and then Hong Kong. Gee. Hong Kong. Yes, I'm anxious to reach China, too. You going over soon? Tomorrow morning. We'll be fellow passengers on the clipper ship, Mr. Fletcher. Will you? You and little Jean are flying to China, Mademoiselle? Yes. I took the position as governess to Jean with that understanding. You see, her father went there six months ago and left Jean in my charge with instructions to bring her over as soon as he gave me the word to come. 
Well, I received that word just the other day, and I was fortunate in being able to get passages on the clip. Oh, that's swell, because... Uh, the, the check, Mr. Fletcher. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, uh, check. Oh, yeah, the dinner check. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see what the damages are. What's that note under it? Uh, note? Yeah. It isn't addressed to anyone. Here, I'll open it. What does it say, Earl? It says, to all at this table, better not attempt the impossible. Leave well enough alone and do not take the clipper tomorrow morning. The octopus gives but one warning. The octopus? Do you know what this means, mademoiselle? Yes. Yes, that note is meant for me. The octopus is a terrible criminal who has brought tragedy into my life. I... Go on, Miss Winville. I can't. I dare not. He knew I was here. He or his spies may be listening to me right now. But he's the reason I must go to China. Can we help you, Miss Winfield? I don't know. But I trust you and Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Fletcher. I feel that you're perhaps the only people in the whole world I can trust. Will you, for Jean's sake, will you give us your protection until we reach Hong Kong? But, Miss Winfield, I... Oh, after we reach China and Jean is safe with her father, I won't bother you anymore. What I must do then, I must do alone. But until then, will you promise us your protection? You have my promise. And mine, mademoiselle. Me too, Miss Winfield. We'll lick this octopus by whoever he is. I'm not afraid of anybody who's afraid to fight in the open. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. last episode, you remember, Speed, Clint, and Barney arrived at Honolulu under assumed names and disguises. That same day, Speed rescued little Gene Kingsley from drowning at Waikiki Beach, and through his heroism, the boys became acquainted with Marsha Winfield, her governess. The little girl heard the boys call one another by their true names during the excitement of her rescue, and speaks of this at dinner that evening. They deny it, of course, since utmost secrecy must surround their real reason for making the clipper trip the capture of the criminal, the octopus. Clint figures that they will leave the islands in the morning, however, and thus escape the danger of being identified as members of the international secret police. But a note is brought to the table where they are dining with Miss Winfield and Jean. It is signed by the octopus and warns them to turn back before it is too late. Marcia takes this as a personal warning, saying that the criminal has brought tragedy into her life and that she is taking Jean to her father in China in the morning on the clipper ship. She begs their protection for the duration of the trip, and the boys promise it, though it may complicate matters even more. Just now, we find Jean and Speed on the veranda of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel that same evening. <sighs> the water looks like diamonds sparkling in the moonlight, doesn't it? Earl, I'm talking to you. Uh, What? I bet your name is really Speed and not Earl at all. Yes, well, why don't you answer me when I call you Earl? Didn't answer because I was thinking about something else. And I wish you'd give over that silly idea about my name being Speed. It's Earl. Earl Fletcher. All right. But I like Speed better than I do Earl. You do, huh? But Earl's still my name. Uh-huh. And the water still looks like diamonds sparkling in the moonlight, doesn't it? No. Just looks like a lot of water to me. Speaking of diamonds... Is that Diamond Head Rock over there? Yes. Why, you haven't got your glasses on now. And still you can see as good as anything. Why do you wear glasses if you don't need them? Uh, but I can't see. I mean, uh, I, I do need them. 
I could just make out a big black mass against the skyline over there. Well, that's why I had to ask you if it was Diamond Head. You're always explaining things. It's very mysterious. There's nothing mysterious about it. You just have to have things explained to you. Nothing but mysterious things. But I like mysteries. That's why I like you and Mr. Dorsey. I think he's wonderful. And say, Claire, uh, Monsieur Dorsey is wonderful. He's sure been a pal to me. Taught me everything I know. Of course. He's your tutor, isn't he? Well, uh, uh, sure. You see, it's... Oh, uh, here uh, they are. Enjoying the beautiful tropical night? Oh, Monsieur Dorsey. Boy, am I glad to see you. Oh, Earl, that is not very flattering to your little companion. Oh, she's all right. But she has so many questions. <laughs> and he has such a hard time answering them. <laughs> I can readily understand that. Jean can ask more difficult questions than anyone I know. They weren't either difficult, Marsha. Just why Earl wears glasses when he doesn't have to. And why he doesn't answer when I call him <coughs> Earl. And why... <coughs> oh, Mr. Fletcher, what's the matter? Here, Papa. Here, Papa, I'll pat you on the back. <coughs> Uh, uh, get away. Your pets are worse than my strangling. Are you all right now, Mr. Fletcher? Ooh, uh, uh, not quite, honey. The only thing that can cure one of my coffin spells is a long walk. Uh, 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 come on, boys. I, I think we'd better take that walk right now. Uh, good night. Good night. Oh, we'll see you in the morning. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, come along, Earl. Uh, <coughs> that coffin spell of yours sure got us out of a tight pinch, Barney. Sure was lucky you swallowed wrong. You swallowed wrong? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was using my brains, kid. Brains that Clint thinks I haven't got. Oh, quit boasting. Let's head for the telegraph office. Huh? I must send a cable to the chief. About the jewel smuggler being aboard the plane? Yeah, this is the first time that we're completely unobserved. Now's our chance to really get down to business. Are you going to wire Chief Riley direct, Clint? Uh, not exactly, Speed. His name, address, and of course the message will all be in code. Yeah, I know the business. Instead of cabling Chief Riley, International Secret Police, International Building, New York, we send it to Fifi's Hat Box, Fifth Avenue... Fifi's hat bar. Uh, yes, we, we're using a millinery store as a front. Something to tie in with my French disguise. You see, Fifi is supposedly my sweetheart, to whom I send letters and cables telling of my undying devotion. But really, you're talking about smugglers and adventures. Hot dog. <laughs> so Chief Riley's Fifi. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you just picture the chief making a hat? <laughs> oh, here, here, quiet, quiet. Even though the street is practically deserted, you don't have to shout everything, you know. Oh, we're safe enough. By the way, you going to tell the chief about Miss Winfield and Jean overhearing us call one another by our right names? No, after all, they may have completely believed our explanation. Miss Winfield, maybe, but not that Jean. He's got a memory like an elephant. Well, at least they won't be able to give us away until we reach Hong Kong, if we're going to protect them from the octopus on the rest of the trip. Uh, don't kid yourself, buddy. From the way this trip has begun, anything can happen. But right now, let's get this cable off to the chief. Huh? Speaking of our secret code, Clint, have you got the key to the code written out so I can memorize it like the chief told me? Uh, yes, I have, Speed. And the chief was more than right when he told you to memorize the key so that you can decipher any of our messages to and from him without referring to the paper. I'll say so. There'll be many a time when you won't have a chance to look up the messages from the code key. I know. I would have memorized the key long before we left Alameda if I'd known I was going to really be one of the secret police. I didn't even know you had a code. Clint never told me about it. <laughs> well, after all, I, I am in the secret police speed. The pride of the service. <laughs> now, don't start heckling, Barney, or I'll never find out about the code key. Where have you got it hidden, Clint? Well, it's in my belt buckle, Speed. Belt buckle? Yes, it has a false back, which can only be moved by pressing a tiny spring. It's such a complicated thing that it makes a very safe hiding place. While the cleverest man would never dream that it was anything more than an ordinary belt buckle. Gee, no. I've seen it hundreds of times and never guessed it held anything more than your belt. Well, I'll show you how it works later on. Now, we'd better get to that code message off to the chief. And after that? Then we'll go back to the hotel and get some sleep. I don't know how you all feel, but I need plenty of shut eye. <laughs> Me too. Oh, we'll sleep if Barney doesn't keep us awake with his snoring. Me snore? What's the idea of always blaming me for such things? I never snored in my life. Snore that. I ought to know. <laughs> What 
Stockard. Stockard. Gee whiz, Barney can sure snore. Wonder if that's what woke me up. Can't be, because he's been doing that ever since he went to sleep. I can't sleep, so I think I'll go out and see what I can see from the balcony. If I can get out of bed without waking up Clint. Golly, this bed's creaking's almost as loud as Barney's snoring. Uh, Gee, this Hawaiian moonlight's sure pretty. What was that? Sounds like it came from below the balcony. Something's crawling up the vines, trying to get up on our balcony. Clint, Clint, wake up. Huh? What's that? What's wrong, Speed? Somebody's crawling up to our balcony. Whoever it is, I have to fall over Barney to get in here. He would drag his bed in front of the French door so he could get enough air. Good thing. His snoring will cover whatever noise we make. Yeah. You slip out of bed on your side, Speed, and I'll do the same. And make as little noise as possible. Yeah. Mm. There. Now, keep in the shadows until you get to the French door, Speed. We'll wait for him on either side. Oh, he's kind of in the way. He'll get more air if that guy comes through. See? Listen. Speed. There's his shadow falling over Barney. He'll be in full view in a minute. I see it. He'll be inside before we can reach the French doors, Clint. Yeah, maybe, but we still have the odds on our side. He's in light and we're in shadow. He won't be able to see us until he's clear out of the moonlight. Look, there he is. Yeah, keep down, Speed. And one thing more. If he has a gun, stay out of it and tire. Drop to the floor and leave him to me. Oh, Clint. Orders? Y- yes, sir. Mm, gee, oh, Barney doesn't pick this time to wake up. Our visitor hopes so, too. Oh, look. Look, he's frozen in his tracks. Oh, what's Barney saying? He's talking in his sleep. Look. The man on the balcony's coming closer. He wants to hear what he's saying, too. Oh, I smell. The man's pulled a gun. Now, now listen, you stay out of this speed. I'm going to crawl along the floor so I'll be near Barney if this fellow tries any rough stuff. I'm coming, too. You are not. I've got to, Clint. Barney needs help. All right, then, come on. But stay close to the floor. Oh, Marcia, you've got beautiful eyes. Oh, but I'm going to be true to Phoebe. Phoebe, Marcia, Phoebe. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, hey, hey! What? What? Who? Who? Who are you? Help! Help! Police! Keep down! Hey, he's got a gun! Come on! Get up! I got him! Get him! I got him by the leg! Uh, Monster Dorsey! Help! Get off my neck! Help! Police! Hey, look out! Look out! The gun! Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed. Clint and Barney send a cablegram in code to Chief Riley of the International Secret Police stating that a jewel smuggler was also aboard the clipper bound for Hong Kong. But they did not mention that Marsha Winfield, governess to little Jean Kingsley, is also going to China and has asked their protection during the flight. 
hinting that she, too, is seeking the mysterious criminal, the octopus. That same night, they surprise an intruder in their bedroom and after a terrific struggle, overcome the man and discover him to be the jewel smuggler who was aboard the China Clipper. After turning the man over to the local police, we find the boys talking in their room just as dawn is breaking. What a night. I'm sleeping along just as peaceful. And all of a sudden, I wake up and see that guy's face almost touching mine. He was trying to hear what you were saying in your sleep, Barney. It's getting so a guy don't have any privacy at all anymore. People climbing up balconies and listening to every word you say. Uh, we're darn lucky to get out of that as well as we did. What would you stirring up such a rumpus? What'd you expect me to do? Give that thug a sweet smile? Well, they gave him plenty of noise. And on top of that, you couldn't find the lights. Of course I couldn't. Somebody's foot was in my eye. <laughs> It sure was a mess. Half the time, I didn't know which was Barney and which was the jewel smuggler. Oh, so you're the guy that kept hitting me in the dark. No, Barney, honest. Well, if you ask me, we were lucky to get out of it as easy as we did. That smuggler waving his gun around like that. Hey, one of us might have been seriously hurt. I'll say. The darkness made it hard for us to see him. But I was lucky at that. Because he certainly couldn't see us good enough to aim a gun at us. You know, it's a funny thing. No matter what happens, I always get the worst of it. Must be fate, I guess. But if you don't keep your head better when any emergency arises like that, you won't have any fate. What's the matter with you, anyhow? You've had enough training in the past to be ready for anything. You're right there, old pal, old pal. Ready for anything. And believe me, I get everything. What did you expect me to do while that guy was jumping on my neck? Relax and enjoy sweet and beautiful dreams? No, but you might have feigned sleep a while longer. That smuggler had a gun. You're telling me? That bullet parted my hair. Clint and me were just sneaking up on him when you woke up, Barney. Another minute and we would have had him. Well, you got him, all right. With me on the bottom of the pile. After this, I don't sleep in front of no more doors or windows. <laughs> well, that was your own idea, you know. You wanted air and wanted to see the moonlight. <laughs> yeah, and I saw stars, too. That fella had a punch like a pile driver. Why do you think he came to our room, Clint? Well, to get the key to our international secret police code. You mean our disguise is having fooled the octopus gang? They know who we really are? Yeah, I'm afraid so. By coming to our room, the smuggler proved to me that he was a member of the octopus band. And also that our disguises are useless. Then we can forget them? No, while they may know that we're the secret police, I'm sure they don't know how we really look. You know, me, at least. You know, I've been careful of that in the past. And as long as they're not sure of my real appearance, I... May be able to get through their lines yet. But, Clint, what about us? I want you to stay out of this whole mess, Speed. You're in it more now than I counted on. I'm sorry that I ever let Chief Riley talk me into bringing you along. Oh, my Clint, I wouldn't miss this forever anything. Let the kids like me to fight crime in every way we can. I'm luckier than the rest because I'm getting a crack at the octopus. Uh, you've done more than your share so far, Speed. Capturing Blackie Spears in my room, discovering the jewel smuggler tonight. I'm proud of you. But now with the octopus aware of who we really are, I want you to just stay out of the picture. That's right, kid. You'll run into more danger since leaving Alameda than I've had in a year. But I'll say you know what to do in a pinch. So far, you've done all the head work of this outfit. Oh, no, Barney. I've just been lucky. But I sure wish I could do away with these glasses I have to wear for a disguise. Eh, you'll have to keep them a while longer, Speed. If there was no other reason for keeping our disguises, passport difficulties would be enough. If we assumed our real identities now, we'd have to do a lot of explaining to the Clipper officials. That's so. The Clipper captain and the crew don't know about us being in the secret police. But the octopus does. Yeah, the octopus. I'd give a lot to know just how much information he does have. What does the octopus call us here for? Anyone know? Does anyone know the master's desires until he has spoken, Slim Taz? No, but he seems to know what everyone else is thinking, though. <sighs> Gives me the creeps coming to this room. Nothing in it but that microphone for him to hear us and that loudspeaker for him to talk through. Your feelings are unimportant in the matter. This meeting is important. It is the first time the Hong Kong branch of the band has been gathered together since we first started operation here. Oh, yeah? Talk some more, Kwan Wu. I ain't been with you long, so anything you tell me is news. The band of the octopus does not waste words. 
The master is successful because he acts. Well, why don't he show himself? This mystery business is okay for the yokels, but I'd like to know who I'm working for and what I'm heading for. You are heading for disaster if you keep up this foolish talk, Splinters. The master pays you well for the work you do. Yeah, but you've seen his face. Why can't I? I'm one of the best aviators in the sky. I can do everything with a plane but make it cook. And still I can't see who I'm working for. It is best not to, Splinters. I have seen the master's face because I am the only one he can trust. I have always been with him. Well, I'm sick of the whole business. I've been sitting around in this private underground hangar till I've forgotten what the sky looks like. I won't do it no longer. I want action. The master is... You call yourself Splinters? Huh? Yeah. Uh, octopus? I have heard your complaint. Do you wish to leave my service? No. No, no, not that. When they leave you, they, they leave the world, life, everything. they never heard of again. I was talking foolish, Octopus. I'll keep my mouth shut after this, I promise. Your promises are less than nothing to me. Quan Mu hired you because you are a good aviator. Yeah, the best I can do. I, I know can... your record in the air. And also on the ground, Splinters. You are one of the lowest type of criminal. A renegade aviator. A man who will fly for anyone who can pay him, regardless of the purpose. A man without conscience, without heart, as unfeeling as the ship he flies. I... But I, uh... I need such a man for my work. But such a man must not complain, for then he will be punished. I have certain underground dungeons for such punishment. No, 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 not, not torture. I ain't done anything against you, Octopus. I, I work for you hard. Don't torture me. I will give you a chance to prove your worthiness of remaining in the band of the octopus. What? How? Anything. One move. Yes, Master. I have just been talking to the Honolulu office over my short wave set. Operator 41 was arrested two hours ago on a charge of burglary. Burglary? Then... Yes. Only Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap could be responsible... Since their room was the only one he was going to search. Operator 41 must have been clumsy. The boy, Speed Gibson, was the real cause of his capture. A kid? For your information, Splinters, this boy is Clint Barlow's nephew. Barlow is not only the cleverest and most intelligent man in the International Secret Police, but he's raising this orphaned boy as his own and has taught him the rules of the Secret Police. Train him to follow in his footsteps, should he so desire. And it is Barlow's heart that I will attack through his nephew. Since Barlow is our worst enemy, Master. The only one I acknowledge, Kwan The only one who might end my career. <laughs> but he made his one mistake when he brought the boy on this trip. For what reason did the boy come? If Riley thought that such a move would remove suspicion, all three are disguised, traveling under assumed names. For the time being, I shall allow them their masquerade. May I humbly ask why, then, you caused the warning note to be presented to them under the dinner check, Master? More to frighten the Winfield girl. Women are troublesome. I wanted her to stay away from China. Was she frightened? Yes, but the little fool has the courage of ignorance. She's coming to China under the protection of our enemies. Does she know who they are? Not yet. That note also worried Barlow, not because of his own safety, but that of his nephew. Speed Gibson is the vulnerable point in Clint Barlow's armor. What is your plan? First of all, nothing must interfere with our business of smuggling. The men I have assigned to take care of that will not concern themselves with this warfare against our enemies. For move. You are friendly with Dr. Kingsley, the little girl's past. Very, Master. I see him almost every day at the council office. He thinks very highly of me. Good. The more you are in his confidence, the more you will learn about Marsha Winfield. I want you to work on that alone. You know the background there, Kwanu. Yes, Master. It will be a pleasure. Now for the International Secret Police. Here is Monsieur Pierre Dorsey and Jim at Earl Fletch. I am not attempting to interfere with their activities so long as they are aboard the clipper ship. That would be foolhardy. 
It is the stopovers that concern me. Those are the places where I can reach them. But Master Operator 41 is no longer flying with them. I know, but there are other ways. They leave Honolulu very short. They will reach Midway Island in about eight hours. They will leave Midway the following morning. Fly over the international date line and reach Wake Island Sunday afternoon. Splinters. Yeah, yes, sir. I want you to take my special bullet monoplane and fly to Wake Island. You will leave immediately and await the clipper plane from Midway. Do I go alone? Yes, but you will have a passenger when you return. At least. You'd better have a passenger. Yeah, I, uh, I will. Who will it be? Speed Gibson. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the International Secret Police, and Barney Dunlap, also of the police, are flying to Hong Kong, China, via the China Clipper, to end the smuggling activities of the world's most dreaded criminal, the octopus. At the Honolulu stopover, they become acquainted with Marsha Winfield, governess to little Jean Kingsley, and are startled when she tells them that she took the position so that she could go to China in search of the octopus who has brought tragedy into her life. She asks their protection for the duration of the trip for the little girl's sake. Meanwhile, the octopus has dispatched a renegade aviator, Splinters, in a special bullet plane to await the arrival of the China Clipper at Wake Island and there kidnap Speed Gibson. At the moment, however, we find the boys talking things over several hundred feet in the air, about half an hour out of Midway Island. Yeah... You know, I wouldn't mind living on one of these clipper ships the rest of my life. Rides as easy as a big, calm yacht. Good feed, sightseeing, and a guy can get a good night's sleep in one of them berths. <laughs> the one you got at Honolulu, huh, Barney? You're darn tootin', Speed. What with you and Clint using me as a battlefield to capture that smuggler? <laughs> well, your snoring wasn't any lullaby for us, either. Is that so? If I hadn't snored, Speed wouldn't have been awake to see that smuggler climbed up to our balcony at the hotel. <laughs> it's no use, Clint. You can't top Barney. <laughs> He's the champion alibi Ike of the service. Yeah, what do you mean, alibi Ike? Well, I won't go into painful details now. After all, I'm just supposed to be Pierre Dorsey, the French tutor to your son here, Earl. And you're Jim Fletcher, the Texas oil man, now remember. How can I forget it with you reminding me every half hour? By the way, where's Miss Winfield and Jane? In the lounge. Miss Winfield's writing letters. Oh, think I'll see if she needs any help. No, no, you don't, Romeo. You stay right here with us where I can keep an eye on you. Okay. Nothing to do, though. Nothing to do? Gee, Barney, in just a little while we'll cross the international date line. Just think, we've been flying like 60 ever since we took off from Midway Island, and we'll still lose a day. Lose a day flying at this speed? How do you figure that? Because we crossed the international date line. If we were coming the other way, from China... Then we'd leave Wake one day and arrive at Midway the day before. Clint, do you think the altitude's getting the kid? <laughs> no, speed's right, Barney. You pass over the same line on boats, you know. You're just confused because we're traveling so much faster. Oh, I get it now. Say, they always have some sort of celebration on a boat. Last time I crossed over the equator, they ducked me and held me under for a whole day. 
At least that's the way it seemed to me. Yeah, I'll bet you were red as a boy of lobster when they pulled you out. <laughs> and that's funny, huh? <laughs> I wonder if they'll have a celebration up here crossing the date line in the air, as they do on shipboard crossing the equator. Nah, and if they do, they can count me out. For once, I'm going to be the watching audience. Watch it. Here comes one of the stewards. Hmm? Well, as I was saying, Monsieur Fletcher, the clipper route is fascinating. You will remember that soon after we left Honolulu, we passed over the very sands that Sir Charles Kingsford Smith used as a landing field for his Southern Cross plane when he blazed the first sky route from San Francisco to Sydney, Australia. Uh, beg pardon, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Fletcher? Uh-huh. Oh, yes, Stuart? Uh, the captain's compliments, sir, and he asks if you will not impersonate Father Time for the usual ceremonies when we pass over the time demarcation line. You mean to say that you have ceremonies up here in the air for that? Oh, yes, sir. Everything but the immersion, of course. And <laughs> you are going to be in the watching audience. <laughs> yeah, that's right, lad. I should have stayed at Midway Island and enjoyed the fishing. Father Time. <laughs> Radio OC-34, calling shortwave station OC-127. OC-34, calling OC-127. Come in, please. Ought to come in quick enough. I don't think that octopus ever leaves his set. He talks to me more by radio than when I'm with him in Hong Kong. Uh-oh. Here he comes. OC-127 to OC-34. OC-127 to OC-34. Stand by for two-way conversation. OC-34 already for two-way. Flinders? Yes, sir. I just sighted Wake Island. We'll land there shortly. Can't see nothing of the China Clipper yet. Wait at Wake Island. Clipper will probably lay over since there we were the report forms of typhoon in Formosan waters heading for Wake Island. Typhoon? Well, that'll drown him, all right. That's a piece of weather that even I won't buck. You might, Splinters. What do you mean? The plane will naturally arouse curiosity. You have the story you are to tell the aviation officials. That you are trying to establish a new speed record between Guam and Wake Island for your own satisfaction. I got all that straight, but what about flying in a typhoon? Once you get speed, Gibson, you will have to take off, no matter what kind of flying weather you have. But octopus, you might as well tell me to send my bullet plane in a nosedive into the ocean right now. Typhoon flying is just another name for suicide. Are you going to obey my orders? You know what awaits you here if you fail. And don't think that you can escape me by going elsewhere. Remember, the tentacles of the octopus. I can reach you anywhere. Oh, I know. I thought you wanted Speed Gibson alive. I want to strike at Clint Barlow. Losing his nephew will remove Barlow from the chase. What happens to the boy is of little interest to me. But my life, sir, I... What are you going to do? I'll get Speed Gibson. We'll fly into the typhoon if we must. That is better. You have full instructions. You are to stay by the plane as much as possible. So you will be in constant communication with me. Yes, sir, I'm circling Wake Island now. Very well. Land and tell your story to the officials. And tell it well. Tell it so that they will believe it, or you will have to answer to me. Phew, I thought we never would get out of that lounge performance. <laughs> oh, father time himself, huh? You've still got some cotton whiskers hanging on your chin there. <laughs> I'll take them off, Barney. Thanks, kid. I was kind of nervous when the steward was putting them on me. Thought maybe he'd find out I had a phony mustache and a squint. Yes, uh, he was laughing too hard to examine your face, pal. You should have seen yourself when they put that paper crown on your head. Look more like a dunce cap. Yeah, well, let me tell you, not all dunces wear caps. No. Jose, get off your high horse, cowboy. Here comes Gene. Now, remember who you are. Guess I'd better put these glasses on again, too. Hello, everybody. Miss 
Mr. Fletcher, I want to tell you what a wonderful father time you made. I should have... You too, Jean? I thought you was my friend. I am. I wasn't laughing at you, but with you. You sure were having a good time initiating the passengers over the international date line. <laughs> and I'll have to admit I got a kick out of it, all right. Well, I'm sure glad to have one of these international date line certificates they give to everyone who flies over the line. Boy, listen to this. The main of Phoebus Apollo, ruler of the sun and heavens, know all people that Earl Fletcher, once earthbound and time-laden, is now declared a subject of the realm of the sun and of the heavens with the freedom of our sacred eagle. That with the speed of our flaming chariot, this subject did fly the Pacific skies over the international date line, which mortals designed to mark off in the limit of days our eternal course through the skies. All right, all right. You didn't have to read your certificate to us. We all got one, and as far as I know, we can all read. Yeah, Pop, but I like the sound of those words. It makes you feel like, like somebody. I'm awfully proud of my certificate, too, Earl. I like these pictures of the sun, moon, and stars around the edge, and the flaming chariot, and the clipper ship. I love this whole trip, especially the goony birds. Mr. Dorsey, do you think there'll be any goony birds on Wake Island like there was on Midway? Well, very probably, mademoiselle. They're so funny and awkward. I would have liked one for a pet. You'd have a heck of a time keeping a goony bird aboard the China Clipper. <laughs> I got a kick out of those goonies, but the birds that moaned and groaned gave me the heebie-jeebie. Wonder what they call them. Don't know, Bar. I mean, Pop. But the Clipper captain himself pointed out the turned frigate birds and giant albatross. Boy, they're colossal. They're col- colossal albatross. Hear that, Mr. Dorsey? You have to teach him better than that. Well, well youth always exaggerates, Monsieur Fletcher. Well, they were big, and so are the fish. Hope I can get in some more fish in at Wake Island. I think we'll have to stay in the hotel at Wake. Well, what do you mean, Jean? The steward just told Marcia that a typhoon was heading for Wake Island. We'd probably have to lay over until it passed. Typhoon layover? Well, then we'll be late getting to Hong Kong. Oh, not very late, Miss Herr Fletcher. These typhoons are terrible, but very quick. Look, there's Wake Island ahead now. I don't see any signs of a storm anywhere. It's coming from Formosa, he said. The aviation weather reports give a clipper plenty of warning, Earl. They may have a half a day of clear flying weather ahead. But if there is any danger whatsoever of a bad storm crossing their path, they are ordered to remain grounded until all is clear once more. Well, as swell as this clipper plane is to ride in, I'll be glad to walk on land again. Sort of get air legs up here. It won't be long now. Oh, look at that pretty lagoon we're going to land in. And look, people are coming to the dock to meet us. You can certainly see good, Earl. Let me look through those glasses. Uh, uh no, they're, they're too strong for your eyes. Oh, everybody always gets excited when we come to a place, especially when it's in the middle of the ocean. Any sign of the typhoon yet? No, monsieur. But I see something else, Barney. Danger? I don't know, but I got a hunch. Look at that plane down there. Boy, a two-seater and built for terrific speed. No familiar identification marks. Barney, that plane looks more dangerous to me than a dozen typhoons. You think the octopus? We'll know soon enough. But watch yourself after we land. Anything can happen way out here in mid-Pacific and be called an accident. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero.
Clint Barlow, his nephew, Speed Gibson, and Barney Dunlap, all of the international secret police, are flying to Hong Kong and the China Clipper with orders from headquarters to capture the criminal, the octopus, whose powerful crime organization, like the tentacles of a giant octopus, embraces the whole world. At the moment, our three friends in disguise are halfway to their goal, having just landed at Wake Island. They have already had trouble with spies of their enemy, but do not know that the octopus has sent a renegade aviator, Splinters, in a fast bullet plane to Wake Island to kidnap Speed Gibson so that Clint will be detracted from his purpose. Meanwhile, a weather report has warned that a typhoon is heading out of Formosan waters. The Clipper passengers have been asked to remain indoors. We find Speed, Clint, and Barney restlessly pacing back and forth in their room at the Clipper Inn. Gee, I I wish we didn't have to stay inside. I'd sure like to see that special two-seater plane close. Wonder who it belongs to. Yeah, I wonder too, Speed. I don't like the looks of her. What do you mean, Clint? Now, it's very unusual for any sort of plane to land at Wake Island excepting the Clipper ships. It's too far out. Uh, that little plane must have terrific power. I wonder why. Maybe some guy's trying to break another record or, of some mm, sort. Maybe. I don't like the looks of it right at this time, especially on top of everything else that's happened. You mean the jewel smuggler that tried to break into our room on Honolulu and also that note from the octopus that warned everyone at the table to lay off? Yeah, I'm uneasy whenever we're off the clipper ship. When we're on land, even in mid-ocean, the octopus has a chance to strike. I'd just like to see him start anything way out here. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, well, what courage you have, Grandma. <laughs> You jumped a mile, Barney. Oh, me nerves are all shot. It's them goony birds, I think, or those other feathered things that moaned. I wish we were in China. Well, don't worry. We soon will be. Remember your disguises now. Uh, who is there, please? Jean and Marshall. Oh, just a second. I uh, hope we didn't disturb you. Just wanted to see if you had gone down to the lobby yet. No, but we will now if you'll guarantee us your company, Miss Winfield. Oh, try and get rid of us. When I asked for your protection until I could deliver Jean to her father in Hong Kong, I really meant it, Mr. Fletcher. And you've been so kind on the trip. I don't know how I can ever repay you. Why, it's a pleasure, ma'am. Down in Texas, there's nothing we like to do better than protect women and children. Uh, well, if you and her are ready to leave the room and go down to the lobby, Monsieur Fletcher, I will lock the door. Oh, sure thing, Mr. Dorsey. Come along, Earl. I'm coming, Pop. There we are. I do not believe anyone can get in the room without our permission. I hope not. Your experience in Honolulu was enough for one trip. I should say so. Mr. Fletcher, all of you... I don't know just how to say this, but ever since Earl rescued Jean from drowning at Waikiki, I've felt as if you three were our only friends. I've already told you that the octopus has had a sinister influence on my life. I told you that because I trusted you and felt that all three of you are not quite what or who you appear to be. Well, uh, I do not understand what Mademoiselle means. Oh, I'm not saying all this because of idle curiosity. I think you know that. Perhaps I'm trying to warn you. Oh, I don't know. It all sounds so silly when I try to put it into words. But that plane in the lagoon... The bullet plane? Yes. This afternoon, right after we arrived, Jean went down to the beach to look for some more shells. She found some right beside the plane. And while she was collecting them, the aviator came down, not seeing her since he entered the plane from the other side. And he put on his flying helmet, twisted some dials in front of him, and talked into a little round thing. Getting some sort of mixed up letters and numbers. Shortwave radio with earphones concealed in pockets and his flying helmet. Just like the United States Navy uses for plane to ground communication. Oh, Mademoiselle Jean. Now think. Can you recall the letters and numbers he used? Mm, no, Mr. Dorsey. But whatever station he was calling was in Hong Kong. Hong Kong? Say, what about. Oh, wait, wait. Is not that the aviator? There at the other end of the lobby? Yes, that's him. He's watching us. Doesn't look very mysterious to me. But maybe we are attaching too much importance to him. Our staring has probably attracted his attention. That's what I think. Look, there's the clipper captain over there. Let's go and ask him about this typhoon we've been hearing so much about and forget that flyer. Very well. Are you coming, Earl? I'd like to stay here and look at this case of shells, rocks, and stuff that have all been taken from this island, Mr. Dorsey. Me too. All right. But be sure and not go outside. Remember the typhoon warnings. 
Danger signal, sir. I get it, Mr. Dorsey. Don't worry. And keep an eye on Jean, will you? You bet, Miss Marcia. Hmm. I wonder if that aviator is really trying to establish a new speed record between Guam and Wake. What do you mean, Earl? Monsieur Dorsey and Pop were asking about him right after we landed. Of course, you know that anybody who lands here is questioned by the authorities to find out why they landed. Because this is one of the government naval bases. And they don't want anyone around who hasn't got a good reason to be here. I don't blame them. This fellow had good credentials, all right. But that doesn't mean anything. A criminal always makes sure he's protected that way when he's really up to something. Why, Earl, you talk just like a detective. Uh, uh, no, I don't, Jean. But I am kind of curious. Because I think that guy's way out here for something more than just a speed wreck. I wouldn't be too curious, Earl. He looks like a villain to me. A villain? You wouldn't know one if you saw him. I would, too. And you better be careful of him. Say, listen, I've got enough people telling me what to do with Pop and Monsieur Dorsey without you adding your bit. All right. But let's look at these shelves and things instead of that man. I think they're lots more interesting, don't you, Earl? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. You're not looking at them at all. I'm watching that aviator. He's coming over here. Do you think we'd better tell your father and Mr. Dorsey? No. They're busy now. And I'd like to talk to this guy. You go look at that map over there or something, will you, Jean? No, I want to hear what you're going to ask him. But, Jean... Is it another mystery? No, it isn't another mystery. Oh, hang around if you want. But let me do the talking. Sure. Hello, kids. Oh, hello. Hello. Saw you two coming off the clapping list. Kind of interested in knowing how you like the trip. Oh, it was swell. Like flying, huh? Yeah. I, I do some of it myself. You do? How old are you, kid? Fifteen. And I'm twelve. Imagine that. Kids your age flying over thousands of miles of water. And what'll you be doing when you get as old as me? What are you doing? Why, oh, I'm trying to establish a new speed record between Guam and Wake Island. Bet you could. We saw your plane during our landing. Looks plenty fast. Would you like to see it close? Oh, we couldn't do that. There's a typhoon heading this way. Oh, we have time before that strikes. You can help me check a mooring. You'd better stay here, little girl, but your friend in here and me will go to see to it and be back as quick as a wink. That's a good idea. You wait here, Jean. But, Earl, remember what Mr. Dorsey... I know, I know. If they should notice I'm gone, don't say where. I'll tell them all about it when I get back. But supposing you don't get back? Well, what's going to stop me? Come along, young fellow. If you want to take a look before the typhoon strikes, come on. Earl, don't go. Please don't go, please. <laughs> So, you see, Mr. Fletcher, according to our calculations, Wake Island will not feel the full force of the typhoon. It will pass southwest of us. But for safety's sake, I want all my passengers to remain here in the hotel. Good, that's fine. When do we eat, Captain? <coughs> will the clipper be delayed in the takeoff for Guam, uh, Monsieur Le Capitan? Oh, I don't think so, Mr. Dorsey. We're in constant communication with Guam, and they say that the typhoon will be surely safely passed by the time we're ready to leave Wake. Well, I guess I'd better be getting back to Jean. She's still over there by that case of rocks and shells. But I don't see your son around anywhere, Mr. Fletcher. Oh, he can't be far off. Let's mosey on over there. Uh, thanks a lot for the information, Captain. Oh, yes, indeed. You're entirely welcome. Uh, hey, Monsieur Fletcher, the aviator is also missing. Uh, what? I certainly hope that we will find Earl somewhere about. Oh, Jean will know where he is. Jean, honey! Oh, Marcia, I'm so glad you've come. I'm getting sort of worried. Worried? Why? Earl went outside with that aviator that you were talking about. Outside? Why? What did he tell you? Why, Mr. Dorsey, you're not French anymore. Never mind that, Jean. Why did he go after we told him not to? The aviator wanted to show him the plane, so that he could help him move it better, too. Oh, well, what's wrong? Come on, let's get out there. Yeah, we're not too late. Oh, I don't understand, but if Earl's in trouble, shouldn't we ask for help? No, we can't, not yet. Quick, let's get out the door before anyone tries to stop us. Miss Winfield, you wait here with Jean. Hold everything. I'm going to open the door. Oh, if I could only do something to help you. I told Earl not to go. <laughs> Watch yourself, honey. Everything that isn't fastened down is, is apt to go up in the air. Help me shut this door. Uh, uh, can you... 
Can you see anything of speed? No, I can't even see the plane in this wind. Well, come on. we got to go down for war. Here, link arms with me. We'll have to fight this wind every inch if we expect to get down there. Lean against her. Speed! Speed! That saved your breath. He couldn't hear us in this wind. Clint, look! That column of water racing toward us. The typhoon whirlwind. Down in your stomach, Barney. Down flat. It's our only chance. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap have twice foiled the attempts of spies of the dangerous criminal, the Octopus, to halt their coming to Hong Kong, China, where he has centered his smuggling activities. The Octopus has only begun to fight the three members of the International Secret Police, and knowing that they are traveling in disguise and are coming to China aboard the China Clipper, dispatches a renegade aviator known as Splinters to await the Clipper at Wake Island and kidnap Speed. In the last episode, you remember, the aviator managed to get Speed alone under the pretext of showing him his special bullet plane. The rising wind bespoke the typhoon which the Clipper weather stations forecast, and Clinton and Barney discover Speed's disappearance and go out to look for him. The heart of the typhoon, a huge column of water, passes southwest of Wake Island, and the boys are forced to the ground by the terrific wind. But at last, with the worst of it over, we find them buffeted and gasping for breath. Wow, that was a close call. I never want to be any closer to a typhoon than we was. Uh, forget about us. We've got to find speed. I can't see anything until I get some of this dirt out of my eyes. I think I got half a Wake Island in there. Come on, hurry up. The octopus has sent one of his thugs to kidnap speed. I'll hunt him down if I have to tear Asia apart. Take it easy, Clint. Don't let it get you. That's just what the octopus wants. He thinks by kidnapping Speed, he'll throw you off the track and you'll hunt the, for the kid instead of him. Yeah, come on, Bonnie. Let's go down. I want to get my hands on that aviator. But the plane's still there. Clint, you don't think that rat would take off in a typhoon? No, I'm not thinking until I know. You'll be able to see if the plane's there. As soon as we get around the corner of the hotel. Why did the kid ever leave the hotel in the first place? He knew that pilot was under suspicion. Yeah, he may have had some idea in the back of his head of learning what he was really up to. Why the dickens did I ever allow him to join the secret police? Why didn't I have sense enough to stand by my first decision? Too late to talk about that now. Clint. Clint, the plane's still there. Still got its canvas covering on. Yes. Well, have your gun ready, Barney. We're not taking any chances with this fellow. You're darn tootin' we're not. He's moving around under the canvas. Let's run for the plane. And stay on the windward side. And keep well down until we get the lay of the land. Okay, buddy. <laughs> Easy now. Easy. I'm going to rip back the canvas. You you cover me with your gun, Barney. Right. You all set? Yep. Let her rip. Hey! Suffering wang total speed. Barney! Gee, you scared me when you ripped that canvas back like that. We scared you? And what do you think you've been doing to us? We tried to walk through a typhoon to look for you. That's all. It's just a typhoon. Gee, I'm sorry, Barney. 
I thought I was helping you guys out. Look. What? The mystery pilot. And he's out cold as a cucumber. Uh Uh-huh. I gave him an uppercut. You gave him a... Gee, what is this? Clint and me are supposed to be working on this case, too. And you're getting results single-handed. I only did what I thought was right. Well, for one thing, you disobeyed orders, Steve. Yeah, Clint, but... No, no excuses. You disobeyed orders and ran a risk that might have upset all our plans. Had this man succeeded in kidnapping you, the octopus would have held all the winning cards. Now, how could I continue pursuing him with your life in danger? I... I never thought of that, Clint. But I really wasn't in any danger. This guy didn't think I knew much, I guess, because he told me to get in the plane to look at the controls closer. And he started to climb in, but gave a quick look around first. That's when I hit him. You sure gave him a good one, kid. He's sleeping as peaceful as a baby. I didn't want to have any trouble with him, but I was trying out this short wave set of his. Isn't it a pit? Now, wait. You keep that helmet off and come with me, Speed. Take out the prisoner, Barney. We'll carry him back to the hotel. As a prisoner, Clint? Yes, the mask's off. From now on, we're traveling not as the Fletchers and Pierre Dorsey, but as members of the International Secret Police. The octopus has shown only too clearly that he knows us for what we are. But our disguises, Clint. And you and Barney can forget them. But I'll still use most of mine in looks only. Now, the fact that the octopus doesn't know how I really look may save our necks someday. What about passports? Uh, Chief Riley saw to that. I have three that will replace the ones we use under our assumed names. I'll have to do a lot of explaining to the Clipper officials, but our credentials will establish our identities. We'll have no trouble. I hope not. We have enough octopus trouble without anything else added to it. What about this plane and short wave set, Clint? We'll cover it up again until we have time enough to fully investigate the job. I believe that short wave set may be one of the things that will unlock the secret of the octopus. I sure hope so. Hey, look. This plane's got a radio telegraph as well as a short wave phone. This guy's equipped for everything. Mm, A radio telegraph, huh? Mm. That means he's been picking up all the clipper calls, too. Knowing their frequencies, he could listen to all their movements. Well, that's how he knew when we were to arrive at Wake Island. And whether we were going to lay over or not because of the typhoon. Do you think so, Clint? Mm, It's a guess, but I think it's pretty good. You know, the weather reports to the clipper ships not only come from all the stopovers, but from ships at sea to the south and north. And then from other clipper planes, too. See, this man should have notes on these weather reports and perhaps other data that might lead us to the octopus. Gee, let's search him here. Oh, and have the wind blow all the papers around in case there are any? No, be silly. Well, then let's go back to the inn as soon as possible and give this guy the works. That is, if we can bring him around after that clip speed gave him. He's coming around already, Clint. Yeah, so I see. Well, that's good. Now we won't have to carry him back to the inn. Good is right. I'm getting more of a workout on this job than I ever got on anything else. It's worth it, though, Barney. Anything's worth it that'll lead us to the octopus. Master, you sent for me? Yes, Kwan Wu. I have just received word from Wake Island. From the aviator Splinters? No, from our other operator there. Splinters has been arrested. Arrested? By whom? Need you ask? Clint Barlow. Splinters, the clumsy fool, forgot that Speed Gibson has been trained by his uncle for the secret police. He attempted to kidnap him by the crudest of methods. Result? Speed knocked him out. But it is an outrage. Such things cannot happen to the members of the Octopus Band. Such things have happened and are happening. But they will happen no more. Ever since our persistent police left their headquarters in New York, I have attempted to turn them from their purpose, warn them by subtle methods. I will no longer attempt this. From now on, I will strike at them directly, if I must meet them face to face. You would not do that, Master. No one has ever seen your face except me. Correction, Kwan Wu. No one but you has ever seen my face and known me to be the octopus. True. But this Clint Barlow is clever. Your paths have crossed before. Perhaps he would recognize you. Perhaps his uncanny intuition would warn him of your identity. Of danger. (laughs) I am not afraid of Barlow Kwan Wu. I respect his talents. But I do not fear them. Yes, master. And what is your next move to be? Splinters, the aviator, is new in our organization. I do not believe that he has learned the value of silence. You think he will talk? Yes. He and my bullet plane must be uh, removed before they tell any of my secrets to Barlow and to Speed Gibson. And how is this to be accomplished? That is up to my operator on Wake Island. 
I shall give the order to go ahead now over the shortwave radio. For very probably Barlow is questioning splinters at this very minute. Uh, sit over here, Speed. I want you to be in on this questioning. Okay, Clint. Where's Barney? He's guarding the plane. Has one of the company men with him. You expect the octopus has more spies on Wake Island than this one here? I don't know, but I'm not taking any chances. Now then, let's see what our prisoner has to say. What's your name? Splinters. Splinters, huh? It's rather a new alias, isn't it? I come when I hear it. That's all a name's good for anyhow. Well, I don't blame you for wanting to forget your other name, Ted Bailey. Well, how did you know? How are you talking about? I remember a notice I once saw in the United States Naval Office. You were wanted for desertion. Navy? And that's how he came to use that special flying helmet with earphone pockets. The United States Navy helmet. Yes, Speed. Bailey deserted and took one of the planes with him. They found the plane later, cracked up, but the missing pilot was never located. Until now. All right, all right. Suppose I am Bailey. What are you going to do with me? Send you back to America to face desertion charges and also attempted kidnapping. You can't prove that kidnapping business. Speed's testimony will prove plenty, Splinters. But let me remind you that nothing, nothing that awaits you in America will compare to the fate you'd suffer if the octopus can ever lay hands on you again. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I don't know nothing about this octopus. You know plenty, Splinters, and I want you to talk. Because the crimes you may have done in the past won't compare with the crime you will commit by not giving evidence against the octopus. He's not only an enemy of the United States, but an enemy of the whole world. I have an idea that you've seen samples of his terrorism. I, I, I have nothing to say. Where's the hangar you flew from? Where's your base of operations in Hong Kong? I don't know what you're talking about. Why were you going to take me, Splinters? Nowhere. I was just showing you the plane. Oh, the story you tell of trying to break the speed record between Guam and Wake Islands is full of holes. You haven't been able to prove a thing. I've made inquiries. Guam never heard of you. Neither has Manila. Oh, come clean, Splinters. Don't have a false sense of loyalty to a man who won't turn a hand to help you if you're taken by the police. It ain't loyalty. It's, it's it... fear. Fear, isn't it? Fear of what the octopus will do if you fail. You knew a typhoon was coming up when you attempted to kidnap Speed, and yet you dare fly into her, rather than face the revenge of the octopus if you fail to accomplish what he ordered you to do. Yeah, Barlow, that's it. He said he'd torture me. I'd rather die in my plane, clean and quick, than go back to him and be tortured today. Then lead us to him, Spinders. Help us in our fight against the worst criminal ring of the 20th century, and return to the United States to face the music, knowing that you've done your bit to end crime. Yeah, you're right. I'll tell. I'll tell. Please. Oh, look out! Someone broke the window! He's come after me. He told me he'd get me, no matter where I was. Help me! Help me! of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero.
As you know, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the International Secret Police, his nephew, Speed Gibson, and Barney Dunlap, his right-hand man, are flying to Hong Kong on the China Clipper to track down the notorious criminal, the octopus. Speed is the youngest member of the secret police and so far has certainly lived up to his oath to stamp out crime. For he has been directly responsible for the arrest of three of the octopus aides, his last prisoner being Splinters, the renegade aviator in the criminal's pay, who flew to Wake Island in an attempt to kidnap Speed. However, Speed suspected him and knocked the man out. Clint, realizing that their disguises have not fooled their enemy, now throws all pretense aside, commandeers the bullet plane, leaving Barney to guard it, and takes Splinters to their hotel room for questioning. Just as the aviator is about to reveal the octopus headquarters, a window glass is shattered, and Speed and Clint leap to the window, but all is inky blackness outside. Can you see anything, Clint? No, not a thing, Speed. Be careful now. Don't cut yourself on that glass. What broke the window anyhow? A bullet? I don't think so, no. Now look here on the floor. A rock with a paper tied to it. Another octopus gesture, I imagine. Splinters. Clint, he's gone. He was sitting right in that chair and now he's gone. Oh, what a chump I was to have been fooled by that window trick. Hey, quick, open the door. We may still be in time to save him. Not a sign of him anywhere, Clint. The hall's deserted. Uh, well... The octopus outsmarted us that time. But Splinters couldn't just disappear in thin air, Clint. That's just what he's done, Speed. And whoever got him did it quickly and quietly. Must have come in the door while we were looking out the window. Grabbed Splinters before he could let us know what was happening and got him out without a sound. But it all happened in less than a minute. Yeah, that's the way the octopus works. We'll never see Splinters again, Speed. He'll make sure he'll never get another chance to tell what he knows. Poor guy. In spite of what he was and what he tried to do to me... I feel kind of sorry for him. So do I. He was probably a victim of environment. Had the wrong start in life. Fell in with the wrong sort of company. Oh, if kids could only see in time where such a road leads. If they just realized the true meaning of the saying, crime does not pay. Yeah. Say, let's see what that paper tied to the rock says. Oh, I've forgotten all about that for the moment. Uh, you untie it, Speed. Okay. Clint, it's from the octopus, all right. Look, that marker here is an ugly, sprawling octopus. Yeah, what does it say? It says, I can end your careers as easily as I have silent splinters forever. That's all. Oh, uh, he's bluffing. If he could have ended our careers so easily, he would have done so. But he doesn't trust the job to his agent, whoever he is. Clint, if he could take splinters away right under our noses, what about Barney down at the plane? There were two of us here just now. And they get away with splinters. You're right, Speed. Come on, let's get down to that plane. Mr. Fletcher? Miss Winfield? Yes. Do you mind if Jean and I visit with you for a few minutes? I should say not. But it's kind of late for you to be out, isn't it? Yes, but we couldn't even think of sleeping after all that excitement. The typhoon and speed almost being kidnapped. And you all arresting that man who flew this plane? Yeah, can't blame you for not being able to sleep after all that, Jean. So you're really not Mr. Fletcher at all? No. That was just a disguise. I knew it all the time. Oh, you can't know how glad I am to know that you're all of the international secret police, Mr. Uh, uh, Dunlap. Barney Dunlap. But just call me Barney. And Earl is Speed, and Mr. Dorsey is... Clint Barlow. He's the best man in the secret police. And you're all on the trail of the octopus. That's the general idea. Fate must have had a hand in this. I need your help so desperately in my fight against that criminal and his band. Wait. Someone's coming. Oh, why, it's Speed and Clint. Wonder why they're down here. They were questioning the aviator, weren't they? Yeah. Maybe they got all they wanted out of him. Hi, Clint. Speed. Hi, Barney. You all right? Of course I'm all right. What makes you think any different? Oh, uh, Miss Winfield and Jean, you better go back to the hotel. It uh, isn't safe being out in the night. What do you mean, not safe? With a secret policeman to protect them? Uh, Barney, Splinters has disappeared. Uh, huh? But you was with him. Yeah, we were with him. But somebody threw a rock through our room window. And while we were trying to see who did it, 
Splinters disappeared. You let that old trick fool you, huh? Mm, yes, I made the mistake of thinking that we had the only octopus operator on Wake Island in our room. Oh, he's terrible. His power is everywhere. That's why we came down here to see if the plane was all right, Barney. And that's why I also advise you to return to the hotel, Miss Winfield. But, Mr. Barlow, first, now that I know who you really are, I must tell you something. Something about my interest in the octopus. Oh, very well. Oh, Speed, uh, you stay by the plane with Jean. Barney and I will go over here with Miss Winfield. Okay, Clint. I'm going to see if I can get anything on this short wave set. Can I listen to Speed? Yeah, as soon as I raise anything. Why are we going over here? Well, I'm not taking any chances. I haven't fully investigated the plane yet. I don't know what it conceals. Perhaps a microphone which would carry whatever we say right into the den of the octopus. Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, none to be afraid of, Miss Winfield. Not with us along. Oh, thank you, Barney. But my fear isn't for myself, it's for Jean. I can't rest until she's safe with her father in Hong Kong. Uh, what is Mr. Kingsley's profession? He's a physician, but he's so close to the Chinese and so well-liked that he dabbles in the diplomatic service, too. Uh, I remember you telling us that before, before our interest was so involved. And before you told us that uh, you were seeking the octopus. Yes. You see, my brother came to China three years ago. He was an engineer, was going to work with an oil company which had planned surveys in Tibet. Mm, yes. At first, his letters were full of enthusiasm about his work. And then something else crept in. Nothing he actually wrote, but something that I could read between the lines. About his work? No, about someone he had met. Someone very influential. I kept asking about his engineering work, how plans were progressing and so forth. But he seemed to evade it. His letters became more scarce, and and then... Then I received the last one. Yes, go on. He spoke very plainly. Evidently, he wrote it in terrible fear of something. He said that if I never should hear from him again, it was because of the octopus, a criminal who had gotten him so under his power that he could not escape without disgracing me in our name. Oh, I was desperate. I wrote begging him to seek aid from the police, anything to save himself. But I never heard from him again. And now you're going to Hong Kong to look for him, huh? Yes. I must learn what has happened to him. This uncertainty is terrible. But how do you know where to look, Miss Marcia? But he gave me directions in his letter. Uh, what's that? Directions? Yes. He said that the headquarters of the octopus smuggling activities were in Hong Kong and drew a map of the streets leading to it. Half of that map is blurred as if water had made the ink run. Where's the map? Oh, I have it in my hotel room, hidden safely. Uh, will you give it to us, Miss uh, Marcia? Uh, I mean, a copy of it. Yes, of course. Uh, let's get it right now, then. I'd like to study it, and then cable Chief Riley what we've learned. You've given us the first workable clue to the whereabouts of the octopus. Clint, Barney, come here, quick. What's up, kid? He's got something on the radio. Uh, let's get over there, then. He may really have something important. That short wave set has a wavelength that can not only pick up the usual amateur and ship signals, but ultra-high frequency as well. Listen, Clint. Here, I'll take your phones off and tune it up so y'all can hear it. Suffering wang doodles. What have you stirred up, Speed? I don't know. I just, just opened it up to where I was set and this noise started. Hey, listen, listen now. Calling Clint Barlow, Barney Dunlap, Speed the Gibbs. It's us. Hey, pipe down. I am the octopus. Oh. When you land in China, you will find my tentacles everywhere. I guarantee you absolute failure. Turn back while there is yet time. Oh, Marsha. Oh, hush, hush, darling. This warning includes Marsha Winfield. And this is my last warning. Here are my orders. Take this plane out on the lagoon. Set it afire. Hands off. Barlow. That goes for the plane and everything else. Don't let him get away. If we can just locate his transmitter, we've got him. I can't, Barney. He didn't give any call letters. We haven't got a thing to go on. Oh, we can't get away from the octopus. He seems to be everywhere. He knows everything we're doing. Yes, that's what I can't figure out. How did the octopus know we were down here at his plane to get that broadcast? Say, that's right. 
he came on the air right after I started fooling with that set. Well, uh, uh, maybe we'd better burn the plane like he said, huh? Burn it? <laughs> Say, we've got him worried, Barney. Otherwise, he wouldn't be giving us all those warnings. That isn't his way. All right. So we've got him worried. Now what? Now, you're going to fly this bullet plane to Hong Kong. Me fly that? Yes. We're going to need a plane like this. Fast. Plenty of gasoline capacity. We'll fill her up tonight, and you take off when the clipper does at dawn. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling In the preceding episode, Speed Gibson and his uncle, Clint Barlow of the International Secret Police, are questioning one of the octopus spies, Splinters, a renegade aviator. Their attention is taken away from him by a rock crashing through their bedroom window, and during the excitement, Splinters disappears. After this happening, the boys hurry to the lagoon where Barney Dunlap is guarding the mystery plane. They find Marsha Winfield and her small charge, Jean Kingsley, there. And Marsha tells the boys that her brother was caught in the evil toils of the octopus and had disappeared. At that moment, the octopus comes in over the short wave set in the plane, warning them to give up the search and to burn the plane. As a result, Clint orders Barney to fly the mystery plane to China via the clipper route. We find the boys at the dock next morning just before dawn. Well, Clint, I'm all set for the takeoff. The boys filled them enormous gas tanks with enough fuel to fly clean to China. <laughs> Maybe you have enough fuel, Barney, but you're not going to take any chances. Now, you land at Guam, Manila, Macau, and then Hong Kong, just as the Clipper does. Uh, we don't want to lose that plane. Well, the short wave set and radio telegraph. Hey, how about me? Don't I count? <laughs> You'll be safe enough, you old cloud jumper. <laughs> just remember to keep inside of us on the Clipper at all times. And keep in touch with us by your radio telegraph. Don't worry about me, kid. I'm an old hand at this sort of thing. It's going to be swell to be at the controls again, riding the wind. Well, they're warming up the motor. I'll be calling KHAGV China Clippers so much, the radio officer's key finger will be worn out answering me. <laughs> well, so long, So Barney. long, Barney. So long, Barney. Good luck. <laughs> Gee, he's a swell guy. No, he's one of the best, Steve. One of the most capable men in the secret police, too. Sure makes me proud to be in the same outfit with such guys as you and Barney, Clint. I can hardly believe all this has really happened to me. Flying on the China Clipper, getting into all sorts of adventures with the Octopus Gang. Yeah, I'm afraid you're in for plenty more adventures, Speed. Oh, look, there goes Barney into the cockpit now. The sun's just rising. Barney's plane's right in the path of its rays on the water. Yeah, that plane's a beautiful job. It's in perfect condition, too. Ground crew checked the motor and control system and so forth. 
And Barney made sure he had plenty of sandwiches and water stored away. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, Barney's waving. <laughs> so long. I'll see you in Guam, Barney. Hello, you guys. Sure, tell Barney learn how to fly in the Army Pursuit Squadron. Hey, look, he's banking. He's going to come back and circle over us. Come on, Barney. Goodbye, Barney. Good luck, old boy. There he goes, straight for Guam. Yes, hey, we'd better get going, too, or the clipper will take off without us. Say, we're in luck. The other passengers are all in the after cabin for the time being, I guess, reading or playing games. Well, now's our chance to have a look at that map your brother sent you, Miss Marsha. Yes, indeed, Pimp. It's here, in this locket I'm wearing. A map in that little locket, Miss Marsha? Yes, Pete. You see, the map is on onion skin paper. Very thin. I'll take it out now and show you. Here. Hey, this is going to be tough to follow. Yes. I'm afraid we'll have to use our imaginations on at least a half of the map until we actually reach Hong Kong and get someone who really knows the city well to help us. Daddy can help you, Marcia. He knows Hong Kong inside and out. That's right, Jean. Yes, we can trust the doctor, too. That's important because if the octopus heard that this map existed, he'd stop at nothing to get it. But I'm not trying to get it away from Miss Marcia. No, I'll say not. This map's going to be a big help. But you must be careful. The octopus has many friends. Friends in high circles. Uh, so are we, Marcia. Remember our organization, the International Secret Police. While we may have enemies of every creed, race, and caste, we also have friends as very. Yes, and just as power. I know. And we're going to find your brother, too. Don't forget that. Oh, if you only can, Steve. If we're not too late. Uh, we'll find him. Don't you worry. Now, uh, may I keep this map until we reach Guam? If I try to make a copy of it, we may be interrupted, and I don't want anyone to see it. Of course. Boy, doesn't Barney's plan look swell against that cloud bank we're flying over? That chrome finish shines like... Like diamonds. Like the water at YCC Beach look like diamonds in the moonlight. What's that plane got to do with water? Well, they both sparkle. Well, <laughs> Gene's right, Steve. <laughs> right now, I'll just give you a tip that'll come in very handy in diplomatic circles. Never argue with a lady. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Wasn't it about an hour ago that you last heard from Barney? Oh, yes. I think I'll go up in the control room in a few minutes. Should be getting another flash from him long about now. Can I come too, Clint? Well, now, you'd be leaving Marsha and Jean alone. Oh, that's all right, Clint. We can keep watch on Barney from here while you and Steve talk to him by radio telegraph. By all means. You know, Miss Marsha, we're lucky to get into the control room at all. If we weren't in the secret police, we'd never be allowed in the control room with the fly crew. I know, Steve. Now, don't worry about us. But first... Have you any idea when we'll reach Guam? It'll be very soon. We'd be able to see it if these clouds weren't below us. Oh, but I like the clouds. They look like big marshmallows of cotton, don't they? There you go again, marshmallows. If you went through them in an open plane, you'd find out they were doggone cold and wet. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> now, we'd better get up to the control room before another argument starts, huh? We'll be back soon. All right, and give our regards to Barney. Okay, Miss Marcia. Gee, Clint, getting up in the control room was one of the big thrills of the trip to me. Seeing that big instrument board and having the captain or the first officer explain things to me. Well, I'll have to admit that this trip is a wonderful opportunity for you, Steve. Insofar as the clipper flight itself is concerned, it's the octopus angle that I don't like. Don't worry, Clint. I can take care of myself. And I hope that I can really help you and Barney on the job. Mm. Oh, well, here we are. We won't bother anyone but the radio officer, Steve. The rest of the crew have enough in their hands without talking to us. I know. Anyhow, we'll be losing altitude pretty soon for the Guam landing, and that means cloud flying. I won't bother them. Don't worry. Oh, that'd be good, boy. All right, step in, Steve. Now, past the navigators, right to the radio officer. There we are. 
I think we're out of everybody's way, too. Oh, hello, Mr. Barlow. I've just been talking to Dunlap. Got it written down here for you. Oh, thanks, Nick. Uh, read it, Speed. Barney says, sandwiches swell, but I sure miss those clipper meals. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Barney. Nothing ever interferes with his appetite. Will you send a message for me, Mr. Smith? Why, sure thing, Speed. What'll it be? Tell him we're nearing Guam and ask him how he's going to like flying through those clouds in an open plane for his landing. <laughs> okay. I can just see his face when he gets that. <laughs> yes, sir. Won't he be surprised? <laughs> <laughs> well, he says it isn't his regular bath day, but he'll put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, is the weather bad at Guam, Smith? No, Guam reports fair weather. The wind's breaking up these clouds in that area, and we're over the worst of it right now. Hey, Clint. Look at Barney's plane. Is he trying to stunt? What's that monkey trying to do? Why, banking that plane like that? Something's wrong for sure. Hey, quick, send this message, Smith. Anything wrong, Barney? Uh, look, look, he's going into a nosedive. He's heading right down into them black clouds, Clint. Uh, he's either crazy or in trouble. Here's his answer. Barlow, planes out of my control. Can't bring it out of this... Dive. It's a robot plane, I bet. The octopus is working it from Hong Kong. Well, tell him. Tell him that, Smith. It's a robot plane for sure. Tell him to bring it out of that dive. Look. Look, there he goes into the clouds. Oh, one straight to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean if he doesn't get that plane out of that nose dive. This, this crate is a robot plane. The controls are locked. Barney. A robot. Control's locked. That means the octopus has some device in that plane to wreck it if it falls into the enemy's hands. Probably a pin to lock the controls, which the octopus controls by radio. And the only way Barney can regain control is to find the locking pin. Mr. Smith, send that to Barney. Tell him to look for the locking pin. It's his only chance. If we could only see him, anything could be happening to him under those clouds. Oh, I shouldn't have tried to keep that plane. I might have known the octopus had a trump card up his sleeve. If anything happens to Barney, I'll... Dunlap's talking again. Can't find pin yet. No use. Altimeter sinking fast. Visibility zero. Looks like curtains, pal. So long. Well, go on. Go on, Smith. What does he say? The key's dead, Barlow. Dunlap isn't sending anything to us. Oh, gee, nothing can happen to Barney. Try to reach him, Mr. Smith. Send out your call. I'll do my best, Speed. No answer, Clint. Clint, he doesn't answer. You don't think... Oh, steady. Steady, Speed. We can't think now. All we can do is... is hope. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling
Pete Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, all members of the International Secret Police, are flying to Hong Kong on the China Clipper to capture the criminal known as the Octopus. Thus far on the trip, Speed has been responsible for the arrest of three octopus spies sent to turn the secret police from their course. The last arrest on Wake Island was a renegade aviator who mysteriously disappeared just as he was about to reveal the octopus hideout to the boys. They have his special bullet plane, however, equipped with all the latest aeronautical improvements, and Clint orders Barney to fly this plane to Hong Kong, making the usual stops at Guam, Manila, and Macau, and to also remain in sight of the clipper. As they are nearing Guam Island, Barney's plane suddenly goes into a nosedive, disappearing in the clouds banked below. The flight crew are as excited as the boys, and when the clipper lands at Guam, they all hurry ashore to see if the Guam ground crew has seen or heard anything of the missing aviator. Gee, Quinn, I sure hope that they have heard something from Barney. Well, they may have seen him come down and sent a boat out to help him. Oh, it was terrible to watch him drop into the clouds like he did. The sky was so empty. And those clouds he went into were so black, Marcia. I'm scared for Barney. Oh, don't you worry, Jean, honey. He's probably safe and sound somewhere. He's gotta be. Barney can't go out like that. He's too good a guy to... Clint, do you see who I see? Why, well, well, it can't be. But it is. It's Barney. Oh, Barney, you're all right. He did fall into the ocean. Oh, we were so worried about Hello, you. Hello, everybody. What's all the excitement about? What's all the excitement? Oh, that's a fine thing to say after scaring everybody out of a year's growth by going into that nosedive. You all were scared. How did you think Barney. I felt up there coming down fast? <laughs> It's hard to say which is the worst, Mr. Dunlap, sitting in the control yeah. clipper room, watching you dive out of sight, or doing the actual diving. As long as you're safe now, that's all that matters. Thanks, Smith. I kept hearing your signals come in, but I couldn't take time to answer them. I know if I didn't pull that plane out of the dive, I'd have a long swim ahead of me. Mr. Smith and the rest of the flight crew were swell, Barney. We were just going to see if the ground crew knew anything about you when you came up to us. <laughs> The ground crew knows about me all right. When I came diving out of that broken overcast, they saw me and thought I was a goner sure. But what actually happened, Barney? Let's get out of this crowd and I'll tell you. Yes. All right, see you later, Smith. Oh, you bet, Mr. Barlow. Over here on the other side, the dock's all right, huh, Clint? And look, there's Barney's plane. Yeah, and just let me get my hands on the octopus. I'll knock him so far it'll take him two years to walk back. Well, instead of telling us what you're going to do to the octopus, Suppose you tell us what he did to you to send you into that spin. The big devil fish? He has some sort of radio control of that plane, and just about the time he knew I'd be in the air, he pressed a button. A metal pin dropped into the controls, and I was off in a nosedive. Imagine taking advantage of me while I was in a cloud bank. Well, what'd you do then, Barney? By the time I realized what had happened, I was in the clouds with visibility zero. Then you sent your idea over the radio telegraph... So I fumbled around until I located the pin, pulled it out, and straightened out the ship for a landing. <laughs> and boy, when I did that, I was as close as I could be to the water and still level out for a decent landing. Well, why didn't you radio the clipper that you were safe? I, I just sat down a few minutes before you came down, Clint. And I was identifying myself to the ground crew after that. While I was nosediving, believe you me, I didn't have any time to work the radio telegraph. I was about the busiest person in the air in the world, I bet. You'll have to give that plane a real going over before you take off again in the morning, Barney. No telling what else the octopus has under radio control. You tell him, kid. I don't want a wing to fall off between here and Manila. Well, right now, we'd better go on to the inn and see where our rooms are going to be. <laughs> I think you and Jean could use a little rest and quiet, don't you, Marsha? Oh, we're not at all tired, Clint. We were worried about Barney, of course, but now that he's safe, why, we're going to enjoy ourselves. Guam is beautiful. I should say so. Just like the islands you read about in books. Has this place here a name? It looks like a little town. Its name is Sumay, Jean. One of the navigators was telling me about it before we landed. There's another place that's gone you about 12 miles from here. That's where the American naval base is. I'd sure like to see that, Clint. Oh, I would too. Do you think we could arrange to drive over there before dark? Mm, well, if you really feel up to it... How about you, Barney? I'm round to go, pal. You know me. A nosedive a day keeps me from getting bored. Oh, goody, then we can go. <laughs> well, it looks that way. Now, let's go to the inn now and see about our rooms, huh? And I'll see about getting a car to drive us over to a Ghana at the same time. Hot ziggity. This is what I really call traveling. Listen, kid. What you call traveling would be a nervous breakdown for anybody else. But don't get me wrong. After flying over the Pacific Ocean in a plane with a controls lock, I'd like to see as much of Guam and dry land as I can. 
Houses standing on top of those silk beads. Uh huh. Native huts. You know, Guam is so different from almost every place else. Here, a person can find the real peace and beauty of island life. And yet, even way out here, they have electricity, paved roads, schools, movies, ice, everything. Yep. A guy born in Guam has everything but United States citizenship. Now, that's a funny thing. He owes allegiance to America, but he can never become an, a, a citizen. When is an American citizen not an American citizen? When he's born in Guam. <laughs> See, I'm glad I was born in America then. The other's almost like being a man without a country. Oh, no, Speed. Guam is a naval base now, as you know. Every man here, aside from the Clipper ground crew, is a naval man with an official job, from the governor to the street sweeper. The people here are citizens of Guam, but since Guam is not a country, but a part of the United States, none of them courts or Congress has any real legal standing since the governor, who is all-powerful here, could do away with one or all of them if he wanted to. Sounds awfully mixed up to me, Clint. <laughs> well, it's mixed up to most people, Jean. I'd advise you to admire the island itself and not try to fathom its political standing. Weren't we rather lucky to get a car, Clint? Mm, in a way. There are only a few on the island, but the Clipper people do everything possible to make their passengers happy, and hence the car. Hey, speak. What are you looking so glum about? I wasn't looking glum. I was thinking. Oh, so that's what you call it. Kind of unusual, ain't it? <laughs> I hope not, Barney. Say, do you think that the native driving this car isn't an American citizen? <laughs> well, in spite of the fact that your question met itself coming back speed, he isn't. I was thinking something else, too. Barney, has the octopus plane got a direction finder on it? Yeah. What's a direction finder, Speed? Oh, it's a jigger shaped something like a little hoop, Gene. It's attached to a dial on the instrument board. When the pilot's getting a message from the ground or from another ship, he can turn his direction finder and learn which direction the message is coming from. Is that right, Clint? Uh, well, it's right enough for the moment. Now, look. Next time the octopus gives out with another warning, why can't we use his own direction finder on him and learn just where his hideout is from that? But is such a thing possible? Oh, yes, Marsha. But several things must be done before our location can be accurately found. Now, for one thing, we need two direction finders. One from Barney's ship, and then one from another point, say a ship 100 or 200 miles away from us. And then when the message came through, they could both line the direction from where it came. And where the lines crossed, there would be the octopus. That sounds simple enough. Ain't as simple as it sounds, though. We're still too far away from Hong Kong to be able to locate the exact spot of his hideout. Once we get to China, though, it'll be a different story, providing he starts broadcasting again. Gee, I bet he won't. Well, I can almost guarantee that he won't. This man's a genius, Marsha. We happen to know that he's experimenting in shortwave radio. Uh, has accomplished some astounding things, so knowing about the direction finders, he certainly wouldn't risk broadcasting to us once we're near enough China to check his station. But there must be some way of feeding him at his own game, Clint. There is a way, Marsha. We don't know what it is yet, but, but that's why we're going to Hong Kong. Every criminal, no matter how clever he is, makes one mistake. If the octopus hasn't made his yet, he will. And that's how we're going to catch him. Mm, this is a spooky place, isn't it? The trees hang way over the road in through here. Yeah, I could find more cheerful spots on Guam myself than this. And I just landed. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, my wow, is a blowout. We have to fly almost 6,500 miles to have a tire blowout. Sorry, Mr. Barlow. I will repair the tire immediately. All right, driver. Hope it won't hold us up too long. Oh, not at all. I have a spare tire which will replace the bad one. I wonder if I can help him. No, you better not, Speed. Probably change tires in this car so often that he can do it a lot faster alone. Well, what do you say if we get out and stretch our legs? This car may be a seven passenger, but it still cramps my stride. <laughs> Especially as we all rode him back, huh, Barney? <laughs> well, we can get out for a few minutes if you wait. And I advise you all to stay beside the car. Be easy to lose yourselves in this thick underbrush. Too easy. I must confess I don't like this particular spot, Do you think it's safe? Oh, yes. We can't be very far from the naval base. There's no danger of holdups or anything like that on this island. Unless the octopus got ideas. Oh, now pipe down, Barney. 
He's up to enough mischief without you building up trouble with your imagination. But even the birds aren't making as much noise, Barney. It's not like right. they don't like this place either. Oh, they're just getting ready for bed, Gene. These trees and bushes shut out the sun. Hey, behind you! Oh! Oh, that man appeared so suddenly. He frightened you. None of you make a move. Or it sounds, unless you answer my question. Well, who are you to talk like this? Call me Mr. X. And now, Miss Winfield, hand over that map your brother sent you. The map? Hey, how do you know anything about a map? Who are you, anyhow? I ask the question, Speed Gibson. Give me that map, Miss Winfield. But I haven't got it. Don't lie. You carry it in that locket you're wearing. Uh, keep away, you are... Words are no match for my revolver, Barlow. A locket, before I lose my patience. It's true. I haven't got the map with me. Keep away from me. No, no! Gunner, no gun. Let me at that guy. All right. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, operators of the International Secret Police, are on their way to China via the China Clipper to capture the master criminal, the octopus. They have already had several exciting encounters with spies of their enemy, but during the stopover at Guam Island, they have no idea of danger when they take a sightseeing drive to the naval base some 12 miles away from the Clipper landing. With them are little Jean Kingsley and her governess, Marsha Winfield, who is also seeking the octopus, whom she holds responsible for her brother's mysterious disappearance. During the drive, in a particularly gloomy spot of the road, a tire blows out, and when their driver stops the car to repair it, a man, calling himself Mr. X, steps out from the surrounding underbrush and demands the map that Marsh's brother sent her, which partially describes the location of the octopus headquarters. Barney lunges at the man, and a fight follows. Oh, I've got his gun, Clint. Good boy, Speed. Stand back, you guys. I got him. Oh, look out. He's getting away. Grab him. Get out of the way, Barney. Right. There he goes. Quick, Barney. You go that way. I'll follow him this way. Maybe we have to walk. Through. Okay, you stand. Take care of Marsh and Jean, Speed. Don't worry. I will. <laughs> Oh, Marsh, hush, Jean, honey. It's all over now. There's nothing to cry about here. Oh, Marsha, I was afraid Speed and Clint and Barney would get hurt by that awful Mr. X. But they didn't. Look how brave Speed is. Aren't you ashamed to let him see you crying? Yes, but he's a boy and in the secret police. I don't blame you for being scared, Jean. I sure was. If Clint and Barney had been alone, I wouldn't have minded that guy so much. But with girls along, it's different. Wasn't scared for me, Speed, but for you. Found him yet, Clint? Then he's putting on that spare tire, driver. Because I'm afraid he won't have time to get a good look at the naval base of the Ganya because of all this trouble. Hey. What is it, Speed? Down here on the road. Some broken glass. That's what made our tire blow out. Do you think that Mr. X put the glass on the road on purpose? Sure as anything. The whole thing was planned. Oh, heavens. I hope we can leave this place soon. There may be more of them in the underbrush. Underbrush is too thick around here. Why don't 
I did until he shocked me. That guy was as slippery as grease. One minute I was holding him tight, and the next thing he pops me in the eye. Have I got a shiner? Uh, you're going to have one, that's sure. Fine thing. What'll people say? I go to look at the naval base and come back with a black eye. <laughs> oh, well, you have the tire on, huh, driver? Oh, yes, Mr. Barlow. I was just trying to leave vaults, and then we can go on. Clint, look at this broken glass. We think Mr. X put it on the road to stop us. Suffering wang doodles. Can you beat that? But how did he know we were coming along this road? Uh, if we could figure out how the octopus knows things, Barney, we'd practically have him captured. That man has spies everywhere. I tell you, it's uncanny. Um, uncanny and uncomfortable. Why is it whenever anybody gets shocked, it's me? <laughs> it's probably because you have too much faith in human nature. <laughs> uh, we might just as well get into the car now. The tire's on. We can still see the naval base, can't we, Clint? Uh, afraid not, Speed. I don't want to take any chances on being ambushed again. Next time, there may be more than one Mr. X. Yeah, for all we know, they may be listening to us right now. I guess we'd better go back to the inn, then. Right. Oh, uh, there are several things I want to discuss with you, Marsha, but meanwhile, let's forget the whole thing. Uh, we won't talk business until we've had our dinner. My shiner. The doc did his best to tone it down, but I still had to take a lot of kidding from the ground crew and the flight crew. Does it hurt much, Barney? No, not so much now. Say, where are we going to have our little talk? Uh, head for that door straight ahead. It's the uh, inn manager's office. He assured us of complete privacy. That's swell. Is it all right if I come along too, Clint? Uh, I want you to come, Jean. Even though you're a little girl, you've shown a lot of courage and common sense in the past. And until we hand you over to your father, I think you should know as much of our business as necessary. It might help you in an emergency sometime. Oh, it's right in here, please. Now, this is better. Everybody make themselves comfortable. It's wonderful to relax, isn't it? Or do you know, Clint, in your profession, do you ever relax? <laughs> well, I certainly do, Marcia. Completely. Otherwise, I couldn't keep going. But we never relax while we're on the job. It's like Clint never takes off a makeup once you start on a job, Miss Marcia. But doesn't that take a great deal of care? Oh, not too much. I've done it for so long, Marcia. I've played everything from grandfathers to babies. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, to get on to business. Uh, I've made a copy of the map, Marcia, up in our room before dinner. So here's yours on the onion skin paper. Oh, thank you, Clint. Wasn't it fortunate that it was in your room rather than in my locket? If Mr. X had succeeded in getting it, we would have had no clue at all to the whereabouts of the octopus. Yeah, that's one time old devil fish slipped up. He didn't know you'd given the map to Clint aboard the clipper so as Clint could make a copy of it. How did you know, Barney? You were flying in that other plane when Marsha gave Clint the map. Well, I... Say, are you turning into a detective too, Jean? What is this? <laughs> now she asks you a good question, my friend. How did you know? Speed told me, if you must know. Oh, you don't miss a thing, do you, Barney? By the way, what are you going to do with that plane once you get it to China? Rip out one of the gasoline compartments so the three of us can fly in it instead of just two. You're all going to fly in that plane? But where? Uh, we don't know yet, Marcia, but just because the Octopus has his smuggling headquarters in Hong Kong, there's no sign he'll stay there, particularly after we arrive there. We can use that plane of his in pursuit. Oh, it's perfect for hops around the country. It has plenty of speed and power. We could chase our enemy all over China with it. Even as far as Tibet? Particularly as far as Tibet, Marsha. I'm not going to leave a stone unturned in an effort to locate your brother or some clue concerning his disappearance. We must learn just why he became involved with the octopus and where he is now. Oh, I hope we can. Maybe our Hong Kong operator will know something about him, Miss Marcia. Oh, you can't possibly know how much I appreciate your interest. But I can't be so selfish as to allow my trouble to interfere with your duties. It won't. Maybe finding your brother will be the way we'll find the octopus. You never know which way the wind's going to blow in this game. I think my daddy can help Marsha, too. He knows a lot of people in China. Oh, I don't want to bother him, honey. You mustn't say a word about my real reason for coming to China. You've got the wrong idea, Miss Marsha. We're all going to stick together. All except me. I have to fly that bullet plane alone. When does the clipper take off from Manila in the morning? Uh, 6 a.m. Oh, you... You feel edgy about flying it, Barney, after that nosedive? Me edgy? Nah. 
I'd just like to see that octopus try to pull anything now. my Guam operator, too, that he has failed. You mean he did not recover the map from the Winfield girl? No. And more, he ran danger of himself being captured. It was only by sheer luck that he managed to escape from Gibson, Barlow, and Dunlap. He could not get the locket, then? The locket, yes. But the map was not inside. Probably the girl has given it to Clint. Has told him a story. That is that. Do not worry. Their knowledge, the little she can give, will do them no good. But Winfield was more clever than I thought it. I had no idea the map existed until recently. Perhaps we should not have used him as we did. Do you question the octopus? No, master. You are always right. But the map... At most, they will gain little from it. Most of it is blurred by liquid. But I will take no chances. There is still time to regain the map before our friend reach Hong Kong. What have you learned of Dr. Kingsley? I saw him today. He is looking forward to the arrival of his little daughter. Does he know anything about Winfield? No. All that happened before the doctor came to China. But he has heard whispers of the sudden end of the oil company. No. The diplomatic circles have no particular interest in such things, master. Good. They would have known from his sister's cables and wires. But I saw that the communications never arrived in the hands of the authorities. It was I who replied to Miss Winfield's anxious cables. (laughs) I who assured her that we were doing everything in our power to find him. I signed the consul's name. (laughs) It was most amusing. But now that she is actually coming to China, do you think you will be able to put her off so easily, Master? Should she land in Hong Kong, I will take care of her, never fear. But now I must concentrate on preventing the girl and the secret police from coming to Hong Kong. What is your plan? They leave Guam at dawn. Barney Dunlap will again be flying my bullet plane. Who? He has no fear whatsoever. When I locked the controls of the plane by radio, he stared dead in the face. But still he laughs on, without fear. Hmm. Would that you had similar men in your band, master. I have better men. With similar courage and without hearts. But these secret police, Speed, Clint, and Barney, they have hearts. (laughs) And because of that alone, I shall conquer them. Granted. However, they come at a most unfortunate time. Our business is at its height. They may interfere. I have thought of that. I still hope to stop them before they reach Hong Kong. In fact, I have already sent word to our operator in Manila, issuing instructions that their entertainment there shall be supplied by a member of the Octopus Band. (laughs) It will be most unusual.
Gibson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, Clint, and Barney are drawing close to their destination of Hong Kong, China to arrest, if possible, the number one criminal of the 20th century, the octopus. The first clue that the boys have as to the criminal's headquarters is on a small, barely legible map which Marsha Winfield's brother sent her prior to his mysterious disappearance. During a sightseeing tour on Guam Island, one of the octopus spies fails in an attempt to recover this map. The octopus learns of the failure and determines to stop the pursuit of the International Secret Police in Manila. Meanwhile, Speed, Clint, and Barney have decided to show Manila to Marsha and little Jean. We find them in a colorful cafe. Well, Jean, what do you think of Manila? It's wonderful, Clint, but so mixed up. All sorts of people live here, don't they? Yes, the Philippines, or the Thousand Islands, as they were once called... A sort of a melting pot for black, yellow, and white. That's what makes it so colorful. Manila's Chinatown with its narrow streets and overhanging balconies, the ruins of Spanish buildings and the old forts and the canal. You know, of all the places we've seen on our trip, I think that Manila is one of the most interesting. But the weather's sure hot, isn't it? Kind of sticky. Oh, you're so used to the comfort of the China Kipper that you're a little spoiled for land speed. You're a true aviator, all right. I hope so, Miss Marcia. I'm trying hard to be. Don't tell me you fly, too. He sure does. The kid has all the makings of a bird man, Marcia. Barney's teaching me. I soloed a lot already. Goody. When will you take me up, Steve? Oh, you know, wait a minute. Hold on, young lady. Haven't you spent enough time in the sky during the last few days? But Speed wasn't flying the clipper, Clint. <laughs> <laughs> Will I have a few more hours in the air, Gene? Then I'll take you up for a ride. But I still have a lot to learn. Not only flying, but I'm studying everything else that'll help me to be a really good secret policeman. Radio, telegraphy, criminal law, fingerprinting, and a book on the art of makeup. Clint told me to learn that by heart. Then he'd give me some real experience of making people up. Isn't makeup rather a new thing in criminal capturing, Clint? Oh, in a way, Marcia. Everyone has read about the old-time detectives who wore everything from false teeth to false faces when shadowing their quarry. But the more modern type of makeup has taken a hint from motion pictures, and the result is far more realistic. Now, as an example, would you think that I had on a disguise now? No. Of course, I've never seen you any other way, but I can't imagine you looking any different than you do now. Then let me tell you, Marcia, if Clint took his makeup off now and you was to pass him on the street, you'd never recognize him. Oh, I'd know Clint. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Someday I hope I can get as good as he is on that stuff. It's one of the most important things in detecting. Whatever started you on this career of yours, Speed? Growing up around Clint most, I guess. Wouldn't want to be a better guy than him. Nobody could be better. Oh, oh, oh now, wait a minute. <laughs> You'll have me blushing. But here. it's true, Clint. If I was going to tell Miss Marsha all the things you've done for oh, me... Now, now, spare her the lurid details. She's probably wondering, if I am so smart, why I ever consented to bring you along on such a dangerous mission. Well, I presumed it was because Speed could help you in your search for the octopus. Oh, he's helped, all right. In fact, he's done most of the work so far. Speed is here because Chief Riley, head of the secret police, insisted on it. You see, back home, Blackie Spears, one of the octopus gang, broke into our rooms in an effort to find the key to our police code. Well, Speed knocked him out, so the chief decided it would be safer to send him along with me. Swore him into service, and <laughs> well, here he is. And I wouldn't have missed all this for anything. I just hope we capture the octopus. Me too. I ain't forgetting that guy played me a dirty trick while I was flying his bullet plane and almost ended my promising career. And on top of that, one of his gang gives me this black eye at Guam. I'll send him into a nosedive if I ever get my hands on him. That man is terrible. He's a danger to the whole civilized world. His smuggling alone is sure giving China a headache. Well, I'll say. The Chinese government wants to put a stop to the dope smuggling. Well, the worst of it is that the octopus doesn't confine himself to one brand of criminal activity, but dabbles in every form of it. You've been on his trail before? Yes, I first came in contact with him about ten years ago in South America. He was in politics then, stirring up the natives to revolution. For his own gain. And the secret police ended that racket. 
But the leader, the octopus, escaped. Have you ever seen how he looks, Clint? Uh, no, Jean. You see, he always wears a black silk mask. Well, yes, we did catch a glimpse of him once in that mix-up, but that was all. Yeah, I think the guy sleeps with that mask on. Uh, he's always escaped so far, but he won't this time. The world isn't big enough for the octopus and me. One of us won't be in it after the smoke clears away. Now, I promise you that. Hey, what is this, a lecture? I'd like to see more of Manila. Yes, there are all sorts of historic places around here. And the streets are so colorful, the main one's so modern, and the side streets so quaint. The lady wishes to see Manila. Lottie, good guide. Hey, who's this guy? Uh, my name, Lottie. Good guide. Show you all four. Oh, no. No, thanks. No, we don't want a guide. Oh, gee, Clint. Can't we use him for a little while? It's early yet, and he could take us places that'd take us a long time to find, maybe. Oh, yes. I'd love to see Manila. Looks like you're outnumbered, Clint. I'd kind of like to take a look-see around this park myself. Uh, what about you, Marshal? Oh, I'd love it. Huh? <laughs> I'm not keen on picking up a strange guide like this, but oh, I guess it won't hurt anything. Lead on, Lodi, old kid. <laughs> oh, what a name. He'll hear you, Barney. No, no, he's some sort of foreigner. He can't talk good English, let alone understand it. This way, please. Say, he's not taking us out the way we came in. <laughs> Here. Hey, wait a minute. Hold on, Lucy. Where are you taking us? Outside entrance, closer to Old Port. See more of Old Town. Oh, no. No, this cafe is enough of Old Town for me. Uh, I don't want to see anything any older. Oh, come on, Clint. This is swell. Yeah, oh, please, come on. Clint. Uh, all right, then. Let's get it over with. Say, this street is so old that it's dead. There ain't a person in sight. Only Filipino people live on this street. This is our food. They inside eating. Ah. Well, still want to go through with this, Marsha? Oh, yes. This is exciting. Hold on to my hand, Jean. Don't worry. I am, Marsha. This place is kind of spooky. It's plenty dark, all right. The lights are awful dim. What's that coming toward us? A carreta, little one. A wagon. Uh, we must step aside to let it pass. Here, here, in this doorway. Say, this building looks like an old church. It is one of the Spanish churches. Hey, Barney. Barney, that door is opening. Huh? Yes, fella. This is another ambush. Loti is a member of the octopus band. I'm sure of it. Suffer and wang doodles. What do we do? Uh, the Carreza. It's our only chance. No telling how many men are behind this door. When that wagon gets to us, you take Jean, I'll grab Marsha, and into the wagon with him. And we'll ride our way out of here. Good enough. It's almost here now. What about speed? Uh, he'll follow us. I'll give Loti a shove as you pass him. Leave him to me. Wait. Here comes the wagon. Stand ready. We must go inside church to allow wagon to pass. Oh, yeah? Take this to remember me, but. Quick, into the wagon, Marshal. Jean's in already. Hey, what's wrong? Oh, heavens. Hey, I'll, I'll give you a hand. Up you go. There you go. Grab the reins and get out of here, Bonnie. Yeah, man. Move over, my friend. Get up there. Come on, get up. Golly, look at all those guys coming down that doorway we were standing yeah, in. That was another ambush, Steve. Another minute we'd have been inside that church and... Probably we'd never been heard of again. Oh, how horrible. What a risk we ran. Oh, I didn't like the look of it from the beginning. I know. We talked you into it, Clint. Boy, after this, what you say goes. Hey, where do you want to go in this karaoke or whatever you call it? Well, get back on the main street and then head for the hotel, Bonnie. We've seen all of Manila we're going to. I was in the wagon before I knew what was happening. <laughs> hey, look at the driver. He sure doesn't know what's happened. Sitting there staring at us like we were crazy. He's right, too, if you ask me. Anybody else want to drive? No, no. You're doing a good job of it. Now, wait. Now, slow down a little. We don't want any accidents. And we're nearing the main street again. It hardly seems possible for such a thing to happen so near the heart of the town. Anything can happen when the octopus has a say in it, Miss Marcia. Manila's swell. I'll feel a lot better when we're flying in the clipper again tomorrow. Yes, sir. We can't take off too soon for me. Well, it won't be long now, will it, Clint? It's only a short hop between Macau and Hong Kong. Uh, it's a short hop, but the two ports are vastly different. Macau is under the Portuguese authority, while Hong Kong is British. I'm awful excited. So much happened in Guam and Manila. Seems like the closer we get to the octopus, the more adventures we have. Uh, that's because he's doing his best to stop us, Steve. 
Well, have you recovered from last night's excitement, Marcia? Oh, somewhat. But I had nightmares all night. I thought I was being dragged into old churches and forts, and I seemed to see the octopus everywhere. Not as a man, but as a sea monster. Well, I'll breathe easier when we arrive in Hong Kong. Jean will be safe with her father, and I hope that we can arrange some safe quarters for you, Marcia. You leave the search for your brother to us, won't you? Oh, I can't. Clint, you know that. Look. There's Hong Kong now. Oh, look at all those funny boats down there. Chinese boats. Bonnie's doing a loop for us. Guess he's glad to get here, too. Mm, he better not try any stunting over this port. The port authorities will ground him in a hurry. Gee, this has been a swell flight. I think the China Clipper is, well, colossal. I can't think of a better word. And you're right, Steve. One couldn't ask for anything better than the Clipper trip. Everything has been perfect. The flight itself, the stopover accommodation... It would have been heaven if we hadn't had our main problem to contend with, the octopus. Well, now that we're almost on his home ground, I think we'll have a better chance of striking back, Marcia. I really I think... beg pardon, Mr. Barlow. Hmm? Oh, yes, Stuart. A message for you, relayed from our Hong Kong station. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, well, I'll be... What does it say, Clint? Is it bad news? Read it, Clint. It says, welcome to Hong Kong. I guarantee you a lively visit and a short one. The octopus. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling Our three friends, Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, have at last arrived in Hong Kong, China, the end of the long hop aboard the China Clipper from Alameda, California. They are determined to capture the octopus. The only clue they have as to his Hong Kong headquarters is a barely legible map which Marsha Winfield gave them and which her brother sent her just before his mysterious disappearance in connection with the octopus. Just before the Clipper landed... Clint received an insolent welcoming wire from his enemy, and he can hardly wait to tell this to Barney, who is flying a special bullet monoplane the boys confiscated from an octopus spy on Wake Island. After their passports have been visaed and everything is in order, our friends make their way along the crowded dock, with little Gene Kingsley and Speed all eyes as they step on Chinese soil for the first time. Boy, what a place. What smell? Different from anything I ever smelled before. <laughs> You'll find most everything different from anything you've ever experienced before, Jean. This is China, the Far East. Oh, I like it, Clint. But I just sort of have to get used to it. Hey, look, here comes Barney. <laughs> a welcoming committee of one again. Jean's father intended meeting us, too. I wonder where he is. Hello, everybody. What kept you so long? I could have landed my crate an hour ago, but I had some fun stunting waiting for you. Uh, the way you were scooting along the skyways after we took off in Manila, I'm surprised you're not in Paris by this time. What was your hurry? I've been hurrying ever since we left Alameda. Either chasing octopus spies or being chased. Why should I slow down now? And boy... 
that little ship can beat anything in the air. She's got everything. Power, speed... And a very bad reputation. Don't forget that. Have you tended to your passport yet? Sure. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't. These British fellas are mighty careful about who lands here and why. But, of course, my international secret police credentials fix me up proper. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of papers, look at this. What's that, a telegram? Yeah. A welcome from the octopus. Yeah, yeah, what? Of all the nerve... Hey, hey, let's get Gene to a dad quick so as we can start on our real business of tracking that guy down. Oh, well, now that you've told everyone within earshot just why we're here, let's go see about our luggage. Oh, I hope Dr. Kingsley's waiting up there, too. He probably will be. You know, the clipper landed ten minutes early, Marsha. Possibly he didn't know about that. Gee, look at the rickshaws up there waiting for us. <laughs> just like the taxis at home. Oh, can we ride in one of those, Marsha? They look like they'd be lots of fun. Well, we'll see, Gene, honey. Oh, here comes your father now. Yes. Daddy, Daddy, here we are. Who's that with him, the Chinese? Yeah, how should we know? Oh, uh, Gene, well, darling, my darling baby, how are you? Oh, Daddy, <laughs> Daddy, I'm so glad to be with you again. But Marsha took awful good care of me. I'm sure of that. Well, welcome to Hong Kong, Miss Winfield. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kingsley. And may I introduce three friends who have also taken very good care of Gene? Mr. Barlow, no, did, Mr. Dunlap, and did Speed Gibson, Mr. Hi, Barlow's Mr. nephew. Mr. Gibson? And uh, may I introduce my friend, Mr. Kwan Wu? I am very pleased to make your acquaintance. I trust that your stay in China will be most happy. Well, thank you. Daddy, Speed saved me from drowning in Honolulu. Is that so? Well, good heavens, then, young man. I'm doubly happy to meet you. And uh, I'd like to talk to you further. Will you all dine with me tonight? You bet, Dr. Kingsley. I've got my mouth all fixed for a swell dish of chop suey. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you won't find much chop suey in China, Mr. Yeah. Dunlap, except in cafes catering to tourist trade. You know, uh, chop suey and charmaine are really American inventions, not Chinese. Huh. I'll be darned. It's getting so you can't believe a thing you eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'd better see to our luggage, Barney, and find a good hotel. I'm sure Dr. Kingsley has a lot to talk over with Jean and Marsha. Mr. Barlow, may I direct you to an hotel? Why, why, certainly, Mr. Wu. I would suggest the Fowler House. The accommodations are very modern, the service very fine. Uh, well, thank you. Can we take a rickshaw there, Clint? Yeah, we'll take two rickshaws, Speed. Uh, you and I in one, and Barney and the baggage in the other. And we'll see you this evening, then. Yes. My address is uh, 14 Lang Su Road. It's on the outskirts of the city, but the rickshaw boy will have no trouble finding it. And, uh, what time is dinner? At seven. Ah, see you then. Uh, I shall be looking forward to meeting you again tonight. Uh, at 14 Lang Su Road, until seven, then. You are going to that hotel now? The Fowler House? I guess so, Mr. Wu. And thanks for telling us about it. Only too glad to be of service, Master Gibson. Well, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye, 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 Doctor. Where did he get that master stuff? Just an old Chinese custom, kid. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> See, we aren't doing so bad getting invited out for supper the first night we arrive. Yeah, and that doesn't give us much time to get settled. I also want to contact our Hong Kong operator. Oh, boy. Hey, Rickshaw. Oh, yes, sir. I guess we'll need two of them. Yeah, now, take care of this baggage, dear. All right. And now we're going to Fowler House, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll just cruise around until we see a likely-looking hotel. Oh, but why, Clint? Mr. Wu recommended that other place. That's just why we're not going, Steve. Somehow, Mr. Wu impressed me as being a little too anxious to know of our whereabouts for the next few hours. You don't mean the octopus? I don't mean anything, Barney. I'm just not taking any chances. <laughs> This is a swell hotel you picked out, Clint. Away from all the noise, and it's more Chinese than American. Mm, glad you like it, Speed. As Mr. Wu would say, this has all modern accommodations. And uh, I'll add more safety than the Fowler House. Don't you trust that guy, Clint? I'm not trusting anyone, Barney, until they prove themselves trustworthy. Perhaps he's a very kindly Chinese gentleman who really has our best interests at heart. But because we're here as the secret police on the trail of the octopus, we have to watch every word and every move that any stranger makes. So I'd rather neither of you mention before Mr. Wu where we're staying tonight. Okay by me. When do we really start trailing the octopus, Clint? Uh, tomorrow, probably. I'm waiting for a call from the Hong Kong operator now. I couldn't contact him before, so I left word with the switchboard girl downstairs to keep after that number. But after I talk to him, 
I'll know more about what our first move will be. What about that map that you copied from the one Marsh's brother sent her? Well, I plan to see what I can learn from Dr. Kingsley tonight concerning that approximate neighborhood. However, if Mr. Wu is too much in evidence, that'll have to wait until I can see Jean's father alone. Well, I'll take care of Mr. Wu if you want to talk to Dr. Kingsley alone, Clint. I'll ask him a lot of questions about Hong Kong. Uh, that might be a good idea, Speed. We'll see tonight, huh? Uh, what about the bullet plane, Barney? The port officials are guarding that. They've been swell to us. Think I'll ask Kingsley who are the best people to make those changes we want. Taking out one of the gas tanks and putting in another seat. There's your call now, I bet, Clint. Hello. Yes? This is Barlow. I'd like some tea delivered. Oh, you have none ready tonight? Perhaps I'd better come to your shop tomorrow to pick out the blend I want. Uh, yes. I'll be there first thing in the morning. What do you want with tea, Clint? <laughs> tea happens to be information, Speed. That was a member of the International Secret Police I was talking to. He lives in Hong Kong as a tea merchant and also runs a tea house. And a very successful one, too, I may add. He hears many things in that line of business. And all that talk about tea really meant... That he had no information for me tonight. That is, nothing pressing. That we'll have to go to his shop in the morning to lay our plans. Swell. Then we got nothing to do tonight but eat and enjoy ourselves. And we'd better leave now or we'll never reach 14 Lang Su Road by 7. <laughs> Well, then you must be a very important man in China, Dr. Kingsley. Not only as a physician, but as a diplomat. Well, I know and love the Chinese, Mr. Barlow, and I respect them. Needless to say, my race looks upon Dr. Kingsley as a brother. Knowing China as you do, Dr. Kingsley, what have you heard about the octopus? A great deal. But how much is truth and how much is fiction, I can't say. We do know that he's smuggling dope and natives on a wholesale scale. But no one knows how or where. Now, that is why I'm so glad to welcome you as the International Secret Police. And I, China, is most anxious to rid itself of such an evil. Of course, you must understand, Mr. Barlow, that the consulate's office gets merely the whispers concerning this man. But uh, I shall help you in your efforts to find him in whatever way I can. I owe you, I owe Speed Gibson, a debt of gratitude that I can never pay. You see, he saved my daughter's life. You don't owe me a thing, Dr. Kingsley, because if I hadn't pulled Jean out of the water, maybe I never would have met you. <laughs> well, Speed has a lot of admiration for you, Doctor. Well, it's mutual, I assure you, Clint. Your nephew is not only a credit to the secret police, but he has the makings of an extraordinarily fine diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> he can fly, too, Daddy. And he's studying telegraphy, fingerprinting, radio, the art of makeup. Makeup? Have you stage aspirations, Speed? No, sir. But makeup is very important to the secret police. That is, good makeup. None of that phony stuff detectives used to use. Yes, indeed. Speed was telling me some things about shading and highlights in makeup that surprised me. Yeah, and Clint here can take one look at some fella he wants to resemble and can rebuild his own face so that they look like twins. <laughs> well, that's extraordinary. <laughs> Well, you'll find a good many interesting characters to study here in Hong Kong, Clint. And I think it would test even your ability to copy any of them. Me, maybe, Dr. Kingsley, but not Clint. He's the best man in the secret police at makeup. Why, he's... See, I've been noticing some of the Chinese things you have in this room, Doctor. They're very unusual. Things that we're not used to seeing in the shops in America. Yes, I'm rather proud of my collection. Now, uh, that large Chinese gong over there on the wall, for instance... It's over 1,000 years old. Over a thousand? Well, say, let's hear how it sounds. Well, you'll get the true sound, too. You see, most of these temple gongs are cracked. That is, those which are sold. The perfect ones are kept in the temples. But I was lucky enough to get a perfect one. It is lovely, isn't it? Hit it, Speed. I want to hear it. Hmm. Sounds young for its age, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you it was in perfect condition. You see... Hey, Barlow, look out! Oh, hey, you... What happened? This knife. Someone threw it through that moon window. It's a dragon knife. Dr. Kingsley, is Clint all right? I can't tell you yet, Speed. You see, sometimes these dragon knives are poisoned. <laughs>
International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. The smuggling activities of that genius of evil, the octopus, have brought Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, all members of the International Secret Police, to Hong Kong, China, to end the criminal's career once and for all. The boys have been invited to dine with Dr. Kingsley on their first evening in Hong Kong. Clint has planned to ask the doctor what he knows of the neighborhood indicated on the map that Marsha Winfield's brother sent her. Another member of the party rouses his suspicion, however... Mr. Wu, a high-caste Chinese who, in reality, is a member of the Octopus Band. Clint's uncanny intuition holds him silent before the man, and then, while they are all looking at a Chinese gong, a knife flies through the window and Clint, wounded, falls to the floor. We find Speed, Barney, and Mr. Wu anxiously watching as Dr. Kingsley finishes bandaging Clint. There you are, Barlow. How does that feel? Well, as well as any knife wound can feel after a good doctor is taking care of it, Dr. Kingsley. You were lucky. That night was aimed for your heart. And would have found it if you hadn't shoved me aside. Sure would, Clint. It cuts in the arm just about at your heart level. And I can thank you for saving my life, Doctor. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Master Gibson saved the life of the doctor's small daughter. The doctor saved the life of Mr. Barlow. In the eyes of the Chinese, the debt is paid. I'd give anything to know who did that. My servants are searching the ground. Don't think it'll do much good, Doc. That knife throwing axe smacks of the octopus, and you never find anybody who'd done anything when the smoke's cleared away. You were near that window when it happened, Barney. Didn't you see anything? Wouldn't I have yipped if I had? I was admiring the window itself, not looking through it. Ah, yes, the Chinese moon window, large and round, so as to let as much of the moonlight in as possible. A charming legend is written about the moon window. If you'll pardon me, Mr. Wu, I'm more interested in the legend about this dragon knife than in that of the moon window right now. Oh, quite so. The dragon knife was once only the property of royalty. The old empress, Su Tsi, born Lan Kui, had several. Her favorite was made of pure gold studded with pink jade and diamonds. Well, the Boxer Rebellion did away with the old empress and her autocracy. Mm, yes. But the dragon knives live on. They are only used on those of high standing. Oh, you take it as a compliment to be punctured with one of those sabers, huh? In a way, yes. It is an honorable death. Well, I don't see anything honorable about a knife being thrown from the dark. I think the octopus and his gang are nothing but a bunch of cowards. You're right, Speed. And if that knife had been poisoned, as they so often are, that scratch on the arm would have been the end of your uncle. It was almost the end of Miss Marcia. She just about fainted when she saw Clint go down. Yeah, it's too bad she and Jean had to see that. You did the right thing and sent them to Jean's room while you bandaged Clint up, Doc. Ah, it's a bad business. I spoke to Miss Winfield about staying on as Jean's governess, but she said that she had business to attend to elsewhere. I don't like to see her going about China alone, not with this octopus organization at work. Yes, it would be better if she stayed here with Jean for the time being. And what are you going to do, Mr. Barlow? Uh, do? In regard to this octopus? Mr. Wu, uh, I haven't the slightest idea. Hmm. I believe the hour is growing late. I had best be going. May I drive you and your friends to your hotel, Mr. Barlow? Uh, no, thank you. I've already arranged with the rickshaw boy to pick us up here, Mr. Wu. Very well. I shall look forward to our meeting again very soon. Well, um, I'll see you to the door, Mr. Wu. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. What do you think, Clint? I know the octopus isn't wasting any time in trying to get me out of the way. Are you going to cable the chief? No. Not until we talk to our tea merchant tomorrow morning. By the way, why did you tell Wu we had a rickshaw boy calling for us? That's not true, because we didn't know when we'd leave. I told Mr. Wu that because, first, I didn't want him to know at what hotel we were staying. Second... I wanted some time alone with the doctor. And third, we're not going to the hotel tonight. We're going to stay right here. Here? That don't make sense. Yeah, more sense than you can get through your thick head, old pal. 
I've got a hunch that whoever threw that dragon knife is waiting somewhere along the Lang Su Road with some other assassins. Suffering wang doodles. Gee whiz. Exactly. And now, as soon as the doctor returns, I'm going to show him our map and see if he recognizes any of the streets marked. The octopus isn't wasting any time. Neither will we. Yes, master. What is your report? I have just come from the home of Dr. Kingsley. The dragon knife failed. Ah, must I do such work myself? Can I not trust my operators anymore? Has this Clint Barlow cast a spell upon them? It was purely fate, master. Had the doctor not seen the knife and pushed Barlow aside under the floor, your plan would have succeeded. The doctor? Hmm. What of the knife thrower? He and four others are waiting Barlow and the other two in the shadows of Lang Su Road. I asked Barlow if I might drive them to their hotel, but he refused, saying that their car boy was calling later. They will not get past our men. And uh, the Winfield girl? The doctor wanted her to stay on at his home as governess for the child, but she has refused. She said she had business elsewhere. I will not tolerate her interference. I know what men will do, but women, never. She must be removed. Yes, master. But I shall attend to her later. Just now, since you have brought me so much information, Kwan Wu, I shall retaliate. The octopus should tell you some things you do not appear to know. I listen, master. I have information that Clint Barlow, Speed Gibson, and Barney Dunlap are not staying at Fowler House as you thought. No, but they led me to think that they would. May I remind you, Wu, that you are not dealing with ordinary detectives. The International Secret Police do not take kindly to suggestions from strangers. I begin to understand. They are staying at the Golden Lotus. The Golden Lotus? I have sent operators to the hotel to await their coming. But this does not satisfy me. I know Clint Barlow too well to think that he is missing anything that is going on. What do you mean, Master? As you know, that shipment of slaves from Hong Chao... Is coming down the Siang River tomorrow night. I want nothing to interfere with their transfer to the freighter here at Hong Kong. Nothing will, master. They are coming on a flower boat. No one will dream, seeing dancing girls and blossoms above, that slaves are below the deck. Perhaps. But I will make sure that no one will dream anything. Not only will my men go to the Golden Lotus tonight, but await the coming of the secret police. But I am sending some to Dr. Kingsley's home. Just in case Barlow decides to spend the night there. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, gee, I've looked so long at that map that I don't know if it's a map of Hong Kong or New York. Well, I think we've done about all we can on it, Mr. Barlow. The street names that I've listed for you are mostly guesswork, but then, of course, sometimes a guess turns out to be right. Uh, yes, I appreciate your help, Doctor, and I must ask you to keep silent about what we've just discussed. Well, of course. How's your arm? Oh, it aches a bit, but that's only natural. It won't keep you awake, will it, Clint? I should say not. We've had a big day today. Nothing short of the house falling down could wake me up. Uh, don't say that too loud. You might give the octopus ideas. <laughs> well, I, I believe you're as safe here as you would be any place. The octopus couldn't possibly know that you've decided to spend the night here. Well, we're very grateful to you for allowing us to stay, Doctor. Well, on the other hand, it is I who am grateful. Your presence guarantees the safety of my daughter, and Miss Winfield. Oh, oh, well, let's put that map away and get some shut-eye, huh? I'm out on my feet. Me too. You want this map of the city, too, Barney? Yeah, if I can have it, Doc. By all means. I'll uh, show you to your rooms now. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, Doctor, have you any sort of protection around this house? Uh, burglar alarms or something similar? No, I haven't, Barlow. I never felt any need for them. Just me and the servants here. Yeah, but now your daughter is here, too. Yeah, Doc, so long as this octopus guy's around, I wouldn't take any chances. Good heavens, do you think that? Doctor, you're an important man in Hong Kong. You may actually see and speak with the octopus every day. You may be in his way, since you're honest. Has he ever sought to contact you? No. But he may be watching your every move. His eyes are those of his spies. 
If he should ever want you to shut your eyes to something crooked or want you to do something for him, he may force you to bow to his will through your daughter. Well, he wouldn't dare. I'm in the diplomatic service. I have full protection from the government and the added protection of being an American citizen. The octopus recognizes no boundaries, Dr. Kingsley. The world is his chessboard, and those who stand in his way are pawns and kings to be moved as he wishes. Yeah, but his game is a lot rougher than chess. Hey, where are you going, Speed? Just over here to the moon window, Barney. I want to take another look at it. Oh, look at it tomorrow, kid. Let's go to bed now. If I stay up much longer, I'll fall asleep right here. Okay, just a second. Your arm isn't bothering you any, Clint, is it? Oh, no. Feels great, Doctor. <laughs> Clint and me look like we're fresh out of the hospital. Him with his arm bandaged and me with a black eye. If I hadn't had my credential papers in order, they never would have let me land at any of the ports. Said I look like a desperate character. Good <laughs> <laughs> morning. What is it, Speed? There's someone prowling around in the garden. I could just make out three guys, and I think they're more. Someone in the garden? Would they be your servants, Doc? Why, no. They were in the garden searching for Clint's assailant. But uh, they came in some time ago. You didn't let on you'd seen anything, did you, Speed? No. I pretended to be looking at the window itself and not out in the garden. Good boy. Now, Doctor, let us act as we normally would under the circumstances. Keep on laughing and talking. Switch off the lights as if you're about to show us to our rooms. We must pretend that we don't know we're being watched. But why? Who can that be in the garden? The octopus gang. Doctor, your house is surrounded. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. In the previous episode, Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap of the International Secret Police arrived in Hong Kong, China, hot on the trail of their quarry, the octopus. While at dinner that evening with Dr. Kingsley, father of little Jean, Clint had planned to ask his aid in deciphering the map Marsha Winfield's brother sent her just before his mysterious disappearance, the map describing the octopus headquarters. But Clint does not quite trust another guest, Mr. Wu, high in diplomatic circles who, unknown to anyone is a member of the Octopus Gang. Later that night, a knife is hurled through the window, barely missing Clint's heart. Mr. Wu leaves as the doctor is dressing Barlow's wound and lets the octopus know that the knife attack has failed. Accordingly, the criminal sends more assassins to ambush the doctor's home, and as they enter the Kingsley Garden, Speed happens to see them from the window. Clint warns everyone to act normally, and the lights are turned off, as if the doctor were going to show the boys to their rooms for the night. Now, with the lights out, we can safely look out into the garden without the octopus men seeing us. See, Clint? There are two of them over by that willow tree. You can just make them out. Good heavens, Clint. Isn't there some way to ward off this... this ambush? Of course, it, it isn't that I'm afraid. I'm thinking of Jean and Miss Winfield. Yes, yes, I know, Dr. Kingsley. Yeah, if it wasn't for them, we could maybe rush that gang of rats and take them alive and kick them. No, no, no need for such tactics, Barney. Where's your telephone, Doctor? It's by the Chinese gong. Can you see enough to get over there? Yes, I have a good reason to remember that spot. Oh, Speed, you and Barney stay here by the window and let me know what's happening out there. But don't let them see you. Okay, Clint. They won't see a whisker. Hey, uh, what can I do, Clint? Now go upstairs, Doctor, to our rooms and switch on the light, as if you were making us comfortable. Uh, they can't see into the room from the garden, can they? No, not at all. Uh, good. Now, that light will attract their attention from this room, too. 
They'll be less secretive in their movements. Will you go upstairs now while I put in a call for the police? We'll keep watch from this window, Clint. And hurry with that phone call, fella. Uh, don't you think that I should rouse the servants too, Clint? No, no, don't do that. That would just cause more confusion. They'd be of little use against such men as those in the garden. We might be able to hold them off, but with Jean and Marcia in the house, I, I'd rather not take any chances. Well, the police will take care of them, but we'll just keep our guns handy in case some, well, we come to a showdown. Oh, here's the phone. Hmm? Oh, listen, I'll turn on those lights and I'll hurry right back. Hey, two more men just came into the garden, Clint. You okay, Speed? Hello? Uh, get me the Hong Kong police. Yes. Have they come any closer to the house yet, Speed? No. I think they're waiting for everyone to get into the garden. I must have spotted them just as they began to come in. And they're still hiding behind the bushes and trees. Kid, you got eyes like an owl. If you hadn't lamped them guys in the beginning and showed me where to look, I'd never see them. Hello? Hong Kong police? I'll send a detail of men to Dr. Kingsley's residence immediately. Yes. It's 14 Lang Su Road. That's right. And have them come quietly and well armed. Yes, there's several prowlers are out in the garden. You come right away? That's fine. Wonder how far away we are from the police station. It's only about five minutes from here. I saw it on the way coming up. But what gets me is, how did the octopus know we were staying here? Yes, that's just what I'd like to know, too. But right now, we can't do anything but wait for the police and watch. Wait and watch. Watch, we've been watching and waiting for ten minutes, and nothing's happened yet. Except those guys are beginning to close in. Oh, why don't the police arrive? Well, they'll get here all right, Doctor. We'll keep our guns handy just in case. Look, fellas, isn't that something moving over by the wall? Kid, you've got eyes like an owl. I don't see a thing. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. And I think it's the police. The octopus gang don't see him yet. They're watching the house too close. Gee, this is like watching a play, isn't it? Yeah. And it's all right so long as we don't have to take part in it. My George, the police are surrounding them. The only way they can escape is by coming through this house, and we can stop that. By shooting? No. By leaving the lower floor of the house in absolute darkness. They'll be afraid of an ambush when the fireworks start and try to fight their way through the police lines. Hey, it's starting now. They've spotted the police. Too late. They've got him surrounded. Oh, they're starting to run this way. No. No, they're stopping, like you said, Barlow. They're going to try and fight their way out. Hey, everybody. Everybody keep down. Just in case a stray bullet comes up here. Can't we go out and help the police, Clint? No, no, Speed. We have bigger fish to catch. Can't risk injury from the small fry. Yeah, especially you with a knife wound in your arm already. Ain't that enough for one night, Speed? Oh, I didn't mean for Clint to go, Barney. But you and me... Nah, thanks. I have to take plenty of chances, so I'm not going out of my way looking for them. Nothing like sitting in a nice, comfortable house, says I. Oh, look. Look, they've captured the intruders. Every one of them. Daddy, Daddy, what's all the noise about? It's Jean. I'll open the door. Uh, switch on the light, Speed. It's safe now. Okay. Are you all right? Yes, yes, Jean, honey. Everything's all right now. We heard now. shooting. Some friends of the octopus was planning a surprise party for us, Marcia. But we surprised them first by calling the police. Well, thank heaven none of you were hurt. How is your arm, Clint? Well, to tell the truth, I, I forgot all about it in the excitement, Marcia. I'll tell you, I'll not tolerate this. The octopus must be captured. That's exactly what we're here for, Doc. But we got a lot to do before we can capture that guy. Yeah, and first thing to do was to go and talk to the police and the fellas they've captured. Maybe we can learn something from them. Uh, I doubt it, Speed. You know how close Ma they are from past experience. Except in Splinters, huh? He was the only one who was going to talk, and then they stopped him. Uh, we'll see the police anyhow, and as long as they're here, they can escort us to our hotel. Well, we won't prevail on your hospitality any longer, Dr. Kingsley. Why, you're only too welcome, Barlow. Well, I know, but our presence seems to attract unpleasant attention, so... I believe it would be better for your household if we return to our hotel. We want to be out the first thing in the morning anyhow. And we'll tell the chief of police to keep a guard here for the rest of the night, just in case anything else should happen, well, Doc. I'll be very grateful. Will we see you tomorrow, Speed? I don't know, Jean. 
Depends on what Clint wants to do. Mm. Oh, you bet we'll see, Eugene. I'll tell you what. After our business in the morning, uh, how would you and Marcia and your father all like to explore Hong Kong, huh? Going to some of the bazaars? Oh, I'd love it. Can we, Daddy? <laughs> well, I, I don't know why not. It's a date, then. Now, for our midnight callers and then to sweet repose in our hotel. I hope. snooze since we left Alameda. <laughs> well, that's what you get for being in the international secret police, my boy. I'll put on the light. Hey, what's going on in here? A cyclone? Our room's been ransacked. Hmm? Why, yes, it has. The octopus isn't overlooking any bets. Come on, let's see what's missing. Can't be anything really important, because we have the key to the secret police code and Miss Marsh's map copy with us. Haven't spotted anything yet, but they sure messed things up. Look at my shirt. <laughs> well, don't worry, Barty. You know what the Chinese laundries can do to a shirt in America. And we're actually in China now. You're telling me? Looks like they gave them a rough dry. Oh, see, look. Look, here's something on the floor. What is it, Clint? It's a small piece of green stone. Uh, I believe it's jade. Looks like the stone from a ring, don't it? Uh-huh. Say, does this look familiar to you? No. It's carved, isn't it? Yes, it's a good piece of jade, and I've seen it, or something exactly like it before. Where? I don't know, but I'll remember eventually. Well, what then, Clint? Well, then we'll have definite proof that whoever lost this is in the band of the octopus. We know that already. Else he wouldn't have ransacked our room. Yes, but we've talked to this person very recently. Suffering wang doodles. Maybe we've talked to the octopus himself. I doubt that, but to someone very close to him. Someone who is high in society, who is received everywhere. Someone who is more dangerous than all of the thugs and strong-arm men of the gang. I'll feel a lot better when we can talk to our Hong Kong operator and... Easy, easy, Speed. Now, no details. Uh Uh-huh. What's wrong, Clint? These walls may have ears. You know, ever since we came in here, I've been feeling eyes on me. We'd better... You mean whoever came here while we were at the doctor's might still be here? Why not? No, no, Bonnie. They'd have slugged as we came in if they'd stayed. I don't know about that. Look, 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 that closet door's open. Huh? It is. Stand to one side. I got him covered. Come out, whoever you are, before I blow you out. The door's open and more. Come out, I say. If you know what's good for you. <laughs> it's a cat. There, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> A cat. Oh, nice kitty. I'm scared. <laughs> well, I don't wonder. Oh, come out. Come out before I blow you out. Oh, I'm going to bed. You guys think it's so funny? Sit up and laugh all night. But you'll be sorry if that cat turns out to be working for the octopus. <laughs>
of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, his uncle and ace operator of the International Secret Police, and Barney Dunlap, Clint's aide, have come to Hong Kong, China, determined to end the criminal career of the notorious bad man, the Octopus. During the trip over on the China Clipper, the boys became acquainted with Marsha Winfield, who is also looking for the Octopus, since she holds him and his organization directly responsible for the disappearance of her brother two years previously. For a guide... She has a barely legible map that her brother sent her in a last letter indicating the headquarters of the evil band. Clint has made a copy of this. And now, on the morning of their second day in China, we find Speed, Clint, and Barney entering a tiny tea shop combined with a tea room. They seat themselves at one of the tables. Gee, listen to that music. Is that Chinese swing time, Clint? <laughs> I guess so, Steve. How come they have an orchestra playing at 9 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> well, you forget you're living in a modern age, my friend. That music comes from a record. <laughs> and it can go back there for all I care. <laughs> so wait a second. Let's listen to it. <laughs> They got the gong. <laughs> it serves them right. Oh, we can't kick, Barney. American jazz probably sounds just as bad to the Chinese as their music does to us. <laughs> no, Speed. Jazz is very popular over here in the nightclub. Oh, but uh, here comes the owner of the tea house. We better decide what we'll order. <clears throat> well, you want a Chinese breakfast, Speed? Mm, no. Not after the bacon and eggs I had at seven. I'll just have a glass of milk. Wouldn't you know he'd come to a tea house to order milk? <laughs> he couldn't order anything better. And since you're such an authority on tea houses, Barney One Long Hop, <laughs> what are you having? Knowing what these breakfasts are made up of, I'll just have tea. And what do you mean, One Long Hop? Oh, huh? should I have said uh, One Loud Noise? <laughs> <laughs> See, what is this? A tea house, gentlemen. Uh, will you be pleased to order? <laughs> <laughs> well, all your questions are answered, Barney. It's a plot. I'm always the fall guy, even in China. Is anything wrong, gentlemen? <laughs> no, no, just this guy. Let's see now. Uh, one glass of milk and two pots of tea, please. Oh, you might bring some of those rice cakes with the fortunes in them. Oh, yeah. I like those things. Very well. And uh, what kind of tea would you gentlemen prefer? Well, what kind have you got? Many kinds. Uh, perhaps you would like to choose for yourself. Hey, that would be interesting. Uh, wouldn't you like to see the storeroom, Speed? You bet. I want to see everything I can while I'm in China. If you will be pleased to follow me, then. My, certainly. You do a pretty good business for so early in the morning, my friend. Why, yes. I do good business all morning. Most of my countrymen have breakfast at uh, 11 o'clock, but uh, many tourists come early, like you. Kind of dark back here, isn't it? Well, it's not much farther to the tea storeroom, young gentleman. One good thing about this, we're getting out of hearing distance of that music. Well, here we are now. Uh, will you be pleased to go through this door? Mmm, sure smells good in here. Mmm, that's the fragrance of the tea leaves, Speed. Hey, look. This case is marked chrysanthemum tea. They drink flowers over here. Well, now this is better. Well, it's good to be able to talk to you in person, Ying. Why, yes, I was sorry I could not meet you when you arrived on the clipper yesterday. I was out on urgent business. Who is the boy? Oh, it's my nephew, Speed Gibson. And just before we left, Chief Riley swore him into the International Secret Police. Speed, this is your fellow operator, Li Ying, our Hong Kong representative. Very happy to meet you, my young friend. And it's uh, good to see you again, Barney. Last time we met was in San Francisco, one of your New Year's celebrations. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we're not over here for any celebrating now, Li Ying. No. Uh, how did you hurt your arm, Clint? <laughs> the calling card from the octopus, Ying. A dragon knife was thrown at my heart. It got me in the arm. Oh, a dragon knife. Uh, very fortunate it missed. 
I'll say. The blade looked a foot long. Uh, just a flesh wound, though. Dr. Kingsley fixed me up right away. Dr. Kingsley. Oh, yes, we can count him on our side. Mm, I was sure of that, but I'm glad you're verifying it. While we were there last night, somebody ransacked our room at the Golden Lotus Hotel. Oh. The octopus is most anxious to get you all out of the way. He would give a great deal to find the key to your code, too. Of course, you'll realize that every message you send is carefully read by him. The once to Mademoiselle Fifi at the hat box, too? He knows that Fifi is Chief Riley, just as he knew you to be the secret police in spite of your disguises. But he cannot decipher your code, uh, our code. That is the one thing we can keep from him. Uh, what have your men found out since the last information you sent Chief Riley, Ying? Very little. He has been particularly careful since he learned that you, Clint, had been sent out after him. You are the one man in all the world he fears. I hope to make that fear a reality. I'm out to get him. It's the last thing I do. Oh, yes, but you will have to walk carefully. The octopus is very powerful here in China. In all of China. Even as far as Tibet and Mongolia. Tibet? Wasn't that where that oil company that Marsh's brother was engineering for was going to operate, Clint? Uh, yes. Uh, have you ever heard the name uh, Winfield, Ying? Winfield? No. No, no, but uh, you say he was an engineer with an oil company that was going to operate in Tibet? Yeah. He was in charge of the surveying or something like that. I remember such a company. They uh, started operations about three years ago. Yeah, what became of them? They failed. I do not know why, for they had plenty of capital to start with and were going to uh, go ahead fast, it seemed, when suddenly they shut their doors. And the octopus is powerful in Tibet? Oh, very. I think I smell a rat. Very much of a rat. Evidently, the octopus is not confining himself to smuggling alone, but dabbles in oil development as well. I bet he kidnapped Miss Marsh's brother and is making him work for him on that oil stuff. Very probably. But what's the business at hand, Ying? Uh, we'd better not stay in here. Your customers will wonder why. And if an octopus spies among them, he'll suspect something. They're not wise that you're a member of the secret police, Ying? Oh, by the honor of my ancestors, no. They think me a very simple tea merchant. That is why I know they are smuggling slaves tonight in a flower boat down the Siang River. What's that? The Siang River? Yes, I heard two of the band speaking of it over their tea. The boat is due at nine. If you will dine here tonight, I will supply you Chinese clothes so that you can mingle with the crowd at the dock unnoticed. Yes, and I can put a Chinese makeup on myself, Speed and Barney, to make doubly sure. Be here at seven. The others will also have gathered here at that time. How many men are going tonight, Yang? Ten, besides ourselves. Yes, uh, ten good men. That will be enough. Any police? I believe it's best that the Hong Kong police know nothing of this until we turn our prisoners in at the station. By secrecy, we might be led to the octopus himself. You're right, Ying. We'll be here at seven, ready to go. And uh, now let's go back out in the front of the store. Oh, wait a minute, Clint. What brand of tea did you choose? Uh, what's that? Well, that's why you were supposed to come here in the first place, wasn't it? To choose your tea? <laughs> Oh, the kids got you, Clint. <laughs> well, that's a nice word, Speed. You've got a good memory for small but important detail. Oh, just pick up a package of that uh, oolong, and then we'll be safe. Okay. I've got it. Hmm. The music stopped. Must be changing the record. Well, I uh, hope that this oolong lives up to its reputation. It will, gentlemen. Oolong is one of the best teas I have. And don't forget my milk, will you? No, young gentleman. If you will go over to your table now and make yourselves comfortable, I will prepare the tea. If you want to make us real happy, don't play any more of that music. Oh, now listen, after all, Mug, we're not the only people in this tea house. Maybe some of the other customers would like to hear that melody. Yeah, sure. Some more have come in since we went to pick out your tea, Clint. Well, here's our table. Looks like we got our fortune cakes already. Three little rice cakes. Oh, swell. Now sit down. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's open the rice cakes, huh? <laughs> All right. Help pass the time while we're waiting for our order. <laughs> hey, listen to mine. You will have success as you desire. That's all right, kid. Let's see what my fortune is. <laughs> this is a hot one. Find a good partner and you will succeed. 
That lets you out, Clint, old boy, old boy. Oh, oh yeah? Well, if that's the way you feel about me, tell that rice cake to pay the check. Hey, I haven't said a word. <laughs> What's your fortune? <laughs> well, let's see now. Hold on. There's something up. What, Clint? This isn't a regular rice cake fortune. Listen to what it says. Telephone Dr. Kingsley's house and learn what has happened to your friend, Marsha Winfield. The octopus. Somebody slipped a phony rice cake in with these other two. Somebody right here in this tea house. That's why they were waiting on our table. They must have followed us here. Quick, where's the phone? Right here. If they pulled any rough stuff with that girl, I'll... Take it easy, fella. Oh, hello. Hello, operator. Get me uh, Dr. Kingsley's home. It's 14 Lang Sue Road. Right away. Uh, yes, just I'll wait. Is there any sort of a name on that note, Clint? Sign in it, I mean? No, there's another thing. Uh, oh, hello. Hello. Let me speak, speak to the doctor, please. Oh, is this you, doctor? Clint Marlowe speaking. Uh, what's that? She has. We'll be right over. Yes, goodbye, sir. What's up? Marsha's disappeared. Kidnapped? Yeah, it looks that way. They discovered her absence when she didn't come down for breakfast. They've been trying to reach us at the hotel. Come on, boys. We've got to find that girl. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap of the International Secret Police have come to Hong Kong, China to capture the world criminal, the octopus. Aiding them is Dr. Kingsley, noted physician, who is high in diplomatic circles as well, and who is grateful to the boys for saving his little daughter's life in Honolulu. The boys go to the tea house of Li Ying, Hong Kong representative of the secret police. He tells them that a boatload of slaves is expected down the Siang River that night and they arrange to meet at his tea house in Chinese disguise in an effort to arrest the criminals. Then Clint receives a warning in a rice cake that Marsha Winfield, Jean's governess, has disappeared and learns that this is true by phoning the doctor's residence. We find the boys there now questioning their friend. And uh, you say you heard nothing at all last night, Doctor? No. After the police had gone, taking those octopus men with them, you boys had gone to your hotel, we all retired, careful to see that everything was well locked. I fell into a heavy sleep. No wonder, after all the excitement we had, I pounded my ear, too. And the first inkling you had of Marsha's disappearance was this morning, then, when she failed to come down for breakfast? That's correct. I'm sorry I can't tell you more, Clint. Ah, uh, yeah, Jean, don't cry like that. Your tears aren't helping anything. I know, Daddy, but I miss Marcia so. I'm so afraid that the octopus might hurt her. I don't think he will, Jean. He's just trying to frighten her. And us, trying to call us off his track. Now, Jean, do you think you could answer some questions? Now, well, maybe you can help us since you were the last one to see Marcia. I'll try, Clint. Oh, well, that's a brave girl. Now, now think back carefully. Did Marcia appear worried over anything when she said goodnight last night? No. In fact, she wasn't as worried as she used to be because of the way you got rid of those octopus men in the garden. She laughed when she kissed me and tucked me in like she always does. 
She laughed and said we didn't have anything to worry about anymore because you and Speed and Barney were going to take care of us. We will too, Jean. We're going to get Marsha back right away. Are you, Barney? You bet we are. Now tell us, Miss Marsha slept in the room next to yours? Yes. And she left the door open between our rooms. Do you know if Miss Marsha went right to bed after she said goodnight to you? Yes, she did. I couldn't see her bed from mine, but I stayed awake until she turned her light off and called goodnight to me again. I was too excited to go right to sleep. When did you go to sleep? Right after that, I guess, because that's the last thing I remember. Her calling good night and me answering. And we're pretty sure that Miss Marsha didn't go out of the house, aren't we, Clint? Yes, unless she'd waited until Jean was sound asleep before going out. But why should the girl go out in Hong Kong so late, Clint? Well, Marsha once had the idea that she would seek the octopus alone, Doctor. Didn't want to add her troubles to ours, she said. But I thought we'd changed her mind about that. We did, Clint. Anyhow, if Miss Marsha's gone out of her room because she wanted to, why did we find the mark of the octopus? Yes, you're right, Steve. Undoubtedly, the octopus is behind her disappearance. <laughs> Well, shouldn't we report this to the police immediately, Clint? I held off until talking to you, but now it seems to me the proper thing would be to notify the police immediately. The longer we hold off, the less chance we have of finding trace of them. Well, the police can do no more than we've already done, Doctor. And they know even less of our common enemy. We've searched Marsh's room, the ground beneath her window, everything that might contain some clue, but with no results. She vanished without a trace. And now... I must ask you to give me the rest of the day and tonight to look for her before notifying the police. You mean you have some idea of where they may have taken her? Just a hunch, Doctor. May we have your promise of silence? Well, yes. You three are the only ones I can trust now. And you won't tell, will you, Jean? No, if you'll only find Marcia. Don't you worry. We'll find her. Maybe not right away. But I think we'll get a darn good start on her trail tonight. Sit here, Miss Winville. Why have you brought me here? How did I get here? I remember nothing. For a very good reason. A member of our band was secreted in your bedroom at the good doctor's home. The police did not get all of us. Your band? You mean the octopus band? Yes. Our operator had a bottle of chloroform and a handkerchief. After you had fallen asleep, it was very simple to render you completely unconscious and spirit you away. The rest of the house, thinking all danger was past, was fast asleep. Are you the octopus? I am flattered, but alas, I am not the octopus. You will hear him shortly, however. But why has he done this to me? Haven't I suffered enough at his hands? And how can you... You, whom Dr. Kingsley think is one of his good friends. How can you belong to the band of such a criminal? I am not here to answer questions, Miss Winfield. Merely to follow the master's orders as to what is to be done with you. Done with me? What do you mean? Why, the master is about to speak. Well, if he wants to speak, why don't he meet me face to face? Welcome, Miss Winfield. Are you... The octopus? Yes, that is the name I am known by. But you're better known by your crimes and terrible deeds. Better be careful of your words, Miss Winfield. Allow her to speak as she wishes, Kwan Wu. She amuses me. Oh, I don't care if I amuse you. I don't care what you do with me. Only tell me, where is my brother? What have you done with him? Your brother? Yes, Lawrence Winfield. He was an engineer with an oil company that started operations here three years ago. They were going to begin surveys in Tibet. I remember him well. Oh, where is he? Please tell me. Is he safe? Is he well? Can I see him? Do you understand now, Kwan Wu, why I wanted to be rid of this girl as soon as possible? She can ask more questions in five minutes than any man could in an hour. I understand, Master. <laughs> oh, have you no heart? You are an enemy, Miss Winfield. You have a map which might lead you and your friends, the secret police my headquarters. I only wanted to know what happened to Larry. You shall learn what happened to your brother. Kwan Wu. Yes, master. The slave boat tonight down the Tiang River. 
Yes. To anyone who might see it, it shall appear a flower boat with music and dancing girls to amuse the beholder. But hidden away beneath the deck, this flower boat carries many slaves. That is true, master. The slaves are to be rendered unconscious, placed in sacks, and put aboard another boat as cargo. While the flower boat takes another load of opium to go up the Tsiang River into the interior of China. Oh. A cargo of opium and one slave, Kwan Mu. One master? Yes. Marsha Winfield. Oh, no. Oh, no, not that. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> Well, I got everything here that's necessary for the Chinese makeup now. Gee, it don't look like much, Clint. Yellow grease paint, some tape to slant our eyes with, liquid body makeup, and a knife pencil, which we can use to draw lines in our faces if we want, as well as use on our eyes. Don't forget these wigs, Speed. Kind of greasy looking, ain't they? Well, after all, we're supposed to be Chinese coolies, Barney. I guess them clothes that Lee Yang will have for us will be dirty too, huh? Mm, probably. So what have you got against dirt all of a sudden? Well, nothing if it's good old American dirt. But I can't go for Chinese dirt so much. Uh, you'll go for it and like it. I only hope that Ying may have heard some whisper about Marsha by the time he reaches tea house. He hadn't up to four o'clock this afternoon. You think we'll hear anything at the dock tonight, Clint? Well, all we can do is hope. It's our only chance of getting to her. If we can get near enough to flower boats when it docks, maybe we can hear something about it. Get some clues to where they're going to take her. Where do you think she is now, Clint? With the octopus. There's no doubt about it. What makes you so sure? In my experience with him, I've only been able to discover one weakness in the man, Barney. His egotism. He'll want to parade his power before Marsha, helpless as she is. If I could lay hands on that devil fish, I'd tear him apart. Our only chance to lay hands on him, Barney, is to play his own game. To be as cold and calculating as the octopus. To match our wits against his. And to try and be three jumps ahead of them all the time. Don't you think we'd better get started for Ying's tea house, Clint? Getting near seven o'clock, the time he told us to be there. Uh, yes, we now. Just give me time to distribute this makeup between us. So we can carry it in our coat pockets without appearing to be carrying anything. Here, now, you take the grease paint speed. I'll take the body makeup. And Barney, uh, you tuck the eye tape and pencil away in your pockets. Well, what about them wigs? They're the babies that are going to take up rum. No, no, we'll each carry one. Stick it under your coat in your belt band. Our coats are loose enough if we leave them unbuttoned so there'll be no bulge. Well, that's a swell idea, Clint. Nobody will ever guess we're carrying wigs. Not unless we get in a high wind. Well, ready to go? Uh, no, wait a minute. Got your gun, Barney? Sure. I wish you'd let me carry one, Clint. No, no, no. Guns get people into trouble, Sweet. I only carry one for emergencies. Emergencies that I'm going to keep you out of if I can. Well, everything's ready now. Let's go to Yin's. Hold everything. Maybe that's Dr. Kingsley. No, wait a minute. He's waiting at his house for some word. Who's there? Whoever it is won't talk. Open the door, Barney. I'll cover it. Speed, you go over there out of range. Yes, sir. Are you ready? Yes. Then here goes. No one here. No one in sight in the hall, either. But look, there's a note pinned on the door. Hmm? Hey, quick, let's have it. Here you are. I might have known he'd pull this. Pull what? What does it say, Clint? If you want the safety of the Winfield girl guaranteed... Admit I've beaten you, Barlow. Continue in your pursuit, and you will be directly responsible for her fate. The octopus.
Speed Gibson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap of the International Secret Police have come to Hong Kong, China to capture the octopus, a criminal leader who, along with other evil deeds, has been responsible for the mysterious disappearance of Marsha Winfield's brother. However, the girl has a barely legible map her brother sent her, indicating the octopus headquarters. Clint has made a copy of this and has sought Dr. Kingsley's aid in deciphering it. Then they learn that Marsha Winfield has been kidnapped by the octopus gang, and Clint receives word from the octopus that if they continue pursuing him, they will never see Marsha again. We find the boys in a back room of Lee Ying's tea house. Marsha Winfield vanished without leaving any clues, Ying. We have absolutely nothing to go on, save that we know she's in the clutches of the octopus. But by going to the dock tonight to meet that smuggling boat of his, we thought maybe we could hear something, Lee Ying. Why, yes, Speed, we might. It is hard to tell, though. And that last note you had from the octopus said that her safety was in your hands, Clint. Yes, but it puts me in a terrible spot. For the octopus is devil enough to do away with Marsha. On the other hand, if I call the whole thing off, admitted defeat and return to America, we'd still have no guarantee of Marsha's safety. She probably knows too much about him by this time. He'd find a way to silence her no matter what we do. That's why we want to get to the dock as quick as possible, Ying. Got our disguises already? The coolie clothes? Why, yes, they are hanging in the corner there, Barney. And let me get this oily wig out of my belt. Uh, you might as well get into your costume, too, Barney, while I lay out the makeup on this table. And give me what you're carrying there. And you, too, Speed. Sure. Here's the grease paint, Clint. And here's the eye pencil and tape. Yeah, might as well get rid of this bottle of liquid body makeup, too. Oh, you got an old towel or something, Ying? Why, yes, uh, right here, Clint. Oh, good, thank you. Now, sit down, Speed. I'll start on you first. Okay, Clint. This is a privilege for me to watch the master hand at work, you know. You mean watching Clint make me up? You bet, Ying. I'm studying hard so I can get good at it, too. Hey, help! I'm stuck! Well, allow me to help you, Barney. You need not have pulled the blouse on over your head. See, it has frogs down the throat. To frogs! It with. Let me out of here! Oh, oh, be your age, Barney. They use frogs in place of buttons in China. You know that as well as I do. I didn't know it until now. I thought Ying meant live frogs. Oh, a hold still a minute now, Speed. I'm going to tape your eyes up at the corners. Okay. Suffer and wang doodles. What a difference slanting eyes make on the kid. Speed, you look like you and all your ancestors was born in China. Do I, Barney? Yeah. This tape don't feel so good. Oh, have I taped them up too much, Speed? No. It'll be all right after I get used to it. Sure. Once you're down at the dock, you'll forget all about your makeup. You'll be so excited. Gee, I'd do anything to find Miss Marshall. Now, listen, don't talk for a while, Speed, while I apply this grease paint. <laughs> and then I'll give you a few lines, Ying. And a mandarin mustache. That'll protect you. Where are the other ten guys that are going to the Siang dock with us, Yang? Waiting in the tea storeroom. They have their instructions. They are to make no move till we do. Ah, that's good. I'll have all of us made up and in costume in no time. And then at nine, we'll go to the Siang dock. Gosh, I wonder if the octopus will be there. has sent for you to give you last-minute instructions before going to the Siang Dock. I trust that I do not need to remind you to listen attentively. Quiet while we await his orders. Is everyone here, Kwan Wu? Yes, Master. Tonight, the transfer of the slaves from the flower boat to the other boat should be much the same as in the past. However, tonight I want each and every one of you to take extra precautions. You already know that the ace operator of the International Secret Police is in Hong Kong on our trail. 
Should he succeed in tracking us down, I will not be the one to suffer. I have escaped him before and will again. But you men, you will remain to take the punishment accorded you by the law. I believe they understand that, Master. Good. We have taken every possible precaution for our smuggling operations. The young dock is away from the main steamer docks. It is badly lighted. I don't think we will have any trouble. But in case we are interrupted, I do not want you to disappear as you have done in the past. Tonight, I have a very special cargo to go aboard the flower boat after the slaves have been transferred. This cargo, and I don't mean our usual load of opium, is a slave. A very important slave, whom I am shipping up the Tiang to Hong Chao. No matter what else happens, the flower boat with this slave aboard must get away on her return voyage. Quan Wu will be there to see that you do not fail. Any questions? Very well. Leave the council room then, and wait outside for Quan Wu. I would speak with him alone. Master? Yes? Am I really to go to the Tiang Dock with the others tonight? The risk is great. Supposing someone should see me, recognize me as Quan Wu, the man who has received everywhere diplomatic circles, army and navy circles. Can we risk anyone recognizing me to be in reality a member of your band? Ordinarily, no. But tonight, yes. Marsha Winfield is a danger, Quan Wu. Nothing must prevent her journey up to Tiang to Hang Chau tonight. And above all, no one must see her go aboard. Have you arranged for the box that she is to be carried in? Yes, Master. And she is drugged, utterly helpless. But... Why do you hesitate? I have lost the jade setting from my ring. It is a bad omen. I fear we shall have trouble tonight. Superstition. You pin your faith in a bit of green stone... You're a fool, Quan Wu. Put your faith in yourself, as I do. You may fail everyone else, but not yourself. I am not as wise as you, Master. I fear these secret police. Fear them? Speed, Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap? <laughs> there is only one person in the whole world you need fear, Quan Wu. Me, the octopus. So, see that you do not fail to do my bidding tonight. <laughs> This is the Seong Dog. This fog makes everything creepy. Yes, Speed, creepy. But as you see, it is not half as crowded as the other docks. It's dark and bad looking to me. Sure looks like a smuggler's dock, all right. Yeah, with these guys sitting around here on either side of us. Are they asleep or are they looking us over? Can't tell in this light. These are fishermen, Barney. They are probably asleep. The flower boat will dock up ahead there, near the end of the pier. Uh, don't see any signs of life yet. No, but there will be more confusion when the flower boat docks. Passengers for the return trip who wish to enjoy the sing-song girls and the dancing and music. Sort of a floating nightclub, huh? Something like that. Be careful, careful. Here comes some Chinese. They didn't notice us at all. Which shows us that uh, our disguises are perfect. Uh, they would notice a member of the fight race immediately. Your makeup fools even me, Clint, and I saw you put it on. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ying. Hey, look, the wood in that big box out this way. I wonder what's in it. Very probably return cargo for the flower boat. If they're bringing that out, then the boat will dock soon. Yes, I think I see it over there. See those different colored lights on that moving boat? Oh, yeah. Be careful. Careful until the box passes. Look, here comes a rickshaw. Say, what is this? All of a sudden, the traffic on Siang Dock is thicker than New York City. Watch it now. Hmm? What's wrong, Speed? The man in that rickshaw. It was Mr. Wu. Mr. Wu? Quan Wu? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. I'll be darned. I wonder what he's doing down here. Perhaps he is going aboard the flower boat for an evening of relaxation. And maybe. Then again, maybe not. What do you know about him, Ying? Quan Wu has a very good reputation in Hong Kong, Clint. Everyone likes and trusts him. He's a very close friend of Dr. Kingsley. Mm, you've never heard anything against him? Not a whisper. Why? Mm, it's a hunch of mine. 
I haven't trusted him from the first moment I saw him with the doctor at the China Clipper landing. Uh Uh-oh, look, here comes that flower boat. Yes, it will not take long for it to dock now. You know, Clint, I think that big box belongs to Quan Wu. He was watching it real careful. And remember, his rickshaw was right behind it. Look up ahead now. That rickshaw is parked right beside the box. It might be a coincidence. Mustn't let our imaginations run away with the speed. We're apt to overlook concrete evidence that way. Yeah, but I'm still going to keep my eye on that box. I'm going to try and get near to it and maybe see what's in it. No, no. Now you stay away from that box, Speed. I want you to leave this to Barney, Ying, and the rest of us tonight. Are your uh, ten men planted around this dock, Ying? Why, yes, we are passing one right now. Him? I thought he was another sleeping beauty fisherman. Now, don't forget, Barney. As soon as the fighting starts, our men try to surround the crew of the flower boat. Now, don't mistake them for the octopus gang and start knocking them down. I resent that. Ain't I always done the right thing in the past? Yeah, not always. Let's say that flower boat's closer than I thought. It fools you in the fog. Well, come on. We better get up there. Now, stay close to me, Speed. Okay, Clint. Observe these men around the gangplank. They are the octopus men. I am sure of it. What are they going to do with the slaves now that they got them here? They'll probably transfer them to another boat. Perhaps the one on the other side of the dock. They'll have a sweet time doing that without anybody seeing them. Oh, Speed. What? Why, he's gone. Where is he? He has gone over to that large box in spite of me telling him to stay away. And look, Quan Wu's eyeing him. Hey, quick, let's work our way over there before the kid does something foolish. Be careful, we'll be right in the octopus hotbed. Look, Steve is trying to look into the box between the cracks. Quan Wu's getting out of the rickshaw. Hurry. Oh, he's pushing him into the sea. Right, right under the power of the flower boat. the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, members of the International Secret Police, are in Hong Kong, China, on the trail of the octopus, leader of an enormous and dangerous criminal organization. Marsha Winfield, whose brother Lawrence was involved with the octopus and mysteriously disappeared three years previously, is kidnapped by the criminal so that she will be unable to give the boys any more aid as to his whereabouts. The octopus plans to smuggle her aboard a flower boat, which is bringing a load of slaves down the Siang River on this very night, and send her to Hang Chau. Meanwhile, Speed, Clint, and Barney, together with Lee Ying, Hong Kong operator of the secret police, and ten deputies, come to the Siang River dock to arrest the smugglers and try to gain some clue as to Marsh's whereabouts. The boys are in Chinese disguise, and when they recognize Quan Wu in the crowd near a large box, come close to see why he is on the pier. Speed, peering closely at the box, is pushed into the water by Quan Wu, right under the prow of the flower boat. Quan Wu pushed the kid. Let me at him. No, no, wait, Barney. We've got to get speed first. There's a ladder down to the water. Now, quick, get down to her. I will take care of Quan Wu, Clint, and keep watch up here. All right, then I'll go down with Barney, then. Come on, Barney. Down you go. 
And don't forget your Chinese disguise. Why you push boy into water, huh? You may not meddle with gentlemen's belongings. You go about for business, or you do and go into... The dirty rat. Come on, come on, hurry up. Or I'll step on your hand. Can you see speed? Not yet. But there's a float down here under the pier. Maybe he's hanging under that. Oh, I hope so. If only that paddle wheel of the flower boat didn't drag him under. That stopped now. He would have had a chance to come up. Here we are. And there's speed. He's floating in the water under the pier. He's out cold, Clint. Must have hit his head on this float when he fell. Oh, if anything's happened to him. Oh, here. Hold my jacket while I, I lean out to get him. Okay, lean away. I've got you. All right. A little further than Bonnie. How's that? Can you reach him? Yeah. Yeah, I got him. Now, pull me back. There you are. Here, let me help you with it. He hit his head on the float, all right. Look at that bump over his eye. Yeah, keep quiet until I feel his pulse. Is he all right, Clint? I think so. But he got plenty of water. Here, help me give him artificial respiration. I'll turn him over on his stomach. Okay, you grab one arm. I'll take the other. He's coming around now. Good. Now, listen, Bonnie. There's a runway back to shore under this pier. You see it? Yeah. Take speed out of this whole mess and keep him out. I'm going back up the ladder to Ying and his men. Hey, what about me? You stay with speed. No, wait a minute. I... Orders, Bonnie. Orders. Oh, well. Might as well make the best of it, I guess. Come on, kid. You're kind of big to carry, but I guess I can make it. <clears throat> hey, I'm the one that should be groaning. I just hope I can get over that narrow runway to shore without falling in. Oh. Oh. This is worse than tightrope walking. I wonder why they have this float and runway under the pier anyhow. It must be for rowboats and stuff. Or do these sampans and junks use it? It's fit for junk, all right. Oh. Yeah, it's all right, kid. Old Barney's taking care of you. Barney? Yeah. In spite of these slant eyes and Chinese clothes, it's your old pal, Barney. What happened? I'm cold. Where are we? You're cold because you're wet, and you're wet because Quan Wu pushed you off the Siang Dark. Quan Wu. Now I remember. Hey, take it easy. You almost threw us both overboard. But I got to tell you, Barney. Let me down. Listen, Speed. If I let you down, I'll go down, too. I'm paralyzed. I can't let go until we reach shore. Take it easy. We're almost there. We've got to go back to the flower boat. You expect me to carry you back? Oh, no. Where's Clint? With Li Ying. The flower boat's docked. They're waiting to spring the arrest now. We've got to go back. You know that box I was looking at? I'll say I know it. That box is the reason Quan Wu pushed you into the water. Thought you was getting too nosy for a coolie. The reason he got so sore, I bet, was because Miss Marsh is in that box. Yeah, but... Huh? Yeah. I saw her through a little hole in the box that must have been there for air, I guess. And I was just going to yell for you and Clint when he pushed me into the water. I don't remember anything after that. Suffering wang doodles. We got to get back to Clint and tell him. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Somebody's on that float we just left. It's kind of hard to make out who or what in this fog. Looks to me like they've opened a door in the hold of that flower boat. Yeah. I can see now with that light there. They're transferring their cargo to that other boat on the other side of the pier. But why under the pier, Barney? I don't know, unless it's something they don't want anybody to see. Slaves. That's what they're transferring, slaves. How in the heck do we get from under this pier? I want to get on top of it. This runway goes right into the seawall, Barney. Yeah. Can't get up this way unless we shinny up the dock posts. And that's impossible. Or else go back the way we came. Can't gamble on getting by them guys. Don't forget, kid, they're working for the octopus. And how we get word to Clint about Marsha being in that box and the smuggling going on underneath the pier? I know. And let... I've got it. There's just enough space right above us here for a guy to get through, Speed. I'll give you a boost. You stand on my shoulders and crawl through, then give me a hand. Do you think you can do that? Are you strong enough now? Listen, Barney, I'll do anything to save Miss Marsha and stop that smuggling. Give me a boost now. I hope that we can make it. So do I, kid. They're unloading that boat fast. Want to pull away quick, I guess. But we'll do our best to get there in time. He's speed all right, Clint. Uh, yes, we him. Nasty bump on his forehead and half drowned, but I left him in Barney's care. Is everyone set? Why, yes. My men have every octopus man on the dock under surveillance. The first wrong move and the arrest will be made. Good. I hope we'll get the bigger fish. Oh, that reminds me. 
I wonder what Quan Wu is doing here and why he pushed Speed off the pier. Remember, to all appearances, Speed is a coolie, a Chinese working man. Perhaps one crew thought he would try to steal something. Or has Wu something in that box that he wishes no one to see? How do you know that the box is his property? Purely circumstantial evidence thus far. Right. But sometimes circumstantial evidence supplies the only means of catching the cleverest criminals even. Look, cargo is going aboard. Yes. Boxes. And that big box is going aboard with them. Evidently, that wasn't Wu's property after all. See? He takes no interest in it, but he's watching the merrymaking on the decks. But what about the slave cargo? They haven't taken them off yet. No, I have had no signal from my men. Look, did you see that? One of the sing-song girls on the flower boat has thrown Quan Wu a lotus blossom. Here. He's motioned to his rickshaw boy to pick it up. Boy, give me the lotus. Here, sir. Are we now to go? Not quite yet. This lotus signifies that all the slaves have left the flower boat. But our cargo of opium is not all on board yet. So the most important cargo, <laughs> the girl, is aboard. I have fear. This is dangerous business. You knew that when you entered the octopus band. Too late to leave it now. I do not want to leave band. But cannot we leave Siang Dak? Last box of opium just going aboard flower boat? Yes. Now we can go. Our departure will be the signal for the captain of the flower boat to depart also. Let us go. Yes, sir. Look, Clint. Wu is leaving. Yes, so I see. There's something in the air, Ying. We've missed something. The signal, Clint. The slaves are being transferred. What? Where? That man stationed by the other boat gave the signal. Uh, let us go over there, huh? Well, the flower boat is getting ready to pull away from the dock. Hurry, over here. Look down there, Clint. Cargo being taken into hold from under pier. Sacks of human beings. That's how we missed them. They were working beneath us. Oh, it's too late to catch the big fish now. We'll take the smaller fry. <whistles> Stop that slave cargo, men! Don't let any of us... That cargo transfer. Yeah. It's tough to get through this crowd watching a fight. We had a hard enough time getting up on the dock. Now it's going to be even worse getting out to where the excitement is. Hey, look, Barney. The flower boat pulling out. Quick, we got to get through this mob. Marsh is aboard that boat, sure as shooting. And once out on the Siang River, it's going to be tough to find her. All them flower boats look alike. Fight, kid. Fight. I'm doing my best, Barney. <laughs> Right. Well, There's Clint now. The race over. They've captured all the smugglers. All the smugglers on this dock. But what about the gang on the flower boat? Yeah. Clint! Hey, Clint! Save your breath until we get closer to him, Speed. He can't hear you with all this yelling going on. Bush is on the flower boat, all right, Barney. The big box he's in is gone. Bring all the slaves up on deck, King. Bring the captain and the crew of the boat here, too. Maybe they knew what cargo they were getting, and maybe not. And I'll have to hold them until I find out. Clint! Hey, Clint! What's that? Oh, my Speed! What are you doing out here in this dock? I gave Barney strict orders to take you back to shore out of danger. I did, Clint, but when the kid came to, he told me something that you've got to know. Yeah, Miss Marsh is on that flower boat that just pulled away, Clint. What? Yeah, she was in that big box I was looking at when Quan Wu pushed me off the pier. In that box? I saw the coolies put that aboard, too. Oh, if I'd only known. The whole raid was messed up by them transferring cargo under the pier, Clint. That's what threw us off. We saw him doing it while we were still under the runway. But by the time we got up here, the boat had pulled out. Oh, I know. The way things were going, I knew I had to lose one cargo. Either the slaves or the one aboard the flower boat. And I figured that more octopus gangsters were involved in the transfer of the slave cargo. Oh, if I'd only known that Marsha was in that box. You would have known if I hadn't hit my head on the float. What do we do now, Clint? Deliver our prisoners to the police station. Cable Chief Riley what's happened, and then tell Dr. Kingsley about Marsha. I think that bullet plane is going to help us now, Barney. What do you mean, Clint? You and I are going to fly up the Siang River at dawn tomorrow. We've got to get Marsha off that flower boat.
Gibson of the International Secret Police. Clint and Barney, members of the International Secret Police, are in Hong Kong, China, on the trail of the criminal leader, the Octopus. Aiding them are Dr. Kingsley, father of little Jean, and Marsha Winfield, who blames the Octopus for the mysterious disappearance of her brother. Marsha herself is kidnapped by the Octopus gang, and the boys, seeking her whereabouts, raid the smuggling operations of the Octopus on the Siang Dock. They succeed in arresting many of the gang, but fail to prevent Marsha from being carried aboard the flower boat in a large box. The boat starts its return trip up the river, and Clint, after cabling the latest developments of the case to Chief Riley and turning his prisoners over to the Hong Kong police, goes to Dr. Kingsley's home with Speed and Barney. And so you see, Doctor, if Quan Wu hadn't pushed Speed off the pier when he was looking at the box, Speed could have told us that it held Marsha. Yeah, if I'd just fallen into the water, it would have been all right. But I had to hit my head on the float and knock myself out. So by the time I came to and we could get back to the pier... Miss Marsh had been taken aboard the flower boat. Well, this is terrible, boys. How can we save her? Well, I notified the Hong Kong police when I took in our prisoners a while ago. They're placing a dragnet up and down the river, keeping on the lookout for just such a flower boat. Yeah, Clint, but I don't know how that's going to help. Them flower boats all look alike to me. See one and you've seen all of them. Do you think they'll hurt Marsha, Barney? Hurt her? Shucks, no, Jane. And you mustn't worry about her. We'll find her. Just you wait and see. I can't help worrying. That octopus is so terrible. I wish I could get to that octopus guy. Well, you may have a chance, Barney. But first, we've got to find Marsha. Oh, uh, I talked to Lee about leaving at dawn, but he advised waiting a few hours. He said that the mist hung over the river until mid-morning. So it'd do no good to go looking for the boat before that. Are you going to fly, Clint? Yes, Jean, in the bullet monoplane that we commandeered from the octopus. Is it in condition? Oh, yeah. I've been keeping an eye on it ever since we landed. We're just going to start ripping out one of them gas tanks so as we could put another seat in. Glad we didn't start the work now until this flight is over. Well, can I go with you, Barney? Maybe Clint ought to stay here in Hong Kong. No, 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 no. Don't start that speed. You're the one who'll stay here in Hong Kong and with Dr. Kingsley. Oh, if he may, Doctor. Why, certainly. I welcome this opportunity to entertain a member of the secret police. Well... Clint and me will just be searching the river and them flower boats, kid. But you'll be here taking care of Jean and the doctor. Oh, will you do that, Speed? Will you please? Well, sure, Jean. Don't you worry. I'll take care of you, all right. Well, that's a good boy, Speed. And now you better get off those wet clothes, or Jean will have to be taking care of you. <laughs> and I'll go back to the Golden Lotus Hotel with Barney and take this Chinese makeup off and try to get a little sleep. And see that you do, too. Yeah, Clint. I wonder if Miss Marsh is doing any sleeping. The octopus must have drugged her to keep her quiet. So she's not worrying about anything right now. Say, Clint... Do you think that Quan Wu was one of the octopus gang? Well, his presence on the dock at the time the slave boat arrived was very suspicious, Speed. Oh, after all, it may have, he just may have been there out of idle curiosity. Yeah, you can't tell. People come down to the docks to see boats come in and out in China just like they do over in the United States, kid. Why, yes, I, uh, I can't imagine Mr. Wu having anything to do with such a gang. He has such a good reputation. He's received everywhere. Well, maybe you're right, Dr. Kingsley. I hope so. Anyhow, we'll go back to the Golden Lotus now, and if you get right to bed, Speed, we'll pick you up in the morning if you want to see us take off. Say, I wouldn't miss that for anything, Clint. Can I come too, Clint? Why, well, sure thing, Jean. That is, if your father says yes. Why, we'll all come to see you off, Clint. I only wish I could do more to end the career of the octopus. <laughs> Silence, men. Your master, the octopus, is speaking. Quan Wu has just contacted me. The flower boat was raided by the International Secret Police. 
Some of our band were arrested. The slaves were freed. Silence. For the first time, a slave transfer has failed. And why? Because my men are cowards. Because they fear the secret police. Because they fear Clint Barlow. If you fear anyone in the world, it must be me, the octopus. Because if you fail to destroy Clint Barlow, Barney Dunlap, and Speed Gibson immediately, then I will destroy you, every one of you. And your destruction will not be speedy nor pleasant. I pay you well as long as you obey orders. And I will give you the orders myself, since Quan Wu has gone on a short trip. The secret police saw him on the Siang Dock tonight. The raid identified them as secret police. And Quan Wu believes it will allay possible suspicion if he removes himself for a little while. And now, members of the Octopus Band, I have just received further word that the secret police have learned that Marsha Winfield was placed aboard the flower boat for the return trip up the Siang River. Tomorrow morning, Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlap are going to fly up the river to look for her. They must never return from that flight. Ming... Yes, Master. Proceed to my hangar. Stand ready to follow them in one of the pursuit planes. Take a gunner with you for the machine gun. Master, you mean... I mean that Clint and Barney must never return from their flight up the Siang River. that bullet plane, Doc? Well, Barney, it certainly looks dangerous. Oh, it is, Daddy. One time when Barney was flying it, the octopus dropped a pin into the controls and sent the plane into a nosedive. The octopus? Radio control, Dr. Kingsley. Barney found the pin in time, though. Lucky for him. I'll say so. You see, it was like this, Doc. I started into a spin through the cloud bank Ah, and... now, while Barney tells you his life's history, Doctor, will you excuse Speed and me for a few minutes? I'm going to get our clearance papers from the port officials. Well, certainly, Clint. Okay, Jean. Clint, we've already got our clearance papers and everything. Yes, I know, Speed. I wanted to get you alone a second to give you last-minute instructions. Oh, sure. But what do you want me to do? Well, nothing, except on direct orders from me. Oh, Clint, how can I do any good that way? You can do plenty of good, Speed. I want you to keep in touch with Lee Ying, just in case anything should crack open while we're gone, in regard to Marsha. Well, should I go to his tea shop? No. No, I've made arrangements for him to come to the doctor secretly. If anything important should come up. You remember that willow tree in the garden? The one near the wall? Yeah. If he wants to contact you, he'll fasten a paper from one of his tea packages to the branches facing your room window. On it, in code, will be the time you're to meet him and the place. And it'll probably be in the garden itself after dark. We must maintain secrecy because no one, not even the doctor and little Jean, is to know that Lee Ying, the tea merchant, is in the International Secret Police. Okay, Clint. I've got all that straight. All right. Have you a copy of the code key? Yeah. But I don't need it anymore if you want it. I've memorized the key perfectly. I can decipher any message in code now. Good. Then destroy the code key the minute you're alone. Burn it. That key must not fall into enemy hands. All right. But how can I get word to you if something should happen here, Clint? Well, the doctor has a shortwave sending and receiving set speed. And I have the call letters. I'll keep in touch with you by radio telephone. And you, with your knowledge of radio, can answer me. Gee, I didn't know he had a shortwave set. Yes, it's in his study, Speed. It's a hobby of his. And he knows that I'll keep in touch with you that way, so you'll not have to ask his permission to use it. In fact, anything concerning actual police work must be sent me with no one else as listening. Yeah, I know. Don't worry, Clint. I'll take care of things back here. Just you and Barney take care of yourselves on this flight and come back with Miss Marsha. Uh, we'll do our best, Speed. In the meantime, you are not under any circumstances to leave the doctor's house. Of course, unless under the supervision of Li Yin. You understand? Yes, sir. Very well. You better go back to the others now, or Barney will happen to remember that we've already attended to what we're supposed to be attended to now. Is Barney going to fly the bullet plane? Eh, at least in the beginning. And then I'll take over the controls when he's tired. Gee, I'd give anything to go with you fellas. I'll have another seat put in that ship the minute we return, Speed. As it is, I don't know what we'll do with Marsha when we find her. Oh, well, I'll worry about that when we find her. Yeah, you can always get hold of another plane. Or maybe she could come back on another flower boat. There's a motor, Clint. And she's probably had enough of flower boats by this time. I found that pin just 
it out of the controls and pulled back on the stick hard. Up I zoomed. And then I banked and leveled off for as pretty a landing as you ever see. Is he still talking about his narrow escape, Doctor? Well, it certainly was narrow, Clint. And the other aviator probably would have failed to bring it out of that dive. Well, I'll tell you the truth, Doctor. You brought the plane out of the dive, but he's still in one. Yeah. Oh, yeah? What about that time... Oh, come on, come on, fella. They're warming up our motors. We've got a lot of flying to do. Well, what are we waiting for? I'm ready. It's fine. Good luck, fellas. Well, goodbye. Bye. 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 Good luck. Oh, I do hope they'll come back safe. We need more about them not being safe in the air, Gene. They're both swell aviators. Yes, I imagine they're in more danger on the ground than in the air. Look, they're climbing into the cockpit now. Uh-huh. But the small plane of that can be brought right up to the float instead of them having to roll out. Goodbye! Goodbye! Happy Bye. landing, fellas! Goodbye! They're turning around now. Heading into the wind. And there they go. They can only find Marsh. They will, Dr. Kingsley. Clinton Barney can do anything. Hey! What's wrong, Feet? Where did that other plane come from? Look, it's following Clinton Barney. That's probably a government plane, Speed. No, Doctor. It's like the one Barney's flying. Come on, we've got to get to your shortwave set and warn him. That's another octopus plane. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling Speed, Clint, and Barney have had plenty of excitement since landing in Hong Kong on the trail of the octopus and his criminal gang, but they are not the only ones entangled in his tentacles. Marsha Winfield has been kidnapped by the octopus because she knew too much about his band and has been smuggled aboard a flower boat that is slowly traveling up the Siang River to Hong Chau. Clint and Barney fly after the boat in the bullet monoplane in the hope that they can rescue the girl. But right after their takeoff, Speed on the dock with Dr. Kingsley and little Jean notices another plane pursuing his uncle. Recognizing it to be another octopus plane, Speed hurries to the doctor's home in order to warn Barney and his uncle. We find him at the set now, trying to get through the airwaves. KVMC calling OC-34. KVMC calling OC-34. Come in, Clint. Why doesn't Clint answer, Speed? He's probably too busy watching the riverboats to answer right away, Gene. Well, do you think he has his set open to receive anything, Speed? Oh, yes, sir. And maybe they've noticed that octopus pursuit plane, too. But I'm not taking any chances. OC-34 replying to KVMC. OC-34 replying to KVMC. Oh, goody. What's up, Steve? Standing by. He's talking. Shh, Gene. Are you ready for two-way conversation, Clint? Yes, Steve. Then listen. Right after you and Barney took off, another plane came up out of nowhere, and last we saw of it, it was following you. Following us? Yeah. 
Haven't you seen it? Barney and I haven't been watching anything but the river. The sky ahead, Speed. Uh, wait a minute. I'll take a look. Now that he's stopped talking long enough to take a look, maybe I'll have a chance. Hi, kid. Hello, Barney. Have you seen anything of the flower boat yet? Nothing but sampans and junk so far, but we're keeping our eyes peeled. Hold on, just Clint. Can't see a sign of another plane, Speed. We've run into a broken overcast up here over the river. The other plane is probably above the clouds while we're fairly low over the river. In that case, what do we got to worry about? He sure won't fly into us. You've got plenty to worry about, Barney. That pursuit plane is an octopus ship. Yeah, huh? What's that, Speed? What makes you think that? It's exactly the same kind of a plane as you're in, Clint. And it looked awful suspicious, following you that way right after you took off. Yes, yeah, so while you've been talking, I've been keeping an eye cock for it. But I haven't seen the thing yet. Maybe it's just a private plane out for a spin. And again, maybe not. Anyway, we'll keep watch, Speed. Thanks for the warning. And then us know the minute anything should happen, will you, Clint? I'll stay right by the set here. All right, Speed. So long, kid. OC-34 signing off. Gee, I don't like that plane business. Do you think the octopus would have more than one plane? Gee, he's got everything. That's why he's so hard to fight. Why did he have to kidnap Marsha? I thought fighting was only done by men. Say, that octopus guy don't recognize any rules, Gene. He fights anybody or anything that might stop him from getting what he wanted. And Marsha had the onion skin map her brother sent her. Uh, Clint gave me his copy of it to study while he's gone. Oh, he did? Well, I wondered. He didn't give it to me, and I know he wouldn't leave it in a room at the Golden Lotus Hotel. Pete, supposing Clint and Barney have to land. Where will they land if the Sion River's too full of boats? They don't have to land on water, Jean. That plane has landing wheels, too. But Barney hasn't used them, so he hasn't let them down. No reason for him in the water. Doggone... I sure wish I was with them fellas now. Seen anything of that other crate, Clint? No, and we're not likely to unless he drops down. That overcast is getting pretty solid. Might run into rain. Should have brought our umbrellas. That's the trouble with these open planes. Get every bit of weather that comes along right in your face. You should have stayed at home with your knitting, Grandma. What do you mean, Grandma? Ain't I flown in every kind of weather they got without squawking? Sure. What are you kicking out for? Oh, it's unnecessary. That's why. It's going to be hard enough finding that flower boat that's carrying Marsha without getting a lot of rain in the face. Rain in the face. Sounds like an Indian. <laughs> hey, don't you think that's funny? I don't think anything's funny right now. Least of all you, Bonnie. We got a tough job to do. We have another octopus plane on our tail. We may not even get to do it. So cut out the clowning. I'm as worried about Marsha as you are, Clint. And just to set on finding her. What if we have got an octopus plane on our tail? Why not, clown? Here today and gone tomorrow. That's me. <laughs> you flatter yourself if you think you're here today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're all right, you old cloud jumper. Don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> what? You don't know... Say, I wish the gang could hear you say that. First time you ever broke down and admitted that. Hey, 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 look below. Ain't that a flower boat? Huh? Yes, it is. Hey, lose more altitude, Bonnie. I want to take a good look. Don't worry, you'll get one. If I get any lower, I'll land on her deck. At least that'll be the general idea, and there'll be plenty of flowers for our funeral. Well, it looks innocent enough. Now let's climb as high as we can. Before getting into that overcast and see if we can spot any other flower boats up ahead. If we can't, then we'll land and search this one. Okay, but that ceiling's pretty low, I think. Hey, hey, you don't have to go straight up. Who's flying this ship? We can't get much higher without going into the overcast, Clint. Look, our prop is getting tangled up in clouds already. Okay. Level off the side slip for a quick landing then, Bonnie. Can you make a river landing? Yeah, she's all clear ahead of that flower boat, and that's where we'll land, so she'll have to stop. Hey, hey, hold on. Level off, Bonnie. There's that pursuit plane. Sure enough. He dropped down behind us while we was ironing that river up ahead. What are the orders? Lose altitude and see what he does. That'll soon tell us whether he's following us. But no side slipping now. Now take it easy. Okay. He's over us now. Hey, there's something mounted on the rear cockpit. Could be a machine gun. It is a machine gun. He's just taking the cover off. Suffering rain doodles. 
Maybe war's been declared. We wouldn't know messing around in the air as much as we do. We're sure going to know it in a minute. Hey, hey, Barney, he's nosing down. He's coming right for us. He is? in the grass? Them drill bullets he shooting at us. Look at our wings. Oh, boy, that loop of yours saved us. Yeah, but not for long. Look at that fella skid so he can get around and hightail after us. If he wants to play, I'm going to get up through that overcast so we'll have plenty of room to play in. If we only had a machine gun, there's a carriage here for it, all right. Yeah, but we can't shoot the carriage. How's our playful friend doing? He's coming right after us. But he's not gaining... This ship isn't any faster than ours. That's one thing to be thankful for. Better get your gun out, though, Clint. Might be able to do a little good with it. We might. I don't want to get that close if we can help it. That hail of machine gun bullets can't do us any good. Yeah, what we need is a cannon. Up, here we go into the overcast. And come out looking, too. No telling where that other plane will pop up. Hey, how much gas we got? Started out with plenty, but I don't know if those bullets punctured any of the tanks or not. Well, we'll soon find out. Oh, I get into a dogfight with no gas. Either that or establish a new altitude record with no gas. We were sapped to tackle this flight alone, anyhow. Oh, not necessarily. Just bad breaks, Barney. There's no use crabbing. We're going to have to figure a way out of this. A way to get back to that flower boat. We probably won't have to figure much. Just enough lead bullets and we'll make the quickest landing you ever saw. Hey. Hey, the overcast is lightening up. We're breaking through. Yeah. Boy, it's bright after those clouds, huh? Well, the sky's empty so far. Yeah, but not for long. I'm aiming my prop at the sun for a little while. And just in case we do make a force landing, I'll have plenty of altitude to play around it. Hey, hey, there's the other plane. Right on our tail. Boy, oh boy, I wish I could add about another hundred miles to our airspeed indicator. You think you ought to tell Speed what's happening over the radio telephone? No, there's no use worrying him. He'd go crazy if he knew the spot we're in. I'll wait and tell him after it's all over. Yeah, you'll tell him if you're still able to talk. Gee, I sure wish we'd get some word from Clinton Barney. I hate to call him again and bother him. Yes, they'll uh, they'll probably call you the moment they have anything important to tell us, Speed. That's the octopus. That's the sound he always makes. The octopus? That's him, all right, Doctor. Can you hear me, Octopus? <laughs> Perfectly. But how did you come in? How can you hear me? I can do many things with my ultra-high frequency set that no one else understands. But aren't you more interested in your uncle just now? Clint, well, what do you know about him? I know that he and Barney are flying for their lives. Flying from my pursuit plane, which has a machine gun trained on them. Oh, you can't do anything to my uncle and Barney. Oh, can't I? At this moment, they are trying to fly away from my plane. But the bullets have already found their mark in the reserve gasoline tanks of the plane Barlow is flying. It won't be long until his other gasoline is gone, and then his motor will fail. Barney will still bring her to a landing. Oh, no. Because he'll lose airspeed by doing so. And then my flyer will drop down, and the machine gun will end your uncle's uh, promising career. No, oh, no. You can't do that. It is too late. I have done it. What can we do? Oh, Speed, can't we help them? Can't you talk to Clint and Barney? I'm trying. KVMC, call an OC-34. Clint and Barney, come in. I've got to reach them. KVMC, call an OC-34. KVMC, call an OC-34.
Robinson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. As you remember from the previous episode, Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlap of the International Secret Police are flying up the Seong River in an effort to locate the flower boat, which, manned by the octopus gang, is carrying Marsha Winfield, who has been kidnapped. The octopus has dispatched a plane in pursuit of the boys, and as the gunner attempts to shoot Clint and Barney down, the octopus comes in over Dr. Kingsley's short wave set, where Speed Gibson is awaiting word from his uncle, and tells the boy that he will never see Clint again. Horrified, Speed tries to get some reassuring word from Barlow's plane, but thus far has had no reply. KVMC calling OC-34. KVMC calling OC-34. Come in, please, Clinton Barney. Oh, dear. What do we do, Speed? I don't know, Jean. They don't answer. I don't know what to do. Speed, with the octopus tuning in as he did, do you think he might have somehow changed the wavelength? I don't see how it could, Dr. Kingsley. I haven't touched the dial since I was talking to Clinton Barney. I still can't figure out how that octopus tuned in. But Clint told me that he's experimenting with high frequencies and knows more about radio than most experts. I wish we knew more about it so that we could talk to Clint and Barney. Try to get him again, Speed. I'll try. KVMC calling OC-34. KVMC calling OC-34. KVMC calling OC-34. That guy's sticking closer than a brother, ain't he, Clint? Hey, Barney, I think that pursuit plane is gaining on us. Say, something's wrong, Clint. I switched on the reserve gas tank five minutes ago, and I'm not getting a thing. If you ask me, some of them bullets punctured our reserves, and the motor will conk out on us any minute. We'll have to do something quick, then. Once our motor stalls, we'll have to concentrate on landing rather than on aerobatics to avoid his machine gun bullets. Only thing we have time for is a head-on trick. It's an old gag, but it usually fools them. Are you game? Go to it, fella. Better keep your fingers on the buckle of your safety belt, just in case anything goes wrong so we can bail out. Okay. And if anything happens to you, give a shout and I'll take the stick. Okay, if I'm able to shout. Are you ready? You bet. Turn her over and let's head right back in the prop of that suit plane. That don't make them duck, nothing ever will. Here goes! They're holding to their course. No way. They'll crack. Wait and see. They'll crack. If they don't shoot us out of the sky first, go right on them, Barney. We bluffed them. Didn't I tell you we would, fella? We bluffed them. Look at them die. And they only missed them by an eyelash. Another fraction of an inch, we would have locked propellers. And that would have been safer than running out of gas and have that guy follow us down with a load of machine gun bullets. Uh-oh. There she goes. Well, we did our business just in the nick of time, I'd say. We... Listen to the wind howling down the chimney, Grandma. <laughs> Don't get so interested in listening to it that you forget how to make a dead stick landing. <laughs> Spiral down, fella. Listen and pipe down while I try to raise speed again. Okay, I'm just trying to make the time pass quicker. Nothing more boring than a dead stick landing from 6,000 feet elevation. There's nothing to do but spiral. Go round and round and round. Will you pipe down. Mm. OC-34 calling KVMC. Flight station OC-34 calling KVMC. 
Come in, Speed. Huh. That is a doornail, huh? Yeah. Hey, listen. The octopus signal. Let me get my direction finder on that guy. Good. Keep quiet and listen. Couldn't find him in just one direction finder anyhow. I'm Barlow and Barney Dunlap. I am the octopus. Yeah, 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 we know. Next he'll give us that song and dance about what he'll do to us if we don't lay off. Well, shut up and listen. Yes, Bart. You know I can hear every word you say. You can? How come? Can't we even make a forced landing without you listening in? I am sorry that you are making a forced landing. Yes? Yes. I am sorry that you have anything to say about your landing. My plan was that you were to be shot down. Nice fella. If that's all you have to say, Octopus, might as well save your breath and tune out. We're doing very nicely in spite of your plans. You, perhaps. But what about your nephew? Huh? Speed? What do you mean? I have talked to him and Dr. Kingsley over the Dr. Shortwave set. I told Speed that he would never see you again. Why, you devil? You devil fish? <laughs> you think you can always outwit me, Clint Barlow. But I always have the winning ace. Speed gives... If you dare do anything to Speed, I... The octopus dares anything. And now, may you have a most unhappy landing. Hey, keep him tuned in. Don't let him get away. Oh, don't talk like a donkey, Barney. We've got to land and see what's happened to Speed. If I could only raise something on this set. Ah, oh, that octopus guy is only bluffing, Clint. Trying to throw a scare into us so as we'll lay off that flower pot. Oh, boat. maybe, but I can't rest until I talk to Speed. We'll be down soon. We're diving through the clouds now. And look at this darn rain. The cockpit will be so full of water by the time we land, we'll sink as soon as we sit down. You want me to take the controls? No. I took her up and by golly, I'll bring her down. There's the river below. See any of the flower boat? No, not a thing in this rain. That dogfight of ours in the clouds carried us way ahead of the boat anyway. We'll catch her when she comes up. Meantime, keep your eyes open for short wave transmitters. There may be one around here somewhere. Sure, but I can't keep this crate up forever while we're looking for one. Not without gasoline. Well, pick your landing and set down. It'll be a river landing. Don't like to put the wheels into that muck. Not a decent landing field anyway. Well, you got plenty of room on the river. This rain has driven everyone to the banks. Everyone except those who ain't got better sense than to fly in it. Got your safety belt fastened? Liable to be a bumpy landing. Uh, yeah, it's all fastened. Okay, then I'll set her down. We certainly didn't waste any time getting down. Oh, I'm glad this rain has stopped. I let her drop plenty before I started spiraling. Thought the quicker we got down, the better. Don't see any sign of that pursuit plane, do you? Mm, no, I don't. Hey, Barnett, look at that house on the bank. It has a short wave transmitter. Say, are we in luck? Quick, let's get to shore. Well, what'll we use for a boat? Or do you feel like swimming? Might as well. Couldn't be any wetter than we are. But wait, there's a guy putting out in a rowboat. Yeah, good. See, he's coming out for us. Ain't very far, but I'd hate to swim in this river. See, that fellow's got a little bay and a dock, too. Before his cottage, you see? If the water's deep enough, maybe he can tow the plane over out of the way of the river traffic. Good idea. Ahoy there! Ahoy, An American. <laughs> Why not? You think you were the only one in China? I heard you come down. Thought you were going to land on my roof for a minute. Can I help you out? My name's Bob Gilmore. You certainly can, Gilmore. Uh, I'm Clint Barlow, and this is Barney Dunlap. Can you tow us into your little bay? Sure thing. Come into the boat. You bet we will. I'm only too glad to get out of this crate. <laughs> I'll stay. Uh, there we are. Oh, uh, here's a tow rope. Where do you want to fasten it? Oh, on the tail. There's a ring there just for that purpose. Good enough. Whoa, whoa. Uh, that's enough. Where do I tie this now? Okay, shove off. <laughs> well, you're having another pair of oars or I'd help you. Oh, this is the cinch. She's not heavy to haul. Say, uh, how come you fellows came down? Run out of gas? Well, we were shot out of gas. Huh? Uh, we were out of yeah. gas, all right. Oh, well, say, can we send a message over your shortwave station? Why, sure, Barlow, but uh, I noticed you had one in your plane. Something haywire there, too? And how? If we was to tell you how haywire it well, all is... Yes, yes, the radio's dead, all right. Uh, how far are we from Hong Kong? Well, as the bird flies, about uh, 100 miles. Up the Siang, double that mileage. We really traveled since this morning. You left Hong Kong this morning? Yes, late. But we didn't push the plane at that. Not on our hedge hopping, we didn't. We was looking for a boat. But when we was going straight up, I had that baby wide open. When you were going straight up? Uh, well, uh, yes, we were doing some aerobatics above that rain ceiling. Well, that's what I'd like to be doing. I tried to get a private pilot's license, but it didn't make the grade. Why not? 
Oh, lack of inherent flying ability, I guess. My instructor said I'd kill myself in a month if I went through with it. Oh, say, that's tough luck if you really like flying. Uh, I love it. But when I couldn't fly through the air, I talked into it. Hence the short wave transmitter. It's a hobby of mine. Do you work at it? No, I'm an engineer by profession. Engineer? Say, did you ever hear... Well, never mind, Noel. Here we are at the riverbank. Now, come on, come on. Climb out, Bonnie. I'm going to get at that set. Well, go ahead and help yourself, Barlow. I'll moor your plane so she won't drift. My station call is KOFF, 3320 kilocycles. She's all heated because I've just been transmitting. Oh, that's fine. Well, thanks a lot, Gilmore. Come on, come on, Barney. Uh, suffering wang doodles. Every step I take, I sink up to my neck in mud. Mm, I ought to wring your neck. We're in the secret police, and that doesn't mean you should go around telling everything we do. Oh, Gilmore's a swell guy. Oh, you, you still have to learn how to keep your mouth shut. Here we are now. Come on, come on. Scrape the mud off your feet. Yes, Mama. Now, can I go inside, Mama? Uh, come in or stay out, for all I care. I want to get at that short wave set. Hmm. Cozy shack Gilmore's got here. Clint Barlow calling KVMC. Calling KVMC. Speed, come in on KOFF. KVMC, come in on KOFF. Standing by for two-way. It'll take him some time to change over to this new station. Yeah. KVMC replying to KOFF. KVMC replying to KOFF. Come in, KVMC. It's Doc Kingsley. Oh, Doctor, let me speak to Speed. Great heavens, Clint, where are you? Speed's been desperate. He's gone to get help. Gone? Wait, I told him not to leave you. I know, I tried to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't even tell me where he was going. All I know is, your nephew has disappeared. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling When the dreaded criminal, the octopus, sends some of his band to kidnap Marsha Winfield and carry her away on a flower boat up the Siang River, Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlap fly in pursuit in the bullet monoplane they captured from the octopus. Speed Gibson stays in Hong Kong with Dr. Kingsley and little Jean keeping in touch with his uncle by shortwave radio. The octopus interrupts their communication, however, by telling Speed that he has sent another of his planes in pursuit and that he will never see Clint and Barney again. Meanwhile, the boys have come out the victors in the dogfight in the clouds with the enemy plane, 
but make a forced landing because they are out of gas. Bob Gilmore, an engineer with a shortwave transmitter, rescues them, and Clint calls the doctor again, only to learn that Speed left the house to seek help. Clint, fearing that his nephew may fall into the hands of the octopus gang, is desperate. But Dr. Kingsley, didn't Speed give you any indication as to where he was going? Not a word, Clint. As a matter of fact, he was out of the house before I could stop him. What shall I do? Notify the police? No, no, I must have time to think, Doctor. Stand by your set. I'll talk to you again as soon as I have some plan laid out. Very well, Clint. I'll stand by. A-K-O-F-F, signing off. That's a fine how do you do. Whatever possessed the kid to leave the doc's house? Uh, I don't know, Bonnie. What's worse, the octopus knows he's left. That's why he's tuned in on the flight radio while we were making that dead stick landing. For all we know, he may have speed in his den at this minute. Take it easy, fella. Don't get your feathers ruffled. Oh, I know, I know. It doesn't do any good, but I've got to get action. Here comes Bob Gilmore. Oh, yes. Oh, Barney, I'm going to do something with him that I never do with strangers. I'm going to take him into our confidence. I've got to, because right now he's the only man who can help us. I'd trust that guy, Clint, any day of the week. Hey, plane safely moored, Barlow. Are you coming with your short wave? Well, uh, had some bad news, Gilmore. That's so? Anything I can do? You've helped us plenty already, but maybe you can help us even more. Well, I'll sure do anything I can. Well, you see, Gilmore, Barney and I are members of the International Secret Police. Oh, I figured you weren't flying up the Siang just for fun. And you figured right, fella. Have you ever heard of the octopus? Uh, the octopus? Yeah. Why, yes. Now, we're looking for him. Want to clean up his gang. But I understand his headquarters are in Hong Kong. Yes, but he's smuggling a girl up the Siang on one of his flower boats. Along with a cargo of opium. Smuggling a girl? A white girl? Yeah, and a darn good friend of ours. Well, the whole story is too long to tell in detail, but for reasons other than purely personal, we must find that girl. Meanwhile, I'm afraid the octopus has gotten a hold of my nephew in Hong Kong. You brought a boy along? Yes, he's 15 and also a member of the secret police. At that age, he must be some kid. He sure is, Bob. Keeps us hopping to stay with him. Sometimes he's overconfident. Of course, that's only natural because of his youth. And that's what worries me now. I don't know where he is, and there's only one man in Hong Kong, outside of the octopus, that might know. Lee Ying? Yes, Lee Ying, the tea merchant. He's a shortwave enthusiast, too. Well, see, Bob, do you mind if I use your set again? No, not at all. Speed's taken a great liking for this Lee Ying, Bob. Maybe he figured he knew China better than Dr. Kingsley and could help him trace us. A-K-O-F-F, calling I-S-56. Barlow at A-K-O-F-F. Calling IS-56. Come in over 3320 kilocycles, IS-56. Barlow at AKOFF, 3320 kilocycles. Calling IS-56. Standing by. Come in, IS-56. That set you had on your plane went out on you? Yeah, all of a sudden. That's what caused this mess. When the kid didn't hear from us, he figured right off that the octopus had us, I guess. AKOFF. 3320 kilocycles calling IS-56. Barlow at AKOFF. 3320 kilocycles calling IS-56. Standing by. Come in, IS-56. Guess he's away from his set, Clint. Uh, sounds that way. I'll just have to keep sending out calls until I raise him, I guess. What on earth can he be doing? Speed, what are you doing here alone? I thought Clint told you never to leave the doctors unless someone was with you. I had to come. Something's happened to Clint. I couldn't tell you over the phone because Dr. Kingsley isn't supposed to know you're in the secret police. But what has happened to Clint? I don't know. While we were waiting for word over the doctor's short wave set, the octopus tuned in and said that the plane he sent after him had shoot him down. Well, after that, I kept trying to get Clint and Barney, but I couldn't. Gee, Lee Ying, you think that the octopus plane really got him? Has anything come over your set from Clint? I have not been here, Speed. I was out on official business, but I will go and see what I can learn right now. Come along. Where's the shortwave set, Ying? In the tea storeroom. Oh, we've been in there. Yes, you remember? Down this passage? I remember all right. I didn't see any shortwave equipment there. Nothing but a lot of tea. That is all that anyone excepting the secret police should see, Speed. Ah, here we are. Oh, I almost missed the door. This passage is kind of dark. No one followed you here to your knowledge, did they? No. There was a fellow hanging around Dr. Kingsley's house... He started shadowing me, but I lost him by ducking through alleys. You took a terrible chance coming here alone, Speed. You must realize that should you fall into the hands of the octopus, Clint would give up the search for the criminal. His devotion for you stands above his duty as a member of the secret police, you know. I know, Li Ying, but I had to take a chance for his sake. Where's your shortwave equipment? Here. 
I take this package of jasmine tea from the shelf and press what appears to be a nail in the wall behind it. Gosh, a secret panel. Yes, those tea packages on the panel are false. The whole thing slides behind the wall. Step through, Speed. Gee, what a room. Why, it's a regular laboratory, Li Ying. Yes, I have everything in here that has any bearing on crime detection. There is the short way it's set there. I'll switch on the system. I have it set to receive now, Speed, so you will not have to bother with that. It's okay. Gee, if we can only hear something from Clint. Calling IS-56. Barlow at AKOFF. 3320 kilocycles calling IS-56. Ying, it's Clint. He's safe. Standing by. Come in, IS-56. What was that radio band? 3320 kilocycles. Oh, yeah. There, I have it now. I'll answer him. But first, I'll have to switch over. There it is. IS-56, replying to AKOFF. Speed Gibson at IS-56, replying to Clint Barlow at AKOFF. Stand by for two-way conversation. Here, I will set it for you, Speed. Thanks, Ying. Ready? Yes, go ahead. Clint. Clint, can you hear me? Uh, Speed? Yeah. Are you and Barney all right? Why the dickens did you leave Dr. Kingsley after I gave you express orders not to? I had to, Clint. While we was waiting for a word from you and the plane... The octopus tuned in and said I'd never see you again. He did? Sure. That's why I beat it here. I knew Lee Ying could help me find out what had happened to you, if anybody could. Well, you had me plenty worried. The octopus came in over our flight set, too, and threatened your safety. When we finally landed and got to a short wave set, the doctor told me you'd left without saying where you were going. I thought you'd walk right into the octopus trap. I'm sorry I scared you, Clint. Looks like the octopus was trying to frighten both of us. Where are you now? Uh, uh, what's that, Speed? You're fading on me. I said, where are you now? Oh, about 200 miles up the Siang River. I'm using the short wave equipment of a young fellow named Bob Gilmore. He has a house right on the riverbank. He's helped us out all around. Gee, that's swell. What happened in the air? We well, got into a dogfight above the clouds. Had the reserve gas tanks punctured by machine gun bullets. So Barney pulled the old head-on trick on the other plane and scared it away. Right after that, we ran out of gas and had to make a dead stick landing on the river. Gee, you are plenty lucky. Have you seen the flower boat yet? We spotted one, but lost it during the dogfight. Got ahead of it in the excitement. Now we're waiting for it to catch up with us. Swell. I sure hope it's the one that's carrying Miss Marcia. I hope so. Visibility is practically zero on the river. And that boat, if it had any warning from the octopus, has had plenty of chances to get rid of its cargo. The opium and Marcia. Gee, Clint. What do you think you'll do then? It depends on what we find on the boat. If we have no luck, we'll fly back to Hong Kong. Looking for Marsha blindly up here is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But in Hong Kong, we may hear rumors of where she's being taken. But can you fly the plane now? Well, we can, as soon as the reserve gas tanks are patched up. Gilmore said he can do that as well as repair the shortwave equipment. <laughs> this guy's a genius, Steve. Well, I'd like to meet him. Bring him down to Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Now, uh, let me talk to you. Okay. Stand by. Thank you, Steve. Hello, Barlow? Oh, yes, yes, sir. Have you learned anything new during our absence? Not yet. I was out for quite a while seeking information, but all action seems to be concentrating on you and Barney. Oh, I see. Well, we'll go on to where we are, then. But, Jim, will you see that Speed gets back to Dr. Kingsley safely? Oh, yes, Clint. I will send a bodyguard with him. Do not worry. Uh, and tell him to phone the doctor that he's safe. And he can also tell him that we're safe. Let me talk to him, Lei Ying. Hello, Clint. Don't you worry. I'll take care of my end of it down here. Yeah, you'll see that you do. And don't try to run Yi Ling's business, either. The main thing is to obey his orders. You understand? Yes, sir. All right, I'll keep in touch with you at the doctor's. And remember this radio band. It's A-K-O-F-F, 3320 kilocycles. I've got it. So long. Uh, so long, Speed. A-K-O-F-F, signing off. Okay, Clint. This is IS-56, signing off. IS-56, signing off. Say, Clint, that kid sure gets around, don't he? Say, you know, Barney, even though he was running a risk, it's lucky he went to Lee Yin's. Otherwise, I might not have reached him for hours. Ying had no idea I'd be trying to call him. Hey, Clint, that flower boat's in sight. At least I guess it's the one you're looking for. Flower boat? Let's see. You can just make it out through this window. That's her, all right. We got to stop her. Hey, I've got some red lanterns. That'll stop it, all right. They'll think there's danger ahead. Oh, good. Let's get them. First, I think I should tell you this, Bob. Perhaps you'd better stay here. There's liable to be trouble. I like that kind of trouble, Clint. Particularly if there's a girl in danger. Well, Marsha Winfield is certainly in danger. Winfield? Did you say Marsha Winfield? Well, well, yes. Why? Why, I... I know her. At least I know all about her. Her brother, Larry Winfield, was my best friend. Larry? Your best friend? 
Then do you know he's disappeared? That the octopus is at the bottom of it? And that Marsha came over to China to see if she could find Larry? Marsha in China? Yes, and now the octopus has Marsha under his power. Say, what's stopping us then? If Marsha Winfield's on that flower boat, we'll find her. Come on. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson is keeping an eye on developments in Hong Kong regarding the activities of the criminal, the octopus. Clint and Barney are 200 miles up the Siong River in the company of Bob Gilmore, who came to their rescue when they made a forced landing on the river. After they have established shortwave communication with Speed, the flower boat, which they believe is smuggling Marsha Winfield up the river, appears, and as the boys prepared to stop the boat by means of red lanterns, Gilmore reveals that Marsha's missing brother Larry was his best friend. Learning that Marsha is the girl aboard the boat, he joins forces, and the three of them, well-armed, row out to meet the flower boat. Well, this is about the middle of the river, Bob. You better stop here. Right, old Clint. The flower boat has spotted these lanterns. Stand up and swing yours, Bonnie. Well, Bob and I balance the boat. Okay, but see that you balance it. I don't want to take a swim right now. Ahoy! Flower boat! Pull up! We want to board you! Danger ahead! Ahoy! What danger? We'll have to come aboard to explain. Pull to! All right, sir. We pull to... Let's row over. They're letting down a ladder for us. And keep your guns handy. There's a hundred or more Chinese aboard that boat and only three of us. Yes, but most of the passengers don't know what sort of boat they're really traveling on, Barney. Don't forget that. They imagine her to be one of the regular flower boats, built for nothing but pleasure. Look at that crowd up on deck. Uh, anything for a little excitement. Now, wait. Take it easy on the talk. We're near enough for them to hear us, so be careful. Okay. Do all three of us go aboard? Yeah, I think we'd better. We can tie the boat to the ladder. Yes, in fact, I'm doing that right now. I'll have her moored fast in a second. Yeah, you can start up the ladder if you want. All right, I'll go first. Watch it, Barney. It's tricky trying to get onto a ladder from a swaying boat, you know. Okay, I'm right after you. All right. Bob coming? Yeah. Uh... uh. Ah, here we are. Over the rail. Here, I'll, I'll help you over, Barney. I can make it. Uh, all right. We'll wait for Bob before starting anything. Okay. I'm over. Now, what next? You'll find out. 
Here comes something that might be the captain. What is wrong? Why have you stopped Plowboat? Where is danger? We're the police. We're going to search your boat. Oh, no, no. My boat. Very good boat. Yeah? Then why did you smuggle a cargo of slaves down to the Siang dock and beat it after you transferred them? This boat did not carry slaves. Only flowers and dancing girls. You gentlemen wish to enjoy dancing girls, the music, eh? No. Ain't we already told you we're here to search the boat? Uh, no use arguing with him, Bonnie. He'll stall as long as possible. You, what's your name? Me, Hot Toy. All right then, Hot Toy. Whether you like it or not, we're going to search your boat. And I expect full cooperation from your passengers and crew. Don't try to start anything because there are only three of us. We're backed by the International Secret Police. International Secret Police? Oh, very nice. I help you search boat. Very nice. Very pretty. What's pretty about it? Something's wrong here, Clint. This guy's too nice all of a sudden. Yeah, we'll go on with the search anyhow. Uh, Bob, will you stay up here on deck? You bet I will, Clint. If there's any trouble, I'll shoot twice. Good. Now, Barney and I will go below to see what we can find. Come along, Barney. And you too, Hop Joy. Very happy. Very nice. But don't say it's very pretty. Oh, uh, no? No. You lead on, Hop Toy, and no monkey business. I got you covered. Here, we go down these steps, please. All right, go ahead. Get out your flashlight, Barney. Looks dark down there. Boy, it is dark. A gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other. What'll I do if I have to scratch my head? You don't. Hey, look. There are the boxes ahead. Hop toy, open one. That gentleman, they contain only nails. Never mind what they contain. Open it. All right. You see, gentlemen, just nails, honorable policemen. Oh, Marsha, Marsha Winfield, it's Clint and Barney. No use, Clint. She's probably still drugged and wouldn't hear you no matter how loud you yelled. Huh? And we'll have to look in every box down here, Barney. I'm not going to risk a slip-up this time. But, honorable policemen... Cut out that honorable stuff, Hop Toy, and get busy on them boxes, or you'll hop higher than any toy ever did before. <laughs> Yes, Speed? Is there any way we could get hold of a plane real quick? Do you mean a private plane? Yes. I have one at my disposal for official business, but uh, it is away just now. Why? I want to go look for Clinton Barney. But, Speed, you talked to Clint only an hour ago. You know he is safe. He was then, but he hadn't stopped the flower boat yet. I've got a hunch they're going to need help, Ying. After all, there's only the two of them against that gang on the flower boat. They are running a risk, yes, but it will not be the first time. But don't you think it'd be a good idea to go after him? They'll need help with the prisoners, if not for themselves. We could take a police launch. Launch? You mean a speedboat? Yes, we could make the 200 miles up the Siang in four hours in the boat I have in mind. And we could take enough of our men with us to be of real help to Clint and Barney in case of danger. We could. Then let's start right away. Please, Jing. You'll go, won't you? I could leave all right. There's nothing pressing now. I have a very able assistant. Yes, I will go with you, Speed. Clint and Barney are brave men. Too brave. I think that this is one time they have grown careless of their own safety in their anxiety for Marsha Winfield. Well, that's what I think. I'm going to phone the doctor again, and I'm going to stay here a while longer, Li Ying. I won't tell him what I'm going to do, because he'd just worry. Good. Meanwhile, I will gather six of my men together and make arrangements to have the speedboat waiting for us at the dock in half hour, huh? Right. And something tells me that Clinton and Barney are going to need our help, whether they think they do or not. You make your telephone call while I tend to the other details. I will be right back. Okay. Thanks. Hello? Operator, I want to talk to Dr. Kingsley. I've forgotten his phone number, but he lives at 14 Lang Sioux Road. Yes, yes, that's right. I'll wait. Gee, this is going to be great. Going up the Seong River in a police launch. What if I had a cable Chief Riley? What's happened? No, oh, I, I better leave that to Clint. Hello? Dr. Kingsley? This is Pete Gibson. Yeah, I know you thought I'd be there long ago, but something came up and I've got to stay here for a while longer. What's that? Oh, no, everything's all right. Sure, L L Yi Ling's with me and will stay with me until you see me again. So don't worry. Yeah, and tell Jean not to worry, and we'll find Marsh all right. Yeah? Okay, goodbye. 
Gee, this crime laboratory of Ying's is a honey. You sure got everything in it. I have tended to everything, Speed. We can go just as soon as my men arrive. The bell will let us know when they are here. I was looking around your laboratory, Ying. Has Clint seen it? Why, yes, it is very similar to the crime laboratory the secret police maintained in New York and other key cities, Speed. Because Hong Kong is, in a sense, the gateway to the Orient, it is only logical that we maintain such a laboratory here. This is the focal point for all our Far East activities. You must be an ace operator like Clint Lee Ying to have charge of all this. Oh, no. There is only one Clint Barlow speed. No man ever has or ever will equal him in secret police work. His past record of achievement has been almost unbelievable. That is why I am so sure that he will eventually bring the octopus to judgment, providing that he does not allow his heart to rule his head too much. He never has in the past, but uh, you being with him on this assignment may force him to change his rule. I hope not, Jing. I'm going to do everything to help him instead of causing trouble for him. Uh Uh-huh. Men are here now. Come, Speed. We can start for the Siang Dock. But this is sure different from the last time he went. Then it was dark and foggy, and Clint, Barney, and me were in Chinese makeup. Remember? Uh Uh-huh. I remember only too well. That time, the flower boat with Miss Winfield aboard got away from us. But it won't this time. Not if we can help it. The last box, Clint. Nothing but nails in every one of them. Yes, I can't understand it, Barney. I'm just as sure as I'm standing here that this is the boat Marsha was taken aboard. Well, she sure ain't aboard now. We've searched this tug so thoroughly that we even found out where the rats hang out. And there ain't a trace either of Marsha or the opium cargo. I'll have a policeman through searching. Uh, I guess so, Hoptoy. But you understand this. If you're pulling anything on us... The secret police will find you if they have to search every port in China. I understand. Hello. What's happening up on deck? Well, the passengers sound excited. Yeah, let's go see. The signal. Bob's in trouble. Come on, let's get up there. One moment, honorable policeman. Yeah, huh? You will stay where you are. One move to go up our deck and we will shoot you down like dogs. We? Oui. What do you mean? If you will throw your flashlight around, you will see that some of my men have surrounded you while you were so busily engaged in watching me open these boxes of nails. You can't get away with this, Hop Toy. No. You are trapped, Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlop. Barney, this is the octopus boat. Yes, Barlow, but no one will ever know. Because you and your comrade will take the place of nails in two of these boxes with enough nails left in the boxes to carry them down to the bottom of the river. (laughs) Clint, that guy's crazy. Keep cool, Barney. Cool? You will soon be colder at the bottom of the river. A good resting place for the international secret police. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero.
trying to trace Marsha Winfield, who is prisoner of the Octopus Gang aboard a flower boat, Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlap of the International Secret Police are they themselves taken prisoner. Meanwhile, Speed Gibson, sensing that all may not be well with his uncle, makes arrangements with Lee Ying, Hong Kong operator of the Secret Police, to go up the Siang River 200 miles in a fast police launch to where Clint and Barney are located, on the chance they may need help. They need it all right because Hop Toy, captain of the flower boat, has declared them prisoners. And we find the boys, along with Bob Gilmore, their new friend, locked in the hold of the flower boat. How's the weather out, Bob? Has it started raining again? No, Barney. Uh, at least we got something to be thankful for, then. So down here, it doesn't make much difference what kind of weather's out. Yeah, we were fools to have tried this when we were so outnumbered. But with Marsh in danger, it was hard to decide on the best course. We had to move fast. We waited for the Hong Kong police. It would have given the octopus plenty of time to smuggle her inland. If you ask me, he's doing it anyhow, Clint. Fat chance we have a stopping him. Locked away in this dark hole. Uh, yes, but there's only some way of getting word to Hong Kong. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry we let you in for this, Bob. Don't worry about me, Clint. I'm as anxious to find Marsha as you are. Her brother Larry was my best friend, you know. Yeah. Say, Bob, now that the excitement has died down for the time being, why did you give us the signal a while back? Why, some of the crew were loading boxes into a small boat from the shore. They were working very quickly and quietly. Didn't look just right. Boxes? Big boxes? There was one big one. Then that's why we couldn't find Marsh or the opium cargo. While we were looking through this dummy cargo of nails, the crew got rid of the damaging evidence. You mean that Marsha was in that large box? Yes, Bob. And now that they've set her ashore, it's less likely than ever that we'll find her while she's in transit. Then the best thing for us to do is to go back to Hong Kong and start all over again. Huh, Clint? Yes, if we ever get out of this hole... From what Hop Toy said, we'll soon be finding ourselves at the bottom of the Siang River instead of in Hong Kong. Oh, yeah? Listen, I've been wet this whole trip and I'm getting tired of it, see? It's going to take more than a bunch of smugglers on a flower boat to sink me in the Siang. That's the talk, Barney. But right now, I don't know just how we're going to get out of this mess. We've searched every inch of this hole. There's no way out except through that hatch, and that's bolted. Yes, there's not even a porthole down here. We can fight it out with them when they come for us. Mm, we wouldn't last long. Remember, they've taken our guns. Yeah. If I only had a saw, maybe I could saw through the bottom of this floating flower garden. Oh, sink the boat and us with it, huh? <laughs> yeah, fine thing. We're sunk anyhow, if you ask me. How long have we been down here, Barney? Mm, according to my watch, about four hours, Bob. Lucky you have an illuminated dial. Can't see a thing down here. I wonder what they're waiting for. The boat hasn't moved since we came aboard. Yeah, they're probably waiting for darkness, Bob, so they can dump us overboard without attracting any undue attention. In that case, they ought to be coming for us any minute now. Must be good and dark out by this time. How will we receive them, Clint? Well, Barney, we might be able to get in a few good punches while, well, before they get us into those boxes. Exactly what I thought. How about that arm of yours? Will that knife wound bother you? Oh, no, no, not that much practically healed. You know what? If you and I can raise enough rumpus with the crew, Barney, maybe that'll give Bob a chance to slip over the side and swim to safety. You mean I should leave you two guys? Why, sure. We got you into this mess. It's up to us to get you out, Bob. Nothing doing. This is my fight now, too, and I'd rather go down to the bottom of the Siang River in a box of nails than leave you fellas now. All right, Bob. We'll go down fighting then. That's the way I'd choose to go at that. It won't be so bad because I know that speed is out of this mess. Safe in Hong Kong with Dr. Kingsley. Gee, this is a swell boat, Lee Ying. How fast are we going? Oh, I should say about 50 miles an hour, speed. Almost four hours since we left Hong Kong. We ought to be starting a flower boat soon, shouldn't we? Yes, if Cliff was successful in stopping it. I would advise that you keep a lookout for Gilmore's house on the riverbank. It's not so dark that you will not be able to see his shortwave transmitter. Sir, it's getting dark. You can't miss the flower boat, though. Not with those colored lanterns strung all over it. If the boat was stopped. You know, Speed, the police captain thinks it be quite insane to take this boat and his picked men up the Tiang River on uh, what you call a hunt, but what he calls a wild goose chase. Yeah, I guess anybody would think that, Lee Ying. But I'm sure glad you didn't. In the secret police, a hunch, or call it instinct, if you will plays a very large and important part in criminal pursuit. I have seen too many successful outcomes of hunches to laugh them off speed. Often, 
All we have to go on is a hunt. Well, the more clever the criminal, the fewer clues he leaves behind. The octopus certainly doesn't leave many clues. I guess that's because he's got such a big organization now. You know how he got his start? No, I don't, Speed. There was nothing gradual about the growth of the octopus band. One day it was not in existence, the next day it was. That is all. He must have been working in secret a long time before that, though, Li Ying. Because Clint said that his band was like a closed corporation from the very beginning. Clint called him a genius at organization. Those were his exact words. A genius, yes, a genius of crime. Sometimes I wonder, Speed, if we shall ever catch the octopus. He has evaded us for so long already that, uh, well, what is to prevent him from continuing this evasion? Clint and Barney, maybe me, I hope. Clint always told me that every criminal makes a mistake sometime or another. And I think the octopus made his first one when he kidnapped Miss Marsh's brother. Do you think he merely kidnapped him, Speed? When the octopus causes people to disappear, he generally sees to it that they never reappear. I know. But he didn't have any reason to do away with Larry Winfield, Jean. Larry was just an engineer with an oil company. He sure couldn't do the octopus any harm, but he might have been able to do him some good. That's why I think he's still alive someplace, working for the octopus against his will. And uh, what of Miss Martha? I'm not so sure about her. The octopus figured she was a nuisance. I knew too much about him on account of that map Larry sent her, describing the octopus headquarters. Half of it was so bird, though, that it hasn't been any help to us yet. Well, I sincerely hope that Clint and Barney found her aboard the flower boat. So do I. Hey, see those colored lights way ahead? Isn't that the flower boat? Why, yes, I'm sure of it. Captain! Yes, Mr. Ying? Those colored lights ahead mark our objective. Better slow your motor down as we approach it so that no one aboard the boat can be warned of our approach. Very well, Mr. Ying. And have your men ready for instant attack if necessary. Yes, sir. Be ready to board the moment we pull alongside men. Are you good, sir? Gee, Clint and Barney stopped the boat all right. I knew they would. But gee, I wonder if they're all right. I wish something had happened soon. This waiting's getting monotonous. Hey, here they come. You're getting your wish, Barney. You hey, quick. Let's get up there by the hatch steps. You bet. And I hope that guy's with him that socked me when I gave you the danger signal, Clint. I'd like to return that sock with interest. Yeah, well, here we are. Now, quiet now. Turn on the light. Oh, well, I'll be. I didn't know there was a light in the place, and here we are lit up like a Christmas tree. Ah, the secret police are ready to welcome us, eh? It's best not to move. My men have you covered. What do we do, Clint? Uh, follow Hop toward his advice, Bob. Very good advice, Clint Barlow. Even though you are playing for time by this gesture, it will do you no good. The only reason you are alive now is because the octopus wishes a last word with you. <laughs> The, the octopus? Is he on this boat? Oh, no. No. He will speak to you over his high-frequency set. Over here. Another short wave set. How come we missed it? It would have done you no good had you found it, Dunlap. This set works only for friends of the octopus gang. Are we really going to hear that rat's voice? Yes, Bob. He uses his short wave a good deal. I say he does. The octopus is the worst static on the air. Hear that? That's his theme song. You make fun of master? Why not, Hopping Toy? What have I got to lose? Very true, Barney. What have you got to lose now? <laughs> Go on, laugh, you old devilfish. But someday you'll laugh out of the other side of your eight faces, octopus. If you're trying to be funny, Dunlap, this is hardly the place. I agree with you there, but your pal Hop Toy here has kept us from going any other place. Very neatly done, Hop Toy. Thank you, Master. It was not very hard. These secret police are stupid. Don't underrate them, Hop Toy. Ordinarily, they are not stupid. Only when their chivalry comes to the fore do they make mistakes. What have you done with Miss Winfield? Miss Winfield's fate can be of no possible interest to you, Barlow, since you can do nothing to remedy it. However, Gilmore saw her going ashore. She was in that large box. You devil. Steady, steady, Bob. This is our first meeting, Gilmore, and our last. But you knew of my reputation. You should have known better than to meddle in my affairs. And uh, you, Clint... As long as you're going to end my interference, Octopus, why aren't you man enough to meet me face to face? 
Why must you always hide behind the loudspeaker of a short wave set? I am not hiding, Barlow. But why should I put myself out to bid you a last farewell? It's simply to show me that somewhere in you is a slight, very slight amount of courage. And I see that you can't face me or anyone else, because you have no courage. You're yellow, Octopus. Yellow clean through. You and every man in your organization. You're working in secret, in the dark, ugly, crawling things, afraid of their life. But someday, Octopus, you're going to overreach yourself. Maybe I won't be the man to end your career, but someone else will. Someday the white, hot light of public opinion is going to seek you out and blast you and all your criminals into oblivion. Silence, everyone. You have gone too far, Barlow. Too far to ever return. Octoy. Yes, master. Waste no more time. Place these men in the boxes, weigh them with nails, and sink them in the Siang River. Now. Yes, master. We can't do this, Josh. Let me at that loudspeaker. Better than that. Let's take this gang. Do your best, fellas. We may go down, but we'll go down fighting. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, acting on a hunch, is traveling in a fast police launch up the Seong River. His goal is a flower boat which the octopus used to smuggle Marsha Winfield away from Hong Kong. Clint Barlow and Barney Dunlap pursued the boat in a bullet monoplane and, with the assistance of a new friend, Bob Gilmore, stopped the boat and boarded it for the search. While they were below searching the cargo, Marsha and the opium were taken ashore and now Clint, Barney, and Bob are prisoners and about to be thrown into the Seong River. The octopus has just given the order over his short wave set for his men to proceed, and we find the boys Come fighting on. for their lives. Oh, 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 take that! Oh, oh, and that! Oh, and that! Oh, 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 I know, Clint, and I saw the guy that hit him. I'll fix him! Stop the barbarian! Find them! He's calling us barbarians! Let me at it! Oh! Hey, Barney! Bob, you are but one fighting against all of us, Clint Morrow. Do you surrender? Oh, must we beat you down, too? Come and get me if you can. Uh, stop, Troy. Stop, Troy. What is it? The police are boarding the boat. They came while everyone was what? down here. Police. police. Everyone. Everyone on deck. Police are here. We must fight them off. Go. 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 How'd the police get here? The nick of time, too. I guess my luck is still holding good. Now to get Barney and Bob on their feet. Hey, Barney. Barney! Uh, Barney, come on, snap out of it! Uh, oh, oh. oh, so you want to fight, huh? I'll show you! Ow! Big ox, you! What's the idea? Clint! Yes, Clint! 
I managed to hold off a mob of smugglers, and you have to sock me. <laughs> That's a good... Hey, hey, what's happened? Oh, you finally remembered what you were doing, huh? Where's Hop Toy and his gang? Where's Bob? You hear the battle sounds? That's Hop Toy and his men fighting the police. Bob got cold. Come on, let's try to bring him around. The police? How'd they get here? How should I know? Hey, hey, who's that? Are you all right? Yeah, where did you come from, kid? Up the river with Lee Ying and a police launch. Oh, how did you know we were in a jam, Speed? I didn't know, Clint. But I had a hunch that you'd run into trouble, just the two of you. Three of us. The other one's on the floor. And did we run into trouble? Is that Bob Gilmore on the floor? The fellow you told me about over the short wave set? That's right, Speed. Where's Lee Ying? Up on deck with the captain and the flower boat. The police were getting the best of things when I came down here. We sure surprised them. <laughs> you have a habit of surprising people, Speed. Even me. Didn't I do the right thing, Clint? Considering that we'd have been at the bottom of the Siang River if you hadn't come when you did... I should say you did do the right thing, kid. Uh, from our standpoint, yes, but you ran a terrible risk coming in here, Speed. It was worth any risk to get you and Barney out of trouble, Clint. Couldn't let the secret police lose his best man. I've said before and I'll say again that I'm beginning to think you're the best man of us, kid. But come on, let's try to wake up Bob and then go up on deck with Lee Yang. Yeah, all right. Hey, Bob. Bob, come on, wake up. Gee. I wonder what a guy like him is doing 200 miles up the Seong River. Uh, Bob's an engineer, Speed. Larry Winfield was his best friend. What? Does he know where Larry is now? No, but he may help us locate him. Oh, He's cool. coming around now. Oh. He was hit hard. Yeah. It, come on, Bob. It's Clint, Bob. Everything's okay. Oh, Clint? Yeah. The police, headed by my nephew here, came in the nick of time. We won't explore the bottom of the Seong after all. Oh, swell. Ooh, ooh my jaw. What hit me, anyhow? A little guy. Couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. These smugglers sure pack a wallop. So you're Speed Gibson. I guess I don't have to tell you that I'm glad you came when you did, Speed. Thanks, Mr. Gilmore. You helped Clint and Barney plenty, too. Oh, I just towed them to the bank of the river, Speed, but Hop Toy was going to sink us to the bottom. Is that what he was going to do? Uh, yeah, in boxes. Waited for some of these nails you see around you. Gosh, that that's terrible. Everything all right, Speed? Yes, Lei Ying. Come on down. They were down here just like Hop Toy said they'd be. Did that hopping toy tell you we was down here? He did after Li Ying hit him. Well, my good friend, how glad I am that yeah, you are. Yeah, go on, say it, that we're still alive. Ying, this is Bob Gilmore. Oh, Hop glad uh, Li Ying is a tea merchant in Hong Kong, Bob. I told him to keep an eye on Speed while we were away. That is so, Mr. Gilmore. Speed likes my tea room, though he generally drinks milk instead of tea. What's happening up on deck, Ying? The uh, very capable police captain and his men have subdued the crew and the Captain Hop Toy, Barney. They are uh, awaiting word from you as to what you wish done with the prisoners. Yeah, might as well take them back to Hong Kong in the same boat they left on. That'll take care of the passengers, too. Yeah, I'll bet they're scared to death. Go out on a pleasure ship and come back on a battleship. <laughs> hey, don't you think that's funny? Uh, no. I must be losing my wit. Well, what are you going to do, Clint? Uh, I'm going to lay over with Bob here, if I may, Bob, until we can patch up the plane enough to fly her back to Hong Kong. You bet you can, Clint. I'm only too happy to have the company. And I'll see that the plane is repaired in no time. That's right. It'll have to be fast so as we can get back and see what the octopus is up to. Can I stay with you, Clint? Uh, I don't see how, Speed. The plane only carries two passengers, you know. That's right, kid. We managed to get one of the reserve gas tanks shot full of holes. But we ain't taken it clean out yet and replaced it with a seat for you. Why don't we? Yeah, well, huh? Well, as long as we're working on the plane anyhow, why can't we put in another passenger compartment at the same time? Won't take any longer, I'll guarantee that. Then Speed can stay on with you fellas. Golly, that'd be swell. Can I, Clint? Mm, well, I just heard Speed. Getting so I'm afraid to let you out of my sight. Way great! Will you have further need of my services, Clint? Uh, no, no, thank you, Lee. Then uh, I will return to Hong Kong on the police launch. My uh, business may suffer if I'm away from it too long. Uh, yes, I understand. And thank you for your aid. I'll get in touch with you when we return to Hong Kong. You bet. How are you feeling now, Bob? Think you can navigate those steps up to the deck? Sure, Barney. And I think the quicker we get to my house and have some food, the better off we'll all feel. Mm -hmm. Is there somewhere near where I can cable my chief, Bob? Yes, there is. Oh, good. Well, let's get up on deck then and get the formalities over with. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm plenty hungry. <laughs> Well, 
Boy and man, I've eaten many a meal, but the one you just cooked up for us beats them all, Bob. <laughs> excitement certainly doesn't curb your appetite, Barney. Say, if I let excitement ruin my appetite, I'd starve to death. Well, as long as you enjoyed the meal so much, Barney, uh, you can do the dishes. Yeah. Who, me? Why, didn't you guys enjoy it, too? <laughs> <laughs> I saw we did, Barney. Clint's only kidding. Oh, uh, maybe you'd like to do them, Speed. Well, <laughs> don't worry, Speed. Nobody's going to do them. I'll just pull the whole table into the kitchen and let my houseboy worry about the dishes in the morning. Have you a houseboy, Bob? Well, three times a week. Wages are very low in China for native servants, you know. Men of reasonable means could easily afford two or three. Gee. I only have one come in three times a week because I'm in and out so much that I don't need a full-time servant. Then, two of late, my means aren't even reasonable. Having a tough time, Bob? Well, sort of. People don't seem to have much use for engineers lately. Afraid of war, too busy building destructive things instead of constructive. Yeah, the dopes. Maybe they'll all get smart someday and learn to get along with one another. If they don't, there won't be anybody for anybody to get along with. Uh, is he uh, standing on a soapbox speed? No, oh, I don't see one, Clint. Hmm, I'm uh, not being kidded by any chance, am I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're all right, Barney. We can't set the world straight tonight. Now, right now, I'd like to figure out a way of working Bob into our organization if we can. Could we, Clint? That'd be great. Oh, it'd be more than great. I can't think of any job I'd like better, Clint, particularly since Marsha's involved. I won't rest until I've found her I think I'd have a better chance of finding her through your organization than if I went alone. And how? You never stand a chance against the Octopus Gang alone, Bob. Look at the trouble the secret police is having, and we're a world organization. Well, see, Bob, uh, how long did you know Larry Winfield? Uh, where'd you meet him? I knew him about a year, Clint. Met him in Hong Kong right after I landed. I came to China full of enthusiasm. I'd been told that the country was wide open for engineers... That China was at last awakening from her long sleep and was anxious to progress along modern lines as fast as possible. It sounded great, but after I got here, I had to add a lot more than a grain of salt. Couldn't you find a job, Bob? Yes, I could find jobs, all right, but they weren't good jobs. I mean, they'd ask me to draw up a set of plans that were impossible, and me, fresh out of engineering school, would always tell them that they were impossible. So the job would fall through. Ah, a good day to day in that case kept the paycheck away, huh? Yes, because less scrupulous engineers were snapping up such contracts, and the backers paid good money to learn their mistakes. Uh, one night, when I was particularly low, I met Larry Winfield. Started talking, learned we were in the same game, and, well, it wasn't long before I told him everything. Well, if Larry was anything like Marcia, I can understand that. I'll say so. This Mars is just about the most understanding person I've ever met. Uh, Larry Winfield was one of the best. He had the very soul of honor. Wouldn't touch a crooked deal with a ten-foot pole. And he was all enthusiasm about his job with the Merritt Oil Company. The Merritt? Yes. Funny me remembering that name. I thought I'd forgotten it. Larry told me about their plan to survey Tibet and was going to try and take me along as his assistant. Meanwhile, he found me a job with another company, which was to keep me going until the expedition started for Tibet. We became great pals. He told me a lot about his sister, Marcia. And then one day... The octopus. Hey, that radio isn't on, is it, Bob? I didn't think it was. Bob Gilmore, you escaped me once. I see now it was a pity. Your future good health depends on you. Or I should say, on your very bad memory. You can't frighten me, octopus. Perhaps not now, when you are seated with the secret police. But you have had a narrow escape today, Gilmore. If you continue your story about Lawrence Winfield, I shall strike again. And next time, you will not escape. It's bluff, Bob. Don't let that big devil fish scare you. He failed today, he'll fail again. Yes, Clint, I failed, thanks to Speed Gibson. But remember this. The more you seek Marsha Winfield, the further away she shall be from you. Bob Gilmore... This girl's life depends on your bad memory. Think well before you speak again. <laughs>
Thompson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. In the previous episode, you remember, though the flower boat which was smuggling Marsha Winfield away from her friends was searched by Clinton Barney, no trace of the girl could be found. Instead, the two members of the secret police almost lost their lives, but Speed Gibson arrived in time to prevent this. After the crew and members of the octopus have been arrested and started back to Hong Kong under the supervision of Lee Ying, the Hong Kong operator of the International Secret Police, Speed, Clint, and Barney go to the house of Bob Gilmore, who shared the adventure on the flower boat. He has already told them that Marsha's brother, Larry, was his best friend, and is about to go into more detail when the voice of the octopus comes in over his short wave set, warning Bob to be silent, to forget what he knows about Larry Winfield, that Marsha's life depends on his bad memory. This silences Bob, and the boys begin to wonder if he can help them after all. Gee, Bob, the octopus gives warnings like that all the time. We don't pay any attention to him anymore. Nah, talk's cheap. Only time I start worrying about the octopus is when he goes into action. But, Barney, that girl's life depends on me now. If it was just my life, I wouldn't hesitate. But now, oh, I don't know what to do. Now, listen, Bob, I was up against the same thing a while ago when Marsha first disappeared. The octopus told me the same thing he told you. That I'd never see her again if I continued the search for him. You mean he's holding her as a hostage? Yes, and Marsha's fate is determined this minute whether you tell us what you know or not. Uh, but before I go any further, are you sure that short wave set is dead now? Yes, I checked it thoroughly after the octopus signed off. It was open before. Must have forgotten to turn it off when the flower boat came into sight. All the excitement and so forth. Yeah, that so forth business almost sank us. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the octopus knew what he was going to do with Marsha before he ordered his men to kidnap her. All his activities are carefully planned ahead of time. Of course, he was ready for a last-minute emergency. Like taking Miss Martian, the cargo of opium, off the flower boat, while you, Barney, and Bob are below with the captain, Clint? Yes, you see, his men are well-trained. They have orders and counter-orders, just in case the first plan falls through. Now, the only way we can hope to trace Marsha is to learn more of the background of the whole case. And uh, that's where you come in, Bob. By telling us everything you know of her brother. But there's little more to tell you than what I've already told you, Clint. All right, go ahead, Bob. Well, as I was saying, Larry got me a position with another company, but all the while he was talking me up to Mr. Merritt, president of the oil company he was working for, telling him that I was the man he wanted as his assistant on the Tibet expedition. Yeah, Miss Marsha said he was all excited about his job. He was, Speed. But that was his nature, enthusiastic about everything. That's why I noticed the change so much. What change? One evening, I had dinner with him and planned to meet him at his office next morning. He had some sort of a date that night at a private nightclub in Hong Kong that he was looking forward to. Wanted me to join him, but I couldn't afford it and wouldn't allow Larry to stand for my share. He was generous to a fault and... Uh... Uh, go on, Bob. Well, when I saw him the next day, I, I hardly knew him. He seemed dazed, under a spell. I asked him what sort of a time he'd had the night before, and, and he stared at me. Seemed about to speak and then shook his head. He wouldn't tell me anything, but from that day on, Larry Winfield was a changed man. He seemed to be living in a shadow, in dread of some impending doom. He tried to win his confidence, but it was in vain. He began avoiding me, and at last I had a brief note from him saying that he was going on a journey, and that's the last I ever heard from him. Now, I see. Uh, when did the Merritt Oil Company close its doors? About a month after that. Is Mr. Merritt still in China? No, I believe he went to England. His home was there. Gee, that doesn't help as much, does it, Clint? No, and yet Bob's information must contain some clue to Larry's whereabouts. Some tiny key that might unlock the whole mystery. Else, why did the octopus bother to warn him to keep silent? That's right. Oh, gosh, I'm tired. 
Me too, Barney. Oh, this has been a pretty strenuous day for all of us. I think we've accomplished as much as we can tonight. How about calling it a day, huh, and getting some sleep? Fine with me, Clint. I can't offer you anything better than cots, but I don't think they'll interfere with your sleep. Say, Bob, nothing could interfere with my sleep. Not even if I was to hang from a tree by my toes. <laughs> oh, good night, all. Good night, all. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Bob, you're a magician, fixing up our plane like this in no time at all, ripping out one of them gas tanks and fixing up another passenger seat. <laughs> it's pretty rough work, Barney, but it'll hold together until you get it back to Hong Kong for the finishing touches. Gee, it's swell that I can fly with Clint and Barney now. Well, I don't know if it is or not. But you get into more trouble when you're not with me than when you're with me, Speed. <laughs> oh, I guess it's all right. Oh, have you checked our short wave set yet, Bob? Yes, yeah, working all right this morning. Can't find anything wrong. Hmm? That's funny. I'll say. We couldn't raise a thing on it in the air. That is nothing but the octopus. I wish I had his evident knowledge of high-frequency sets. He seems to be able to do anything he wants with the wave bands. Has anybody seen the monkey wrench? Oh, the, the houseboy borrowed it. Remember? Want me to go get it, Barney? Yeah, would you mind? Not at all. I'll be right back. What do you want with a monkey wrench, Barney? Nothing. I just wanted to get rid of Bob for a few minutes so we could talk. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is the first chance we've had to discuss the idea of swearing Bob in as a member of the secret police. Will you have to do that, Clint? Well, if he's to work with us at all, yes, Speed. As you know, I cabled Chief Riley the latest developments in the case last night. And also asked him to send me all possible details concerning Bob Gilmore. Did you get an answer? Yes, I did. That was that little stroll I took this morning. Uh, Chief Riley cabled that Gilmore's reputation was okay when he left the United States. The particulars tallied with Bob's story in every detail. Then you'll swear him in, Clint? Yes, the chief told me to do as I saw fit. And I think we're going to need a man like Gilmore before we're through with this case. That's all I wanted to know. Then we won't have to make double talk about Lee Ying being a tea merchant and so on. We can read him the cards as they fall. Yes. Will he come to Hong Kong then, Clint? No, not immediately. Bob may be of more service to us up here on the river than in Hong Kong. If he goes on as before, to all appearances, a young engineer, taking whatever work may come his way, he may hear something. But all the time, he can be working on a new plan of mine. What new plan? A survey of Tibet. Tibet? Then we're really going there? Uh, I don't know, Speed. But I want a good lay of the land in case we need it in a hurry. You mean we're going to Tibet after Larry Winfield? No, no, I'm not sure that we'll go there at all, Barney. But if the trail gets too hot, the octopus may leave Hong Kong. And I've got a hunch he has another hideout somewhere in Tibet. Well, now, let's see. Are we all through here? For the time being. Well, all right, then. Let's go up to the house, then, and swear Bob into the secret police. Are you sure he's all right, Clint? Huh? Why, of course he's all right. After all he's done, I don't see how you could possibly be suspicious of him. Besides, we have Chief Riley's okay, too. Don't forget that. Bob? Bob, where are you? Here I am, Pete. Still looking for the monkey wrench. My house boy has disappeared, and so is the wrench. Let that go, Bob. We got something more important for you. Yeah? What is it? Anything happened to the plane while I was gone? No, she's as good as new now. In a little while, we'll take off and stop bothering you. Oh, gee, it's been no bother, Barney. I'll be darn sorry to see you fellas leave. It's been a breath of home knowing you. <laughs> we'll keep in touch with you, Bob, because you're going to join our organization. Well, that is, if you wish. You mean... Join the secret police? That's right. Then I'll swear you in right now if you want, Bob. If I want? You know what this means to me. Sure, we know, buddy. And it's going to be the sort of work you like best, too. Engineering. <laughs> uh, suppose we swear Bob in uh, before telling him all, huh, Barney? Well, all right, go ahead. All uh, right. Uh, raise your right hand, Bob. Okay. And listen carefully. If you want to change your mind after hearing the oath, well, that's your privilege. I'm ready, Clint. Go ahead. Do you... Bob Gilmore, as a member of the International Secret Police, promise to obey and protect law and order in your own country or wherever else your duties may carry you? Will you cooperate with the foreign police after you have fulfilled your mission? And will you, above all else, recognize the code of the secret police? Courage, honor, and silence. And not betray it in any manner whatsoever. I promise. 
Congratulations, Bob. We got you into trouble already, Bob, so we thought you might as well have the name as well as play the game. See, this is one of the biggest moments of my life, fellas. What do I do first? Well, first, you will memorize this copy of our secret police code. And after you have it memorized, destroy the copy. I'm to stay here, then? Yes. After I return to Hong Kong, I'll wire you further instructions uh, in code. And that's why it's important that you memorize the code key. Uh, what about my short wave set? Well, the octopus will probably be listening to everything you send or receive over your set, Bob. He may suspect the wires, but he'll not be able to decipher them. Our code is the one thing we've kept from him. You've tried to get it often enough. You'll have to be extra careful, Bob. Don't let anyone know that you're in the secret police. Because after you do, the octopus will do anything to get rid of you. Yeah, and he kind of has it in for you now. <laughs> Don't worry about me. This is the sort of thing I like. I've been in plenty of tough scrapes before and have always managed to squeeze out of them. Oh, say, Bob. Yes? In the secret police work, sometimes too much courage is worse than too little. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, don't be too willing to die for the service. You will be able to help it more by continuing to live. In plain words, he means don't take unnecessary chances, Bob. Well, I understand. You'll have plenty to do, Bob, when Clint sends you instructions about surveying Tibet. Tibet? Yes, do you remember anything of Larry Winfield's work along this line? No, he stayed more to generalities. In fact, things were too much in the formative stage to have any detailed data. That was to have come later. Dr. Kingsley could help us out a lot on Tibet, couldn't he, Clint? Yes, and Li Ying, too. Oh, see, by the way, Bob, Li Ying is not only a tea merchant, but our Far East operator as well. No. Say, I don't see how the octopus is going to stand a chance against your organization, Clint. There are secret police everywhere. And there are octopus guys everywhere, too. Don't forget that. I'll say, for all we know, there may be some on that river out there right now. Hey, isn't that your houseboy down by our plane, Bob? Down by the plane... It is. What's he doing down there? Say, he's got a monkey wrench in his hand. The one we was looking for. Clint, he's going to wreck the controls. Quick, let's get down there and stop him. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. previous episode, Clint Barlow swore Bob Gilmore into the International Secret Police prior to his departure in the bullet monoplane to Hong Kong. As Speed, Clint, and Barney are talking over future plans with Bob, Speed notices the missing houseboy down by their plane with a monkey wrench, evidently about to wreck the controls. Thinking him to be another member of the octopus gang, intent on delaying their progress, they all race down to the landing. We find them with Yen, the houseboy, who, seeing their approach, sought to escape, but he is now fast in the clutches of Barney. 
You will if you keep on shaking him like that, Barney. Hold him still long enough so we can question him, will you? Oh, please, Mr. Gilmore. This is very crazy. I do nothing. Why do you all appear so sudden in great excitement? What are you doing down here at the plane, Yen? Why, I come to bring back Monkey's wrench. Remember, please, you borrow him to me. You borrowed it, but uh, why were you monkeying around those controls? Oh, I like a uh, ship that a uh, flap flap. I interested in in on. What's he talking about anyhow? <laughs> he likes planes, Steve, and is interested in their inner workings. Oh, so, so. oh, let him go, Barney. I think we've wronged Jen. Wronged him? This guy was going to wreck our plane. Oh no, he wasn't. <laughs> we saw him leaning over the cockpit with a wrench and suspicious from past experiences. Took it for granted that he was an octopus gangster. Me? Octopus devilfish? No, 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 no. Yen, the good boy. Octopus bad, very bad, very bad. He's very bad. Yeah, and I still ain't sure that this Yen wasn't up to something. No, I've looked the plane over, Barney. Everything's the same. (laughs) We've got to be more careful of accusing innocent people of being in the octopus gang. I'd rather accuse the wrong guy than pass up a guilty one. Then it'd be too late to do any accusing. I don't blame you, Barney. After going through that experience in the flower boat, I mistrust almost everyone, even poor Yan. He's been with me ever since I came up to Siang. And when I saw him at the plane, even I thought he was guilty. Oh, oh Mr. Gilmore, Yan, your houseboy, your friend, he never do anything against you. Okay, Yan. And now that the excitement is over, you might give me that monkey wrench. Oh, so, yes, yes, here it are. I never use monkey's wrench again. Next time, you borrow to me screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> everything set for the takeoff, Clint? <laughs> yes, Bob saw to it that we had plenty of gasoline and everything else is attended here. There's no reason in the world why we can't take off right now. Well, but don't you think we ought to let Dr. Kingsley know we're coming? Yes, I'll do that just before we take off. And now, let's go back and get our belongings, huh? I'm anxious to return to Hong Kong to see if anything new has developed there. Oh, hello, Jean, darling. Well, I'm not much company for you, am I? Staying here with a short wave set in case anything comes in from Speed to Clint. Hmm? Oh, I don't mind. But I wish they'd come back. Ever since the octopus took Marsha away, I'm afraid for everybody. I should never have sent for you and Marsha, Jean. We were far safer in Honolulu. Oh, no, Daddy. I'm glad I'm here. Because I want to help you all capture the octopus if I can. What's that you're working on now? That's the copy of Marsha's map that Clint made. I've been trying to figure out the names of the streets that have been blotted out, but I'm not any further with it than I was when I first started. Can you make out any of the names at all? Very few. I believe they're down to the Bund. The what, Daddy? The Bund, the waterfront. But I'm not even certain of those because Winfield translated most of the names into English. And, of course, he may have given the wrong translation. Can the secret police search the waterfront, then? Just in case Mr. Winfield was right? Not unless they have a point to start from, Jean. The Hong Kong waterfront is a puzzle that uh, no one has been able to solve, to my knowledge. Then you might as well throw the map away for all the good it's doing. No, there's one indication here that may help us. I'm going to work on that a little while longer. I'm going to compare it with these city maps, and if there's any similarity at all, then we may have a starting point to work on. Well, Bob, so long until I see you again. So long, Speed, and happy landing. You said it. I hope it'll be happier than our last one on the Siang, a dead stick landing. (laughs) I don't think we'll have an octopus plane after us on the return flight, Bonnie. At least I hope not. Well, I'll keep in touch with you, Bob. And remember, memorize that code and then destroy the key. You bet I will. And I won't forget any of your other instructions. If I hear anything up here, I'll let you know immediately. That's right. Either at KVMC, the doctor's wave band, or IS-56 at Lee Ying. And you know the flight call, OC-34. Yes, I have all that data. And always be careful what you give out over the air, Bob, because more than likely the octopus is lurking in a killer cycle listening to every word you say. <laughs> I'll remember, Barney. <laughs> oh, goodbye, then, and be careful. I will, Clint. Who's going to fly back? I will, Barney. I'll give you a rest. You can take care of the short wave set in case any messages come in. Suits me. Go ahead, Speed. You get in first. Walk along the tail and don't fall in. I won't. Lucky I wore my sneakers or I might fall in at that. The tail's pretty small and slippery. Okay, I'm in. All right, go ahead, Barney. Sit up with Speed. I'll take the controls in the single cockpit. Okay. So long, Barney. So long, Barney. 
Good thing that plane has dual controls, Flint. You can switch without any trouble. Yes, working on the plane as you have, you know what sort of enemy we're up against, Bob. The octopus must have several planes like this. If we could only find his secret hangar, we could at least end his air activities for the time being. Where do you think he buys these planes? I don't think he does. He must build them. Otherwise, if he purchased them from a manufacturer or from some government, they'd be bound to attract notice. They're so modern and powerful. The octopus has highly skilled labor at his command, as well as killers and kidnappers. Okay, come ahead, Clint. Uh, goodbye. Good luck, Bob. Same to you, Clint. Say, Speed, would you mind giving me a little room? Oh, I'm sorry, Barney. I didn't notice I was crowding you. I know. You get in a plane and forget everything else. Can I fight for a little while, Barney? Don't know. That's up to Clint. Well, we're in the air before bothering him, though. We haven't given this crate a test flight since Bob patched it up. Looks all right, and motors sound pretty, but you never can tell. Okay. Everybody set for a takeoff? You bet. Give her the gun, Clint. Here's your helmet speed. Thanks. Look out for that sampan ahead, Clint. Yeah, who's flying this plane? Okay, but if you crack up, don't say I didn't tell you so. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 center balance, Barney? No, Bob saw to that. Your weight's about the same as that reserve gasoline tank was when full. Clint made a good takeoff. And just in time, another minute and Clint would have turned that sampan into a junk. <laughs> See, that's pretty good. <laughs> Did you hear that, Clint? Hear what? The joke I just cracked. No, thank heaven. How do you like that? Oh, you know, Clint never likes to talk much when he's at the controls, Barney. I wasn't asking him to talk, just to listen. Did you think that joke was funny? What joke? I give up. <laughs> what joke? <laughs> I'm sorry, Barney, but I really didn't hear what you were saying. I'm so interested in what's below us. You know, the sea on river looks a lot different from the air than it does from a boat. I wouldn't know. We flew down here in a dogfight above the clouds. All I saw was a lot of sky and machine gun bullets. Gee, tell me more about that fight, Barney. Nothing much to tell except what you already know, kid. Golly, I wish I'd been along. You wish you'd... Uh, there's one thing you've got to learn, kid, and that's to know when you're well off. Oh, I know that, Barney. Say! Now what? And, and don't grab me like that. My nerves is all on edge since we was almost dumped into the Siang River. We forgot to let Dr. Kingsley know we were on our way back. So we did. But there's nothing to stop us talking to him now. I'll bring him through. Okay. This river has a lot of landings, hasn't it? I'd give anything to know where they have taken Miss Marcia. So would I, kid. But we'll have to be patient about her. Not a chance in the world of finding her by trailing her blind. Barney. Yeah? Do you think the octopus will hurt her? You want it straight, kid? Yeah. I'm in the secret police. I want to face back. Well, if it was any other girl, I'd say she didn't have a chance. The octopus ain't tender with the people he wants to get rid of. You know that. I know. But Marsh is different. She's got looks. And she's got brains. Plenty of brains. Between the two, she may be able to stall the octopus. Play for time. And if she can just play for enough time, we'll catch up with her. We're bound to. Yes, yeah, the only can. Hold everything. The set's hot. Flight station OC34 calling KVMC. OC34 calling KVMC. Standing by. Come in, please. One of Dr. Kingsley's by his set. Dollars to donuts he is. After the last talk I had with him, telling about you coming up here and rescuing us from the octopus gang, he said he'd stay by his set until he saw us walk in the door again. Station OC34, KVMC answering OC34. Stand by for two-way broadcast. Okay, Doc, we're ready. Barney? Yep. How's tricks? Thank heaven, I finally contacted you. I just tried to reach you at Gilmore Station, AKOFF. I couldn't raise anyone. He was down seeing us take off. That's why you couldn't get him. We 
You on your way back here to Hong Kong? You bet. I've seen enough of the Siang River to last me for a good long while. Why? Well, I've been studying that map very carefully. Why's his map? I mean, the copy Clint made of it? Pipe down and listen, kid. Hold everything a minute, doctor. Clint! Are your earphones adjusted? Are you listening to this? Yes. Tell the doctor to be careful what he says over the air. Honey, I think I've faced the point of operation in regard to the octopus's headquarters. See, tell him to wait until we get there, Barney. He's forgotten the octopus may be listening. Wait a minute, Doc. No, 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 you must listen. One passage to his headquarters had its beginning at the Siang and... Doc. Dr. Kingsley, are you there? What's wrong? He doesn't answer. Barney, you think the octopus got to him? He just said Siang and that's all. Siang what? That's what I aim to find out. Rev up your airspeed, Clint. We may be in time to save the doctor. We've got to get to him in time. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Clint and Barney, after effecting the arrest of the smugglers aboard the flower boat and swearing in a new member of the secret police, Bob Gilmore, are flying back to Hong Kong hoping to find some trace of the missing Marsha Winfield. Barney contacts Dr. Kingsley on the short wave set, and the doctor tells him that he has been working on the copy of the map that Marsha had concerning the octopus headquarters, and that he found a focal point. He mentions the name Siang, and then all is silence. The boys, fearing for his safety, hurry on to Hong Kong. We find them breathlessly entering the doctor's home. Dr. Kingsley, are you all right? I certainly am, Speed, but I should be asking you boys that question after what you've been through. Never mind about us. What happened when you were talking to me over the short wave, Doc? Sounded like you was choked off. I was cut off, Bonnie. I didn't know it until I asked you for a reply and none came. Then I found that I'd lost contact with your flight station. I see you took the precautions of calling in a police guard, Doctor. They stopped us as we came in. Well, yes. With Gene in the house, I wasn't going to take any chances. The set went dead. I took it for granted that the octopus had tuned in, and after silencing me on the air, well, might try to silence me in person. You were smart to call the police, Doc. We tried to stop you from saying too much over the short wave, but it was no use. Oh, I should have known better, but I was so happy over finding even the slightest clue as to the octopus's whereabouts that I... Well, I couldn't wait for you to get here to tell you about it. See, Clint and Barney, I'm so glad you're back. Hi, Jean. We're glad to be back, too. You bet. Tried to bring you a piece of cloud, Jean, but it melted on the way. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds good to hear Jean laugh again. You know, she's been a very serious little girl while you boys were away. Yes, and uh, particularly after Speed left. Well, sorry I worried you, Dr. Kingsley, but I had to do something when we didn't hear anything more from Clint and Barney. 
So I went to one of the operators here and talked him into going up to Siong in a police launch to help them out. And lucky for us, he came, Doctor. If it hadn't have been for Speed's hunch that we were in trouble, we'd be at the bottom of the Siong by now and Bob Gilmore along with us. Oh, how terrible. Oh, shucks, Jane. Nothing terrible now. We got out of that jam all right. Now we're looking for another to get into. Well, all right now. Enough of our adventures for the time being. Oh, uh, what did you find in the map, Doctor? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, come into my study, boys. Can we dump our jackets and helmets anywhere, Doc? I'll take them, Barney. I'll give them to the houseboy. Thanks, Jane. We didn't take time to stop off at the hotel on the way. We was in such a hurry to uh, get here. Oh, here we are. I'll just shut this door so we can be assured of privacy. Now, uh, <clears throat> here's the map over here. You keep it on your desk like this, Dr. Kingsley? Well, while I'm working on it, yes, Speed. That's kind of dangerous. Anybody could come in here and pick it up. Mm, that's true. I'll be more careful after this. In fact, I'm going to give it to Clint just as soon as we finish this discussion. I don't want the responsibility of it now that we have a real clue. Tell us about it, Doc. You see this line here? Mm, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, now, as near as I can make out, by comparing the general layout with city maps of Hong Kong, this area here is the bun. You see, that's the waterfront. Thus, this line has its beginning there. Mm, the waterfront. Eh? Mm, yeah, of course, that's a lot of territory to cover, I know, Pat. But here is the dock where the ferry boats land from Kowloon. What's Kowloon, Doctor? Well, that's where the large liners land speed. They're too big to land the passengers right at Hong Kong, so they are transferred the ferries at Kowloon and then brought to this landing where my, my pencil is pointing. That map you have is a true map of the Hong Kong waterfront, Doc? The best I've seen, Bonnie. Uh-huh. Now, let's compare it with the one Larry Winfield sent Marsha. Hmm, it's the same general formation, all right. Allowing for the part that blurred. Mm -hmm, that's what I thought. If that's the case, then the ferry dock should be about here on Winfield's map. That would bring this line I spoke of down near the mouth of the Siang River. Siang River? Oh, then you mean... Oh, I'm very sure, Clint. You see, that's the passage to the octopus's headquarters begins somewhere on or near the Siang Dock. Wanu. Yes, Master? Come in. Come in. I've had bad news. Master, what is wrong? You are upset. That is why I brought you back from your little journey, Kwan Wu. I am upset. Clint Barlow is working too fast. But you tricked him, Master. You were successful in getting the Winfield girl aboard the flower boat. Yes, but the flower boat failed to get her to Hung Chow. What? How so? Barlow and Dunlap flew after it and stopped it, after eluding one of my pursuit planes and searched it. Hop Toy, the captain, had orders to get rid of the girl and the opium should such an emergency arise. He did so by taking it over the side while Barlow was searching below. Then they trapped Barlow, Dunlap, and a new enemy, Bob Gilmore. Just as they were about to be sunk in the Siang, Speed Gibson arrived in a police boat. A result, every man of mine aboard the flower boat was arrested, the boat confiscated, and the secret police still alive. That is very unfortunate. But still, one flower boat is not so much to lose, and we still have the girl. That is not the worst, Kwan Wu. Dr. Kingsley has guessed the passage from the Siang Dock. I listened in on a shortwave conversation between him and the secret police in the plane. So? Yes. Barlow has made a copy of the Winfield girl's map. What is to be done? I want you to contact the good doctor. He thinks that he can aid our enemies safely without harm to himself or his daughter. Tell him, in a friendly way, that such is not the case. That you have secret information that he is to be my next victim. Can I do this without risk, master? You must. Under no conditions are you to be suspected as a member of my band. You must be to all appearances Kwan Wu, an honorable gentleman who loves China and the law. It will be difficult retaining such an appearance and at the same time warning Dr. Kingsley to be silent. Difficult but not impossible for a man of your talents, Kwan Wu. Remember, if you fail, no one will suffer but yourself. I shall do my best, master. That is better. You are the only man in my band that I can trust implicitly, Kwan Wu. You are the only one who knows who I really am. Be careful. If I should lose you, it would uh, complicate matters. And since I stand to lose even more, Master, I shall be careful. Good. And now to return to our secret police. They should have arrived at the doctors by this time. The place is guarded by Hong Kong police. 
In case they decide that the doctor is correct about this young doc, in case they decide to investigate, you know what to do should they discover the entrance to the secret passage. Yes, master. <laughs> it has been a long time since we used the passage as a trap for our enemies. Yes, and I am looking forward to the chance. All the tortures of the secret chamber do not compare with the young method of getting rid of my enemies permanently. What have you done with the Winfield girl and the opium? The opium is hidden for the time being until one of my planes can pick it up safely. The Winfield girl is hidden too, but in a native house. Does she realize where she is yet? No. My operator keeps her drugged. With the drug that wipes out all memory, all will. She does only what she is told to do. <laughs> She will not betray us. How is the drug given? In her food. It has neither taste nor odor, only effect. I have ordered her to be kept in the hut for a week, dressed in rags, so she will appear as any other woman from a distance, should she happen to wander outside. After this, if all is quiet, she shall proceed to Hung Chao as previously planned. You are running a risk keeping her this way, Master. There is another way to silence her, you know. I know, Kwan Wu. And I would have used that method first had Clint Barlow not come to China. This girl is a friend of his, a very good friend. As long as she is alive, I have a strong weapon against Barlow. If ever he corners me, Marsha Winfield shall be my means of escape. Her life or mine. That is why she is still alive. I understand, Master. And now enough of this talk. Prepare for your operations at Xiang Dok, Kwan Wu. Do you wish me to go there immediately? Yes, I will keep you informed on what I learn here. But you must be there in case Clint, Barney, and Speed pay us a surprise visit. I... Uh, <laughs> I want them to be well received at this young dock. This is a hot lead, Doc. And something like this might trip up the octopus. If you don't work fast with that guy, he uses a way and you have to begin all over again. When do you plan to go to the dock? Uh, tomorrow, around noon, Doctor. I want to see uh, Lee Ying the first thing in the morning and then have enough time to use makeup on Speed, Barney, and myself. Gee, Clint, are we going in disguise again? Uh, yes, Speed. Chinese coolies, uh, as before. Now, looking for the secret entrance to this passage isn't going to be easy, particularly since the octopus knows that we're suspicious of the location. You'll have to take plenty of time looking, pretending to be busy with something else all the time. Can I come along, Clint? Oh, no, no, Jean. The waterfront is no place for a little girl. Well, I should think not. Why, don't you know better than to ask such a thing, Jean? Well, Speed's going, Daddy. Well, Speed's a member of the secret police, honey. And handy with his fist, too, Jean. He can fight his way out of trouble. Do you think you could? Well, I guess maybe not. But I could stay out of trouble in the first place. <laughs> you can't fool around with trouble, young lady. It generally pops up whether you want it or not. And usually when you least expect it. Yeah. You stay home, Jean. And I'll tell you everything that happened when we come back. Oh. Oh, Jean. All right, Daddy. I won't say any more about it. I don't think we will either, Jean. Oh. It's getting late, and if we're going to beard the octopus in his den tomorrow, I want plenty of shut-eye tonight. You're staying at the same hotel, the Golden Lotus? Yeah, at least I guess we are. Maybe the octopus has torn it down while we was gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I meet you boys at the dock tomorrow? Well, you better not, Doctor, since we want to attract as little attention as possible. In makeup and Chinese clothes, we can browse around in places where you would be noticed. That's right, Doc. Leave the pioneer into us. Then we'll let you know the minute we find anything. Yes, we might not only need your help, but that of the Hong Kong police as well. You think you may run into another trap? Well, the octopus is certainly going to be on the lookout for us, that's sure. But whether he traps us or we trap him is entirely up to us. This is going to be a showdown. <laughs>
Speed Gibson of the International Secret Police. Dr. Kingsley, after careful study of the map that Larry Winfield sent his sister, thinks that a secret passage beginning either at or near the Siong Dock in Hong Kong Harbor leads directly into the headquarters of the octopus. Speed, Clint, and Barney plan to inspect the dock carefully, disguised as Chinese coolies. Meanwhile, the octopus, knowing of their suspicions, makes arrangements to trap them, and also tells Quan Wu to warn the doctor against giving the secret police any more information. Wu first attends to his duties at the Siong Dock, and then the following morning seeks the doctor at the consul's offices. Good morning, Dr. Kingsley. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Wu. Come right in. You sound as if you had had good news. Well, I am pleased, over it. I've been assigned a new wavelength and call letters for my amateur station. A new wavelength? May I ask why? Well, since I'm so closely allied with the International Secret Police... I thought it might simplify matters if I could be assigned call letters similar to theirs. I wrote for such permission some time ago, and this morning I received it. I'll get my new transmit up, and then instead of my old call, you can reach me at IS-78. IS-78. Dr. Kingsley, will you accept a word of advice from a good friend? Of course, Quan Wu. Then I would suggest that you have as little to do with the secret police search of the octopus as possible. But why? Everyone is anxious to rid China of this criminal and his evil activities. If I can do anything at all to aid in running him down, I'm only too happy to do so. I know your motives are purely unselfish, but there is much danger in such a search. Perhaps many lives will be lost. The octopus does not recognize rank or power, whether a man be of high station or low. If he is in his way, he is removed. Well, am I to count this as a personal warning? Oh, no. Although it may apply to you if you continue working as you are with the secret police. What have you heard, Guan Wu? Merely, merely whispers from my countrymen that you could never hear, Dr. Kingsley. Well, I appreciate your interest, Mr. Wu, but I cannot accept your advice. A member of my household, my guest, Marsha Winfield, has been kidnapped by this criminal. I'm responsible for that girl... I cannot rest until she is safe. The octopus has no heart. He is ruthless with his enemies. Be careful, Doctor, that as you find Marsha Winfield, you may lose another member of your household. Lose what other member of my household? Your little daughter, Jean. <laughs> to go to the Siang Dock. We're all made up as Chinese coolies, even to the clothes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Barney sure looks funny. He's an old Chinese man. Yeah. I don't know why I'm always the fall guy. If there's any whiskers to wear, I get them. These wispy white things tickle even more than that phony mustache I wore on the trip over here. <laughs> well, I couldn't give you many whiskers, Barney. Chinese don't have heavy beards, you know. I just gave you enough to make you look venerable. But why couldn't I be young like you guys? Well, I had to change our makeup from that other Chinese makeup we wore the other night, Barney. 
Well, maybe some of the Optimus gang might recognize us. I see there's no use arguing, so let's get going to the dock. The sooner we look the place over, the sooner I can get these whiskers off. Hey, now, wait a minute. Hold on. You can't go like that. What do you mean? You must suit your actions to match your aged face, Bonnet. Let your shoulders sag and shuffle your feet. Don't walk as if you're in the prime of health. Oh, so I got a shuffle, too, and sag, huh? <laughs> Oh, you sure surprised the octopus gang and we should happen again to a fight with them. You look real old, but your punches sure won't be. Uh, no, know it. Well, that can't be Ying. I talked to him just a little while ago. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Dr. Kingsley. Wonder if he's heard something about Miss Marcia. Pipe down. Uh, what's that? Yes? And Kwon Wu told you that, huh? Gee, wonder what he told him. Shh. Well, don't worry about that, Doctor. I think the octopus is trying another bluff. Uh, well, just keep Jean in the house and she'll be all right. Uh, what's that? Well, if you have nothing pressing to attend to, it might be just as well to go to your home. Just warn your police guard and watch for all suspicious characters. Oh, yes, we were just about to start for the dock when you called. You bet, Doctor. All right, we'll let you know the minute anything happens. Goodbye, Doctor. What did Dr. Kingsley say, Clint? Yeah, now what? Quan Wu gave the doctor a warning just a few minutes ago. Said he'd heard things. Told the doctor that he shouldn't work with us or he'd anger the octopus. How does Quan Wu know so much about it? That's exactly what I'm wondering. Of course, Wu told the doctor that he just happened to hear of this from some of his countrymen. But men in Wu's position don't just happen to hear things like that. Right. But we've got plenty to worry about without thinking about him right now. Let's get started for the Seong Dock. Maybe Dr. Kingsley was right about that secret passage to the octopus headquarters starting there. Is everything in readiness, men? Uh, Then go to the underground hangar, all of you. I shall await the secret police here in the tunnel, should they happen to stumble on it. I shall give you the signal when to start the seawater pump. And now to report to the octopus. OC-13 calling OC-127. OC-13 calling OC-127. Yes, Master. You are speaking from the tunnel shortwave station. Have you contacted Dr. Kingsley yet? Yes, Master, just before I came here. He is worried. Right after you left the consul's office, he called Clint Barlow and reported your warning to him. That will do him no good, should you decide to go through with the plan. No, even though every policeman in Hong Kong guards the doctor's home, I could send someone within its walls to do my will, and no one would know it until it was too late. What did Barlow tell him? said that he should keep Jean in the house, that the Kingsley himself should return to his home if possible, and that they were about to start for the young dock. How interesting. Are the men in their places? Yes, Master. A few are up on the dock itself, but most of them are in the underground hangar awaiting word as to when they should start the pump. Do not forget to go directly through the secret rock door in the tunnel after you know that the secret police are coming down the passage. Else you will be trapped as well as they. I shall remember, Master. And one thing more. Yes. Yes. Then you had better put it on now, just in case our enemy should gain entrance without your knowledge and surprise you. I do not want them to recognize you. Very well, Master. I shall be most careful. When they are in the tunnel, and you are through the rock door, come directly to me. I shall be awaiting you. Yes, Master. Meanwhile, I shall be awaiting the secret police. <laughs> the dock. Everything looks quiet on this young front. Here, now, now, wait just a minute. Before you mix with the people on the dock, I, I want to give you both a few last-minute instructions. Sure. Uh, Go ahead, Clint. Now, at all times, remember that you're supposed to be Chinese. Huh. Your safety and perhaps your very life depends on you never getting out of character. Okay. Now, if you find anything suspicious looking or run into any danger, give our whistle. We'll have to separate to search the dock, but in case of an actual pinch, we'd better stick together. What do you want us to go, Clint? Well, you stay with me for a little while, Speed. But, Barney, I want you to go down to the end of the dock and mix with those fishermen down there and see if you can pick up any clues. Okay, but I don't see much sense in going down there, Clint. No sort of passage could possibly begin there unless it was underwater. Now, don't decide all that until you're given it careful inspection. 
Uh, Speed and I'll stay around here and see if we can see or hear anything suspicious. Okay, I'll be seeing you. Right. And be careful. Don't worry, pal. Me, China boy. I'm, I mean, China grandpa now. <laughs> oh, Barty can't get over those whiskers. Yeah, we'd better forget them. We'll find an octopus gangster tangled up in them. Now, come on now, Speed. Let's start looking around. But remember this. Make it casual so we won't attract any undue attention. Do you think any of the octopus gangsters are on the dock, Clint? Yeah, very probably. Look, oh, we'll get near the place where Kwan Wu pushed me off the dock that night. Yes, and see that you don't tumble into that water again, Speed. Once was enough. I'll say so. But you know what, Clint? I think I'll go down that ladder to the float and look around down there. There's a runway that goes right up to the seawall on shore. Yeah, that doesn't offer us much hope, Speed. I can't tell. I don't know why there's a seawall there anyhow. There's no need for such things in Hong Kong Harbor. It must be there for some good reason, otherwise they wouldn't have built it, Speed. Maybe there was danger of the earth crumbling. More of a retaining wall than a seawall. Well, anyhow, I'm going down there to have a look, if it's all right with you, Clint. Well, I think you'll be in less danger from the octopus gang down there at that. All right, you go ahead, Speed. But don't forget to give the signal just in case you do find something suspicious. All right, Clint. So long. All right, so long, Speed. And I'll stay right around here so you won't have to look far when you come up here. Okay. There, I'm down. Might as well go to the seawall along this runway. Whoops! Almost fell in. Gee, this is hard to walk on. It's so darn narrow. Ah, oh, here's the seawall. Let's see now. It sure looks solid enough. Except this plank is a little out of line. Maybe I can fix it. Golly! It's moving! A secret opening! I found the passage to the octopus headquarters! of the International Secret Police.
While Speed, Clint, and Barney were endeavoring to learn the whereabouts of Marsha Winfield, who has been kidnapped for the criminal leader, the Octopus, Dr. Kingsley made a discovery in the blurred map that the girl's brother sent her. There is a well-defined line that may be a secret passage from the Seong Dock right into the headquarters of the Octopus. Acting on this clue, the boys go to the Seong Dock, disguised as Chinese coolies, and start a methodical search. Speed, climbing down to the runway under the pier that leads to the seawall, happens to touch a loose board in the wall, and a part of it moves to one side, revealing a dark tunnel. We find Speed greatly excited. Yeah, I bet anything that this is the secret tunnel leading to the octopus headquarters. Wonder if I ought to give the signal whistle to Clinton Barney to come down here, or if I ought to make sure it isn't a blind tunnel first. Hello, Steve. Uh, hey, hey, who are you? Clinton, only I'm Jean. Everybody else is going around disguised as something or other, so I thought I disguised myself as a little tiny boy, too. Help me down. No, oh, you stay up there. Look for Clinton Barney. I'm coming down. Help me. Oh, all right. Here. Here. <clears throat> There's a lot better. Well, I don't think so. How'd you know I was down here? And how come you recognized me? I'm in disguise. I wouldn't have known if I hadn't seen you talking with Clint and Barney. <laughs> Barney looks funny as an old man. Well, there's nothing funny about it. We're down here on dangerous business. And you shouldn't be here. I should, too. I got lonesome at home. Daddy left early this morning. I wanted to know what you all were doing, so I made myself up this way and sneaked out. Well, how'd you get past the police guards? When they saw me, they thought I was coming into the garden instead of leaving, so they chased me away. Well, that sure beats me how you tracked us here. Oh, I knew you were coming to this young dock sometime this morning, so I took a rickshaw here. Saw you climb down that ladder up at the float and start down this runway. I was standing right by the ladder when you went down. You looked at me and never knew me. Of course not in that get-up. Where'd you get the makeup? Oh, from one of the maids. Only she didn't know how I was going to use it. What's that tunnel? The tunnel. Gee, I'd forgotten about it for a minute, seeing you. You've got to get out of here, Jean. I think this is the secret passage that leads to the octopus headquarters. You do? Oh, Speed, let's go in and see where it leads. Hey, wait a minute. You can't go in, Jean. I was just thinking about calling Clinton Barney. Only either. Only what? Well, I'm not real sure that this tunnel goes very far. Maybe it's just something that was started and never finished. But still, if that's so... Why would there be a secret door leading into it? Secret door? Where? I touched a loose board, and part of the wall slid back, leaving that tunnel entrance open. Have you got a flashlight, Speed? Yeah. Why? Give it to me. Why? Just because I want it. Don't ask me so many questions. Okay, here you are. But don't drop it in the water. I won't. I just want to see what's inside the tunnel. Hey, come back here. You can't go in there, Jean. I'm in, Speed. Come on. No, wait. I'm going to call Clint. Hurry up and follow me, Speed, or you won't have any light. Jean, wait. Oh, I'll have to follow her in or she'll get lost. Why'd she have to come down here anyhow? Clint. Hey, Barney. I thought you were up at the end of the pier. I was, but there's nothing to see up there but a lot of sampans, junk, and water. I come back here thinking you might have stirred up something. No, no not a thing. It's like the doctor was wrong after all, Barney. We're on a wild goose chase. Where's the kid? Well, he went down the ladder to the float under the pier. Thought he might find something interesting down there. Well, the one thing he's safer under the pier than on it, in case of trouble. I ain't so sure about that. Remember, them slaves was transferred to that other boat under this pier. Oh, I know, but that has nothing to do with the present setup. Maybe not, and then again, maybe so. Octopuses like water, don't they? Why wouldn't he have one secret passage coming in from the ocean so as he could get all the water he wants at any time? Oh, you're crazy. Come on, let's go get speed. And then go to Lee Ying's to see if he's learned anything new. I don't want to waste the day altogether. Okay, by me. Where are you going now? Mm, up to the ladder that leads down to the float, naturally. Well, you don't have to, Clint. There's an opening in the dark right near here that's almost directly over the seawall. That's where the kid will probably be. We can look down and... Let him know we're ready to go instead of climbing down that darn ladder again. Yeah, all right, but I didn't notice any opening on the dock. You wouldn't unless you was looking for it. Only reason I happen to know about it is that that's how Speed and me got up on the dock the night of the flower boat raid through that hole. Oh, I see it. Uh, is it this way? Yeah, in back of that post. Oh, yes. Yes, I see it now. 
You'll have to get down on your knees and put your head through, else you won't see anything but what's directly under it. Well, since you know so much about it, supposing you get down on your knees and poke your head through. Okay, pal. And don't let him give you any argument about wanting to stay down there, either. Hey, Clint, the kid isn't there. Uh, what? Why, he must be. I know he hasn't come up that ladder. I've been watching it. Maybe he stayed on the float. Uh, can you see it from this hole in the dock? Sure. Take a squint yourself. There's nobody down there at all. All right. Say, you're right. Do you think he fell in again? I don't know. I warned him to be careful. Maybe he decided to go for a swim after he got down. Uh, you know Speed wouldn't waste time when he's on a job. Hey, Barney. Look at that seawall. Well, get away so as I can, will you? Yeah. Okay, I'm looking. What about it? Was that tunnel there before? You were right down there beside it. Was it a solid wall? Or was that tunnel there when you last saw it? Now, let me think a minute. No, by golly, that wall was as solid as the rock of Gibraltar that night. Suffering wang doodles. Do you think Speed found something? I don't know, but we've got to get down there, Barney. Get down there as quick as we can. Not there? Yes, Cornwall. Someone has found the secret door and entered the tunnel. I have just had a signal. It is not Clint Barlow. I have just had a report from one of my men. He and Barney Dunlap were still on the dock. Then it must be the boy, Speed Gibson. He is not enough. When I spring this trap, I want it to snare all three of them. What shall I do then, Master? Is your mask on? Yes. Then as Speed Gibson draws near, step inside the rock door so that he will not see you. Allow him to come as far along the passage as he wishes. Even as far as the door to the inner chamber? Yes, he cannot enter the door. And his knowledge of it will do him no good after the... <laughs> the pumps start. And when shall I give the signal to start them? As soon as you hear the voices of Barlow and Dunlap. Once they are in the tunnel, close the seawall entrance so there can be no escape for them. Then save yourself by shutting the rock door against the flood of seawater the pumps will send through the tunnel. <laughs> Within the... When it recedes, there will no longer be secret police to travel. Someone is coming near, Master. I hear laughter. Laughter? Well, let him laugh when he can. Hide yourself, Kwan Wu. The boy must not see you and give the alarm. Immediately, Master. I shall sign off now. Stand by, though. I shall speak to you again as soon as Speed Gibson has passed me. Very well. And now to slip behind the secret rock door. <laughs> oh, I can't run any further, Speed. <laughs> I'm all out of breath. A lot of breath or not. You're going to run right out of here. What's the idea of coming in anyhow? I thought maybe we'd have an adventure. But how can I be laughing while Marcia's away like she is? I never thought I could laugh again until she was found. We'll find Miss Marsh all right. So you needn't worry about that, Jean. Laugh all you want. But what I don't like is you coming in here after I told you not to. You should have waited for Clint and Barney. They don't know where I am. If anything should happen, don't even know you're here at all. They'd have a fit if they knew. Nothing's going to happen, Speed. Because I don't think this is a passage to the octopus den at all. We haven't seen a single thing anywhere in it. I don't mean anything. I've got a hunch we ought to be getting out of here as quick as we can. And I'll get Clinton Barney. See that you get sent home, and we'll come back here and really explore this tunnel right. Speed, did you hear anything as we were coming along the tunnel? Well, how could I with you making so much noise? Why? Did you hear anything? Well, I thought I did. What did it sound like? Something like a whale. Well, probably just a echo from our voices. The tunnels are funny that way. What was that? It sounded like a rock moving. Did you push anything with your foot? No. Hey, give me a flashlight. Now look around a little. I'm afraid. I, I feel like we're being watched, Speed. There's nothing to be afraid of yet. Anyhow, if you were going to be afraid, why didn't you start before you ever came into this tunnel? Well, it seemed like from then, out in the sunlight and all. But now, in here all alone, oh, Speed, I am scared. That's a girl for you. Get into trouble and then yell to get out of it. You've got to learn how to think before you jump into things, Jean. Yes, if you can only get out of this. I do a lot of thinking before I do any more jumping. Okay, we'll start back. But now, as long as we've gone this far, nothing's happened. I think I'll go a little further and see what's at the end of this tunnel. But I thought you wanted to get back to Clinton Barney. I do. 
Going just a little further ahead isn't going to hurt anything. If you want to come or stay, stay there and wait for me. Oh, no. Wait, I'll come. I wouldn't stay there in the dark for anything in the world. OC-13 calling OC-127. OC-13 calling OC-127. Standing by. Yes, Conroe? They have passed me, Master. Jay? Hey? Speed Gibson and Dr. Kingsley's daughter, Jean. Jean Kingsley? What is she doing there? I do not know. I did not recognize her. She was dressed as a Chinese boy. This may complicate matters. I did not dream that anyone but Gibson, Barrow, and Dunlap would be caught in my trap. Oh, Clint Marlowe and Barney Dunlap are coming into the tunnel, Master, in search of the boy. Then we can delay no longer. Shut the seawall panel, give the signal to start the pumps, and get to safety yourself behind the secret rock door. The secret police and all who travel with them must be destroyed. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Clint and Barney, working on a clue given them by Dr. Kingsley, go to the Siang Dock in disguise to look for a secret passage, supposedly leading into the octopus headquarters. Meanwhile, the master criminal, knowing of their plan, has set a trap for them in the secret passage leading from the seawall beneath the dock. Speed discovers the tunnel and, while wondering whether to signal Clint and Barney or not, is startled by little Jean, the doctor's daughter who has come to the dock in disguise, unknown to her father. She runs into the tunnel and speed follows, not knowing that the octopus right-hand man, Quan Wu, is secreted in the tunnel, waiting to spring the trap. Clint and Barney, looking for the boy, also discover the tunnel entrance and hasten inside, calling for him. Oh, speed! Speed! Answer me! Speed! It's Clinton Barney! Where are you? Why the dickens doesn't he answer us, Barney? Our voices would carry far in a tunnel like this. Yeah, but how do we know the kid's in here? We didn't see him come in. Where else could he go? He didn't come up on the dock, I know that. 
Now, this tunnel is a logical place for him to go. But why didn't he give us the signal when he found it? Those were my last orders. Must have had some good reason. It ain't like speed to disobey orders much. Well, the only reason would be that one of the octopus gangs silenced them before he could give us a warning. Suffering wang doodles. Do you think so? Then let's keep going. We gotta find that kid. Yes. Come on, get out your flashlight, Barney. We'll need it now that we're getting away from the tunnel entrance. Say, look how this runway is going up on dry land now. We're leaving the water behind. Yes, but water has been up in here and high, too. Look on the walls of the tunnel. You can see traces of different levels. Uh, the tides, maybe. No, it's high tide right now. Can you see where the water stopped? Hey. Hey, the entrance is closing on us. Quick, let's try to get back before we're trapped. It's too late, Bunny. We are trapped. There's no doubt about it now. This tunnel does lead to the octopus lair. What do we do? Now, just keep cool. Try to find speed. Well, I hope we can find him now. Me, too. But if we can't do anything else, we can see where this tunnel leads to. Come on, let's get going. Speed! Oh, speed! 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 Where are you, speed? Speed! Answer me! Look where the tunnel ends, Jean. Right at this big door. Can you open it, speed? Well, I'll try. Uh, nope, I, I can't budge it. We'd better start back now. I don't like this place. Okay. Maybe Clint or Barney can think of a way of getting through this door. Hey, look. Here's a little square of glass in the door. Put there so who's ever behind it can look out in the tunnel, I guess. Can you look in? Yeah, but I, I can't see anything. It's even darker in there than it is here in the tunnel. I'm sure glad you have your flashlight. I don't know. This flashlight's what got us into this. If I hadn't had it along, I couldn't have given it to you. And you couldn't have run into the tunnel with it. And I wouldn't have had to follow you. I'm sorry, Speed. I didn't mean to make you any trouble. Let's go back now, huh? Okay, by me. I only hope that Clint hasn't missed me and started worrying about me. Me too. Say, when he sees you here, Jean, I don't know what he'll do. And supposing your dad finds out you're gone. Won't he worry? Yes, he would if he knew about it. But he won't be home until dinner. Speed! Oh, Speed! Listen. Speed! Speed Gibson! It's Clint. Clint and Barney looking for us. Come on, let's hurry. Here I am, Clint. I'm coming. Well, wait for me, Speed. Hurry, hurry, run. run. Come on, Jean. Speed, is that you? Yeah, Clint. Coming. Oh, I'm so glad they're here. Now I'm not afraid anymore. Hey, somebody's with me. Who's with you, kid? It's, it's Jean. Jean? Suffering wine dudes. Now we are in for it. There's light ahead. That must be from the flashlight, Speed. Yeah, and there they are. Hi, fellas. Hey, Steve. And Jean, how in heaven's name did you get in here? And what are you doing in that disguise? She came down here to meet us, Clint. Saw me go down to the float and came down through that opening on the dock. What did you want to do that for, Jean? We got enough trouble on our hands without being responsible for you. I'm sorry, Barney. I wanted to see what you all were doing. I thought maybe I could help. Hey, hey don't start crying, Jean. That won't help anything. Oh, no, we're all in a very serious spot. The only hope we have of getting out of it is to keep our heads. Well, what's wrong, Clint? Well, the entrance is closed, Peter. The door on the seawall. The secret door? Then... Yeah. This is the octopus's tunnel, all right. Didn't I tell you he'd have something that led into water? But no one had believed oh, me. Oh, all right, you told us. Now, how about you telling us how to get out of here, mastermind? Give me time. I will. Well, let's talk this over in the meantime. Well, let's turn off our flashlights as long as we don't need them right now and save the batteries. No telling how long we'll be in this tunnel. Okay. I don't like being in the dark like this. Well, it's better to be in the dark knowing that you can turn on your flashlight whenever you want than to be in the dark and know you can't turn on anything, Jean. Yes, I guess so. But I wish we were out of this place. Well, we'll go back to the entrance. Now that we've found you, and see if we can't find the spring that works that sliding door. Uh, what's up ahead, Speed? A big door with a glass in it. A looking glass? A glass to look through, Barney. But I couldn't see anything on the other side... It was all dark. Uh, I tell you, I don't like this whole thing. The octopus set a trap for us, and we walked right into it very nicely. Say, Speed, why did you ever come in here without signaling us? Well, um, I don't know. Yes, he does uh, know, Clint. He came in because I ran in with a flashlight before he could give you the signal. It's all my fault. Yeah, just as I thought. Women always get a guy into trouble. I've never oh, seen a... Oh, pipe to... down, Bonnie. Did your father know you're down here, Jean? No, Clint. Well, I talked to him over the telephone just before we left our hotel. He was going home then to keep an eye on you. 
Quan Wu has warned him that he might lose you, Jin. Oh, but he'll come home and I'll be gone. And he'll be awfully worried. And how? But that's our one chance. What, Barney? When he finds Jean missing, the doc will try and get in touch with us. Probably come right down to the Siang dock. When he don't find us, he'll know something's wrong because we was going to keep in touch with him. So he'll get hold of the Hong Kong police and they'll start looking for Jean and us. Uh, and there's only one chance in a million that they'll find us, Barney. Remember, that seawall entrance is closed now. Oh, say, didn't the police guard around your home see you go out, Jean? They saw me after I was out clean and then chased me away. Dressed and made up like a Chinese boy, they didn't know me. Your own dad wouldn't know you. Kids get the darndest ideas. Well, listen, just crying over spilled milk. Let's start looking for a way out of this place. We better all stay together this time. Yeah, here, you hold on to my hand, Jean. We don't want to lose you. All right, Barney. Uh, did you try to open that door at the end of the passage, Speed? Yeah, but I couldn't budge it. Well, let's go back to the seawall entrance, then. There must be some way of opening that door from this side. It's only a case of finding it. If there was only some way of getting in touch with Lee Ying. Oh, and I don't mention any names, Barney. These tunnel walls may have ears. Yeah, and I wish they had noses so I could punch them. This makes me sore, getting put away underground like this. Oh, I make you fellas more trouble than anything, I guess. I'm uh, sorry, Clint. Oh, now, don't be sorry, Steve. Things like this are apt to happen in our business. And it's the unexpected that usually upsets the apple cart. Hey, what's this on the wall? Huh? Where? Yeah. Oh, that's just a peg of wood that somebody happened to stick into the dirt, Barney. Well, what's a peg doing in here? Something to hang your hat on, I suppose. Well, see if it'll come out, Barney. Maybe it'll work a secret door or something. Okay, kid. Nope. Nothing come out but a little dirt. Well, all right, then. Let's keep on going. What keeps the dirt from coming down on us, Clint? Well, this tunnel is roofed with wooden planks, Jean. Uh, you see? Yeah, it's sturdy enough, all right. In fact, it's too sturdy, I'm afraid. Say, do you fellas hear something? Sounds like a broken water main, don't it? Bro water? And there are water marks on these tunnel walls. Oh, No. Why, even the octopus wouldn't do a thing like that. Like what, Clint? Imprison us here in this tunnel and then pump it full of water. Something oh. wang doodles. That's just what he is doing, I bet you. And that water's getting closer all the time. Let's hurry. Maybe we can stop it from coming in some way. Find a way for us to get out. Come on, everybody. Let's go. <laughs> Kwan Wu, you lost no time in getting here. Have you prepared everything for our uh, guests? Yes, master. The pumps have started. Speed Gibson, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap are trapped in the tunnel. And the little girl, huh? Yes. <laughs> our secret police will have plenty of time to contemplate their fate. I have given orders that the tunnel shall not be filled too quickly. You are sure that there is no chance of escape? The seawall door is shut fast? Yes, master. Besides the area around the seawall door is the first to fill with water since the tunnel slopes down from the door to the inner chamber. True, true. They shall be driven back step by step with the icy waters always at their heels until at last they are before the door of the inner chamber. <laughs> from there I shall watch them. See if they have as much courage when they are in my power as they show when they think I am in theirs. Shall you show yourself to them, Martha? Perhaps keeping my mask on, of course. That I have not decided on as yet. However, I will talk to them. As the water creeps up and up, my voice will be the last thing they hear. <laughs> Did you leave the short wave set open? Yes, Master. Your voice can reach them anywhere in the tunnel. And likewise, we can hear them, no matter where they are. Eh? I shall open my set here. It's already heated. We shall hear our friends. It should be amusing. Well, there's where the water's coming in. I'm going to stuff my jacket in that pipe. Maybe that'll stop it. <laughs> no use, Barney. Let's try that seawall door. Yeah. The water isn't coming in fast. We may yet have time. <laughs> the octopus laughs. Yes, Kwanu, I laugh. And with good reason. 
Barlow thinks they may yet have time to escape. And will still think so when the water is over their heads and they must swim in order to breathe. But if they had an eternity of time, they could not escape the octopus now. of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed, Clint, Barney, and little Jean Kingsley have been trapped in an underground passage that leads to the headquarters of the criminal, the octopus. Water is being pumped into the passage while the boys frantically try to find a way of escape. Meanwhile, Dr. Kingsley has returned home to find his daughter missing, and since his friend Quan Wu warned him only that morning that the octopus might avenge himself on the doctor for giving information to the secret police by kidnapping Jean, Kingsley is desperate. While he is attempting to reach Clint and Barney, their mutual friend, Li Ying, the tea merchant, is announced. Oh, Li Ying, how glad I am you happened to stop in. My daughter has disappeared. What? Are you sure, Dr. Kingsley? Yes, yes, I've looked everywhere for her. None of the servants have seen her since this morning, and neither the police who are guarding the place. Strange. No one could possibly have gained entrance to your estate without the police seeing them, unless you have a secret passage of some sort. No, no, nothing of that sort. At least not to my knowledge. Besides, the servants have been about all day. They would have noticed a stranger in the house. One would think so. Have you notified the police of your daughter's disappearance? No. I've been trying to reach Clint Barlow. I was about to call the police when you came. I have been trying to locate Clint, too, and have failed to do so. He was to have kept in touch with me regarding his findings at the Siang Dock, and I had no word from him. I stopped in to see if he had called you. No, I've heard nothing. That is, nothing since talking to Barlow just before they left their hotel this morning... I called to tell him of the warning Quan Wu had just given me. Warning? Yes. He said he'd heard that the octopus was displeased because I was doing everything in my power to help the international secret police in finding him. When I told Wu that I must continue because a member of my household, Marsha Winfield, had fallen prey to this criminal, he said that I'd better be careful lest another member of my household also disappear. Jean. Jean, your daughter? He would not dare. Oh, Jean is missing, and what can we do? I'm a doctor. You're a tea merchant. The Hong Kong police are our only hope. Dr. Kingsley, I'm going to tell you something, but it is in strictest confidence. You must not repeat what I'm going to say to anyone. I'm only telling you because I know I can trust you. Oh, of course, Li Ying. What is it? I am more than just a tea merchant. I am the Hong Kong operator of the International Secret Police. Oh, then that accounts for your interest in the boys' activities. Yes. Now, here is my plan. You are to go to the Hong Kong police as you had planned and ask their aid. I shall send out a call for my men. We shall meet at the Siang Dock in half an hour. The Siang Dock? 
Why there? Because the only clue we have to the whereabouts of the octopus leads there, Dr. Kingsley. I believe that we shall find Speed, Clint, and Barney where the octopus is. And your daughter. Looks like we're wasting time trying to budge this seawall door, boys. Yeah, it's solid as a rock, Clint. I opened it from the outside by touching what looked like a loose board. There's nothing like that on this side. Well, meanwhile, the water has crept up to our knees. We better be getting back up the tunnel where it's dry. Okay. Here, Gene, I'll carry you so you won't get any wetter than you have to. Oh, Barney, do you think we'll get out of this awful place? Sure we will, honey. Just takes a little time, that's all. But just let me get my hands on that octopus and I'll tear him apart. Doing a thing like this when there's a little girl around. Oh, don't worry about me, Barney. I'm thinking of you all. I want you to escape from here so you can find Marsha and her brother. We will, Jean. Just you wait and see. Look, we're out of the water already. Yes, but with that water coming in all the time, we won't be out of it long. It'll keep following us. Rising and rising until it's over our heads. Well, then we can start swimming. I ain't had my exercise today, and a good swim will be mighty welcome. <laughs> oh, Barney. Here, here, here now. Now, there's enough water coming in here without you adding to it, Jane. Buck up. Yes. You're all so brave. Well, there's really not much to worry about yet, Jane. Yeah. Oh! Well, now what's wrong? Yeah. Oh. Well, just using one flashlight don't exactly give us a perfect idea of what we're walking into. Why don't you use yours, too, until we reach the door at the end of this tunnel? No, speeds is enough. I'm trying to make this light last as long as possible. I wonder why that rock's there anyhow. It's the only rock in the tunnel. They put it there just for me to fall over. wonder if it's wide enough for us all to stand on when the water gets too high. Well, let's see if we can move it, Barney. <clears throat> <clears throat> Oh, no use. Can't move it an inch. Let's go on and try that other door you was talking about, Speed. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Turn your flashlight a little higher, Speed. Okay, Clint. There you are. It was something. A microphone. It's a short wave set. Boy, we're saved. What do you mean? Don't you see, Gene? Maybe we can talk to your dad over this set. It's an octopus set, but maybe we can get through if he doesn't happen to be listening. Yeah, he's listening all right. Wouldn't you know it? Yes, Barney Dunlap, I have been listening, and your conversation has amused me very much. I hope you laugh your head off, old eight-face. Do not worry, Barney. You shall furnish me even greater amusement when the water closes over your head. Don't pay any attention to him, Gene. We'll get you out of this all right. Don't be too sure, Speed. You shall not escape me this time. Well, even if we don't, Octopus, our going won't save you. Speed, Barney, and me are just three members of the secret police. Just because we have gone, do you think they'll stop in their search for you? No, probably not. But they will have lost their leader, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the service. Without you to guide them, they would never find me. You're wrong there. The International Secret Police doesn't depend on one man for its success, but every man in its service. You can't escape. And even though you appear to be holding the winning cards now. But let me ask you one thing, not for ourselves, but for someone else. An innocent victim. Who? Little Jean Kingsley. Give her her freedom at least. And have her tell everything she has seen and heard. Oh, no, you must take me for a fool, Barlow. You're a yellow dog, that's what. No, I won't insult a dog like that. You're just plain yellow, Octopus. It must take a lot of courage to fight little 12-year-old girls. Pity is not one of my weaknesses, Dunlap. And as for your opinion of me, talk as much as you like. For soon the water will silence you. Why, you... Yeah, you... Take it easy, Barney. No good fighting a microphone. Yeah, you're right, Clint. And you need not try to call out on this set either. It will avail you nothing since it is connected directly into my headquarters. And your calls will only reach my ears. <laughs> Swell fella. He probably has microphones planted all along this tunnel so he can pick up whatever we say. Clint, what do you think his headquarters would be? Near this tunnel on the other side of the door ahead, maybe? Uh, it's hard to tell, Speed. The ground around Siang Dock is probably honeycombed with secret passages. Any one of them leading to the octopus. He'd never just have a few avenues of escape, but many. 
Well, guess there's nothing left for us to do but go and take a look at this door at the end of the tunnel, Speed. Can't tell. Maybe we could take it off and use it for a raft. Something tells me we'll soon be needing one. It's no use, Li Ying. The police have searched the Siang dock from end to end, and they haven't found any suspicious evidence nor any trace of Speed, Clint, or Barney. That is exactly why I brought you and three of my picked men down under the pier, Dr. Kingsley, to this float. Since the police can find nothing on the dock, perhaps we may find something beneath it. But why are we walking along this narrow runway? It leads directly into that seawall. But it may also lead to something more important, our missing friend. Speed and Barney were down under here on the night of the flower boat raid. At the time, Speed commented on the fact that this runway led to the seawall and wondered why. In fact, so far as I can see, there is no necessity for a seawall. Well, what has all this to do with my daughter and Speed, Clint and Barney? Maybe nothing. Maybe a great deal. Watch your footing, Dr. Kingsley. The going is treacherous. Very well. By the way, have you tried to reach Quan Wu since your little daughter disappeared? Quan Wu? No. Why do you ask? I was just wondering what he would say when you told him that his warning had borne fruit. Li Yang, do you think he could possibly have any connection with the octopus gang? Until this occurrence, I would have staked my life on his innocence. But now I am uncertain. It seems that there is more than mere coincidence in Jean's disappearance coming so soon after that warning. I do not say that Quan Wu is affiliated with the octopus... But perhaps he knows more about the criminal than he would want his friends to know. Well, he's always spoken so against him. Seems so anxious that the octopus and his criminal band be caught. Sometimes, Dr. Kingsley, the most smoke hides the most fire. I think from now on I shall assign a man to watch Quan Wu. But now we have reached the sea wall. Let us inspect it most carefully. Well, I'm afraid I can't see anything suspicious or unusual about it. Not at first glance, perhaps, but look at the dock... Above us, Doctor. Observe that opening almost directly over us. Large enough for a man to go through if necessary. Well, does that prove anything? It might. We have seen what is above. Now, let us see what is beneath. Chow! Uh, yes, Li Ying? Go into the water, directly beneath the runway. See how deep this sea wall goes. Yes, Li Ying. Good heavens, do you expect him to work underwater? Merely to observe, Dr. Kingsley. Chow is an experienced diver. He well knows how to take care of himself. And meanwhile, let us study the sea wall itself. Oh, here's something clinging to one of the boards. May I have it, please? Thank you. Hmm. This appears to be false hair. It's white or gray, too. What would that be doing down here? I don't know. Unless... Oh, yes, that must be it. Must be what? Barney's disguised. I remember now. Clint told me that Barney was going to make up as an aged Chinese. They've been here, Doctor. They've left a clue for us. Li Ying! Li Ying! The sea wall does not descend far, but I found something else beneath the water. Pipes leading directly under it. And these pipes were drawing water. Water is being pumped in. But where? Doctor, look there on the boards of the sea wall. Water is trickling through. On the other side? How can that be? There is a secret room or tunnel on the other side of this wall. Water is being pumped into it. We've got to reach Speed, Clint, and Barney. We've got to break in before it is too late. <laughs>
Johnson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Barney and little Gene Kingsley have been trapped by the octopus in an underground passage that leads to his headquarters from the Seong Dock. Seeing a chance to rid himself of his enemies, the criminal orders that the passage be filled with water. As it is pumped in, the boys desperately seek a way of escape, but thus far have failed. Meanwhile, Li Ying, Hong Kong operator of the secret police, and Dr. Kingsley have discovered that a secret door is hidden in the seawall and have called for reserves to break into the passage. The prisoners know nothing of this since they have been forced to the other end of the passage by the rising water. It's getting higher and higher. Here, I'd better carry it, Jane, before it covers it entirely. All right, Barney. The water's awfully cold. Oh, yes, and no way out. If only Kingsley has given the alarm to the police. It's our only chance. If we could only open this big door, Clint. Oh, but we can't, Speed. We've tried every possible way. Yeah. I guess we'll have to start swimming pretty soon. This water's rising pretty fast. The thing that gets me is we haven't got a chance to fight our way out of this jam. We got to just stand and wait or swim and wait until the tunnel's full of water. Oh, Barney. Ah, uh, but we'll be rescued in time. Just you wait and see, Jean. Only meanwhile, the least the octopus could have done was to have heated this water. I'm freezing. Say, do you suppose the octopus is on the other side of this door watching us? Through that glass? Well, turn your flashlight on it and see, Steve. Okay. Hey. What'd you turn your light out for? I I didn't turn it out, Barney. Oh, your battery burned out too, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, what's the difference? Nothing to see but tunnel walls and water. I don't like being in the dark. Oh, there. Now, darkness can't hurt you, Jean. Why, it's friendly. Nothing's friendly in this tunnel. You're right there, kid. But we got plenty of friends outside... If they only get wise to where we are in time. Hurry, men, hurry. We must break the seawall open. We're only in time, Li Ying. All we can do is hope, Dr. Kingsley. Faster, faster. What are they saying? That it will take much time to break through these heavy timbers. Then we'll be too late. Can't we dynamite the seawall? Oh, no, because we can only guess what is behind it. If Speed, Clint, and Barney are near the wall, a blast of dynamite would destroy them. Well, would it be possible to make an entrance through the water pipes that the diver found? The ones that are carrying water in behind the seawall. No, they are much too small. Besides, a man would very probably drown before reaching the end. There is no telling how far they go. Oh, look, look. They've managed to tear away a corner of the wall. Yes, and it is the doorway. Look at the water flowing out. Well, enough? Should the boys be imprisoned in there to save them? No, because the intake is far greater. Faster, men, faster! Here, give me that crowbar. I'll help. Yes, and I. We must save them. They're my only hope of finding Jean. Too bad that Speed Gibson's flashlight battery burned out. It was so amusing to watch the assumed bravery of the secret police. Mata, Mata. Yes, Kwan Mu, what is it? The Hong Kong police and the secret police are at the Siong Dock. What? Yes. The word came while you were watching the secret police in the tunnel from the inner chamber. Why did I not hear of this before? I came as quickly as I could. The police are now attempting to batter down the seawall. They perceived water trickling from between the timbers and a diver was sent down beneath the runway. He found the water pipe. I should have prepared that seawall when it first began leaking. But I never thought they would find that entrance. What are your orders, master? Wait, Kwan Wu, give me time to think. Seawall is very strong, built to resist terrific pressure. 
We will not have an easy time breaking through that. And meantime, the water being pumped into the tunnel will reach the ceiling and the secret police will be no more. Yes, yes, but I'm not thinking of them but myself. Once the Hong Kong police gain entrance into the tunnel, then they will attack the door to the inner chamber and eventually reach the very heart of my underground kingdom. But wait. What, Master? The Hong Kong police could never have found that seawall entrance alone. I'm sure of that. Who is leading them? Dr. Kingsley and the tea merchant, Li Ying. Li Ying? Yes. You mean the same Li Ying who operates the tea house too, huh? The same, Master. Hmm. Let me get my file. I have had my rice at his place often. He was always a pleasant host. Uh, Too pleasant, perhaps. Too clever, perhaps. Let's see what we have here. Uh, Ying, here it is. Li Ying, born in Hong Kong 27 years ago. Educated in America as well as China. Spent 10 years in San Francisco. Now operating a tea house in Hong Kong. Hmm. It all looks innocent enough. And yet he leads the police to our stronghold. Yes, perhaps he's merely an amateur detective. Perhaps something more. He might even be a member of the International Secret Police. How could he be without you knowing it, Master? The Secret Police are clever, Kwan. who never doubt that for a moment. It takes an emergency like this for them to toss aside their disguise and reveal themselves as they really are. What led Dr. Kingsley to the Siang Dock? The child. His daughter. Could she have left word where she was going? No. You saw her yourself, dressed as a Chinese boy. She must have left her home without anyone's consent. Ah! The more we try to figure it out, the more confused it becomes. I can no longer waste any time. Guan Wu, the inner chamber must be dynamited. What? Yes, with that blown to bits, our inquisitive visitors will have no way of tracing the other passages that lead to my headquarters. It is too bad to lose the inner chamber, but we can build another. But if you dynamite the inner chamber, is there not danger of wrecking some of the other passages? Master, the blast may even reach as far as this room. No danger of that. You seem to forget that I have experienced dynamiters in my band, Kwan Wu. And what of the tunnel that holds the secret police, Speed, Clint, Barney, and Gene Kingsley? Will that collapse from the blast? That I cannot say, nor do I care. For by this time the gauge shows that the water is near the top of the tunnel. Whether the water or the dynamite disposes of our friends, I do not care. Just so they never bother me again. That is all I am interested in. <laughs> and now, I think I will have one last word with them. I've, I've swum for fun a lot of times, but never thought I'd be swimming for my life. Live and learn, kid. How you coming, Jean? Want me to hold you up for a while? No, thanks, Barney. I can swim a hike. But there's no big waves. So you two kids don't have to work so hard. Just turn over on your back and float a while. All right. But keep near the big door. Or we don't want to get separated. Oh, no. What are you so quiet about, Clint? Are you still with us? Are you still in the swim? <laughs> Gee, Barney, you can laugh at anything. <laughs> yes, Pete. Barney's laughed us out of many a scrape. I only hope he can do the same this time. Yeah. Say, hey, Clint, free chap is... Is that the top of the tunnel I just touched? I'm afraid so, Speed. Gee, it won't, won't be long then before the water reaches the top then, will it? Speed, uh, I have a firm conviction that we're going to get out of this. Just as I've gotten out of a thousand other tight corners. Even tighter than this. This is your first job. You're new at the game, so it's harder for you and for little Gene here than it is for Barney and me. I don't know about that, old pal. I don't like swimming so well that I'd pick a black tunnel to do it in. Especially when I may bump my head against the top any minute. Oh, stop beefing. I ain't beefing. But let this be a lesson to you. Never come into tunnels or dark houses without police escorts. They ain't safe. Well, if you're so afraid of tunnels and dark houses, you never should have joined the secret police, wise guy. I ain't afraid. I just am careful. Look at the mess you got us into. I got us... Say, you were the first one into this tunnel when we found it. Oh, was I? Yeah. Oh, well, let's skip it, huh, Clint? But, uh, uh, let me say this. If the road does stop here, I'm glad we're on it together. <laughs> that goes for me, too, Barney. I'm sorry for Gene and Speed. We, we just can't give up. We've got to get them out of here somehow. I don't know how. Only way we can go is up, and it's kind of hard to scratch your way through three-by-fours. The octopus again. Oh. Nothing to be afraid of, Gene. Let's just go on floating while a big devil fish spouts. 
Pete Gibson, Barney Dunlap, and Clint Bard. We all know our names, Octopus. Yeah, go away and leave us alone. We was enjoying a little relaxing exercise until you started broadcasting. <laughs> you are very amusing. It'd be lots more fun if you was out here with us. We could duck you three times and only pull you up twice. Silence. Listen to the guy. No sense of humor. <laughs> he can't take it, Barney. Soon I shall see how well you can take it, Speed Gibson. Soon the water will cover your chin or mouth or nose. If you're trying to frighten us, you might as well save your time, Octopus. The only one you might affect would be little Jean here. And that wouldn't be enough for a man of your extreme courage. I'm not afraid of him, Clint. Ah, a girl, honey. He can go haunt somebody else for all we care. And if you of the secret police know fear at all, now that you know our hope is gone, that there is no possible escape, have you no fear? We have no more fear than you have courage. You continually question my courage, Clint Barlow. I would permit myself to become angry if I did not know that you were doing it for a reason. Baiting me in hope that I might meet you face to face. But you might as well banish that hope. I would not waste time on such a meeting. Seems to me you're wasting a lot of breath and time right now telling us all about yourself, Devilfish. Somehow we just ain't interested. I have not been wasting time, Barney Dunlap. My men have been busy while I have been talking to you. And now all is ready. In just a second, something will happen that may interest you. <laughs> and now, goodbye. For the last time. Now, what did he mean by that crack? Oh, I'm afraid. Ouch! Clint, my head just bumped against the roof of the tunnel. Steady, steady speed. Ah! Dynamite! Door! Look out! of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Li Ying, Hong Kong representative of the International Secret Police, Dr. Kingsley and the Hong Kong police are trying to break through the secret door in the Siong Dock Sea Wall and rescue Speed, Clint, Barney, and little Jean Kingsley. The octopus has ordered that their tunnel prison be filled with water. The water has almost reached the roof of the tunnel and the boys have about given up hope of rescue when the octopus, learning that the police have found the secret door, decides to dynamite the inner chamber so that there will be no danger of them tracing his headquarters by way of other passages. When the blast occurs, the enormous door separating the inner chamber from the water-filled tunnel is forced outwards and misses the boys and Jean by inches. 
Clint, Barney, where are you? Are you all right? I'm all right, Speed. Where's Jean? I grabbed her hand when I heard the explosion. We went down under the water. Next thing I knew, I was climbing up on this pile of dirt. Yes. Well, I'm so glad we're out of that water. But where's Clint? I don't know, kid. It's so dark, we can't see anything. Just sort of have to feel around. Barney, you think that door might have struck him as it came down? No, nah, he saw it coming. Remember, there was a flash of light on the other side of that door just before she blew. He yelled to me to watch out. Clint! Clint, where are you? Oh, dear. If you could only see something. Barney, we've got to find him. We can't stay here while Clint may be floating somewhere in the tunnel. Now, nah, hold on, Speed. We've just had a mighty narrow escape. Ain't many people who can be so close to a blast of dynamite and still talk afterwards. We can't go walking around in this darkness. We'll all get into trouble. That blast probably sent Clint further down the tunnel than us, that's all. He'll come back all right. Don't worry. We'll just give a shout now and then to give him his direction. Okay. Clint! Clint! We're up here! Where's here? That's what I'd like to know. Near as I can figure out, kid, we're on a ledge of dirt just about where the door was. Boy, that dynamite sure saved us from swallowing a lot of water. The water's getting lower all the time, too. Guess most of it is running into that room that was dynamited. Must have been a big room. Do you think any more water's coming in? Don't know about that. Oh, God, I wish my flashlight was working so we could look for Clint. Wait a little longer. And if this water keeps going down, maybe we can start looking. Or, I should say, feeling, kid. But right now, there's nothing we can do but sit tight and hope for the best. the blast. Something must have struck me on the head and the water carried me away from the others. But where? What's all that noise? I'll, I'll go toward it. Young Sea Wall Door. They're breaking it down. It's the rescue party. I'm coming out. Please, is that really you? Uh, it's me, all right, Ying. You just came in time. Well, thank heaven you're safe, Clint. Where's Speed and Barney? Uh, they're back in the tunnel. We've got to get to them right away. Jean is with them. Jean? You mean you mean my little girl was in that tunnel with you? Uh, it's a long story, but I'll give you the highlights on the way back. Let's get started right away. Of course. Uh, you men, bring lanterns and flashlights and follow us. It is a flashlight for you, Clint. And thanks. Be careful of that jagged wood, Doctor. Oh, I'm over it. Now let's go. I must see if my little girl is safe. I tried to reach you to tell you that she had disappeared, Clint, but you'd already gone back to the Siang Da. Well, yes. Now watch your footing, Ying. This mud is slippery as grease from all that water. The water receded very quickly. If the tunnel was full when we were breaking in. Well, it was full, all right. We were swimming around, bumping our heads against the roof. When the room on the other side of the big door at the end of this tunnel was dynamited. Dynamited? Yeah, it forced the door open. Guess most of the water ran in there. And I was separated from the others by the blast. The next thing I knew, I was down near the seawall door. Oh, then you don't know if the others survived that dynamite blast. I'm not absolutely sure, Doctor, but I have good reason to think so. You see, it was that room that received the force of the blast, not the tunnel. The octopus wanted to destroy that room for some good reason. Probably to hide his tracks. And perhaps passages from that room led directly to his headquarters. In that case, his lair should be near the Siang Dock. Possibly, but you, you can't tell, Ying. Hey, look, look. Here is where the water was being pumped in, you see. And there's a shortwave set up there, too. The octopus talked to us over it. He knew then that you were coming to the Siang Dock to search for the secret passage. Unquestionably. Huh? And probably had men planted on the dock itself. 
We couldn't find a clue to the secret passage on the dock, and then Speed decided to go under the dock and investigate the float and runway. When Barney and I decided to give up the search and went to get Speed, we'd find he'd completely disappeared. But there was an opening in the seawall where there'd been none before, a secret door. We entered the tunnel, calling Speed, and the door shut behind us. By the time we'd located Speed and Gene, water was starting coming in. Oh, how horrible. But tell me, how did Gene get down here? Well, she disguised herself as a Chinese boy, slipped out of the house and came down on a rickshaw, said she was afraid of missing something. You know, I'll have to give that child a good talking to. She can't run around Hong Kong as if it were her backyard. And especially with the secret police. Contact with us while we are working brings her directly under the eye of the octopus. Hey, Ying, does the doctor know that about... I am a member of the secret police? <laughs> yes, Clint. Under the circumstances, it was necessary to tell him. In fact, the octopus probably knows my true identity, too, since I was openly leading the rescue work. Well, that's too bad. You were accomplishing so much as Li Ying, the tea merchant. Uh, perhaps it isn't as bad as we think. With the police at his very door, the octopus probably withdrew his spies on the dock and sought safer quarters. Uh, you took a great chance coming in here alone, Clint. Mm, we hadn't planned on that. I only wanted to locate the secret passage if possible. But when Speed disappeared, we had no choice. We had to find him. You well, see, by the way, Ying, how did you ever locate the secret door to this tunnel? By the merest chance. The doctor and I came down under the dock because I remembered Speed and Barney's experience under it the night of the flower boat raid. We inspected the seawall and never would have noticed anything unusual about it had the doctor not perceived a strand of false gray hair. False gray hair? What? Why, Barney? That's part of Barney's makeup. Yes. You see, I remembered you telling me he was to appear as an aged coolie. We inspected the seawall more closely, knowing that you all must have been there, and then saw a trickle of water coming from behind the wall, rather high up. Then Ying sent a diver down under the runway, and he discovered the pipes which were carrying the water inside the tunnel. Oh, this octopus is a monster. He must be destroyed. Uh, don't worry, Doctor. In spite of our narrow escape, we were nearer to him than ever before. I believe that we shall run him down, unless he leaves Hong Kong entirely. And then? And then we'll follow him, no matter where he goes. Oh, Ying. Yes, Clint? How many men did you bring with you? We not, along with the Hong Kong police, to throw a cordon around the whole Siang Dock. Then let's continue the search. I won't know we're near the octopus, or he wouldn't have dynamited that room at the end of the tunnel. And once we get Speed, Gene, and the doctor out of here, let's stay on the trail of that rat until we found him. Clint, don't do it. What do you mean? You've just come through a harrowing experience. Oh, but that's over and done with. No, it has had its effect on your body, whether you realize it or not. You're still tense. You're likely to snap at any minute. Oh, nonsense, Ying. I've gone through worse than this before and carried on until the end of the job at hand. But you had no one else but yourself to think about. This time you had Speed and Gene to worry over. Ying is right, Clint. As a physician, I would advise you to rest up from this excitement and exposure before tackling anything more. Oh, and give the octopus a chance to escape? I don't think he is ready to leave Hong Kong yet, Clint. Don't drive yourself too far. Remember, should you crack up, the service would lose its ace operator. Uh, very well, Ying. After finding Barney, Speed, and Jean, we'll suspend the search for a few hours. Perhaps it's best after all, because I want to cable Chief Riley what has happened and we'll probably receive an answer. Is the end of the tunnel much farther, Clint? Uh, no, Doctor. We may be able to hear their voices now if we call them. Oh, Speed! Barney! Hey, sounds like Clint. Here we are! Oh, I hear Jean's voice. Yeah. Thank heaven my little girl is safe. After this experience, Dr. Kingsley... I doubt if she will try to follow in the footsteps of the secret police again. Well, I'd take her back to Honolulu, but it's it's impossible for me to get away right now. Oh, if only Marsha were with us. You know, she's like a sister to the child. Well, we'll have Marsha back in no time. I'm going to get in touch with Bob Gilmore once we're out of this tunnel and see if he's picked up any information yet. It's Barney. Yes, yes, Barney. And I brought Ying and Dr. Kingsley and some of the police with me. You have? Then we're rescued. You bet. Daddy. Well, hello, Jason. Oh, Gene, Gene, honey. Never draw back. Am I hey, glad to see you? Oh, Dr. Pachacha, what happened well, to you? Something must have knocked me out, Barney, and the water carried me away from you. We couldn't look for you at first because the water was still pretty high. Yeah, but now most of it's in that room that was dynamite. And the rest of it ran out the door in the Siang Sea Wall. Golly, it looks good to see a crowd of people and light again. I'll never want to be alone for the rest of my life. Well, I'd never recognize you, Barney. Half your makeup has been washed away. But enough remains to change you completely. That ain't makeup, Doc. That's fright. I was scared to death, bobbing around in this dark tunnel, hitting my head on the roof. You were afraid, Barney? 
But you kept telling me not to be scared. It's the clown in me, Jane. Laughing while I'm scared, Stu. <laughs> clown is right. Well, come on, let's get out of this place now that we've found you and get into some dry clothes and have something to eat. Yeah, and something to drink besides ocean water. Maybe all right for a tuna, but not for me. It... Hey, where's Speed? Did he decide to stay down by the entrance? Speed? Yeah. Well, well, where is it? Haven't you seen him, Clint? As soon as the water went down, he started out looking for you. Yeah, slipped away in the dark before I knew what he was up to. Oh, and we didn't pass Speed in the tunnel. Yeah, well... What? Why, no, we thought he would be up here with you. Suffering wangdoodles. Then where is the kid? He couldn't go any place but up and down this tunnel. That's, That's right. right. Unless, yeah. unless there's another passage in this tunnel. You mean the octopus may have him? I don't know, but we've got to find out. Come on. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Hong Kong operator of the International Secret Police and Dr. Kingsley, backed by the police, break into the secret tunnel of the octopus headquarters at the Siong Dock to find Clint Barlow near the entrance. He tells them that the octopus dynamited a room at the end of the tunnel, thus draining some of the water which had just about reached the top of the tunnel that imprisoned the boys. Clint leads the rescuers back to Barney and little Jean Kingsley, only to learn that speed has disappeared somewhere in the tunnel. But, Clint, I tell you, the kid couldn't have gone very far. You came in sight not long after we found he'd slipped away to look for you. We'll find him if we have to tear the tunnel apart to do it. Ying? Yes, Clint? Tell the men to search every inch of the tunnel walls for another secret panel or door. Yes, I'll get them started now. No, sorry. Go All of you, search the man. tunnel walls carefully. Search. Watch for clues or signs of a struggle. This mud should contain many. Oh, oh Clint, oh. what could have happened to Speed? Well, now, don't you worry, Jean. Oh, Doctor. I think you'd better take her out of this tunnel. Oh, no. Not until you find Speed. Please, Clint, don't make me go. All right, then. But you stay behind Barney and me, Jean. We don't want to lose you now. Well, I'll keep hold of her hand, Clint. You needn't worry about her. Oh, fine. Now, Barney, you're sure Speed didn't go into that room that was dynamited? Sure, I'm sure. Because Jean and me was blocking the way in. He headed down the tunnel the way you came. Speed? Oh, Speed! Doggone that kid. What'd he have to do this for? We'll never get out of this darn tunnel if people keep on disappearing. Clint! Yeah, wait, wait, listen. Clint! Come here, quick! It's speed. Come on, let's go. How could you have passed him and not seen him, Clint? No, we didn't, Barney. The tunnel was absolutely empty until we came upon you and Jean. There he is, Clint. Oh, goody, we found him. Clint, 
Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Where on earth were you when I passed by here a few minutes ago, Speed? You'd never guess. Well, don't keep it a secret, kid. What's up? This rock. They throw your flashlight beside it. Huh? Another passage? Yeah. When I was looking for you, Clint, I couldn't see anything because it was so dark. So I ran into this big rock and a moon. Then there was sort of a rumbling noise and it slid back. And I suppose you walked right in, huh? Well, yes. I thought maybe you disappeared in there or something. I found a flashlight inside the tunnel. There's a tunnel like this one, only smaller. And drier, I bet. I was just going to explore it when I saw a button on the wall and I figured that worked the door. So I pushed it and sure enough... The rock slid back in place again. That is when you and the rest of us probably passed this spot, Clint. Well, didn't you hear us go by, Speed? No. You can't hear a thing with that rock's in place. I found a gun rack in there, too, with all sorts of guns and plenty of ammunition. Guns and ammunition? It was all so dark that I got kind of scared and thought I'd better open the rock again. And when I did, I heard you calling. Uh Uh-huh. You and me might as well hand in our badges, Clint. Looks like Speed's doing all the police work. Yes, entirely too much of it. Now, Speed, after this, you must obey my orders, or else you remain with Dr. Kingsley. You've been running too many risks lately. All right, Clint. I'll be careful. But now can't we explore this new tunnel? What? <laughs> no use, Clint. Speed takes to adventure and danger like most kids take to candy. Shall I step inside, Clint? There is not time for a complete search, but at least we can take the guns and ammunition from our enemy. Yeah, that's a good idea, Ying. I'll go with you. Hey, look out, Clint. Get back. The rock is sliding shut again. Hey, stop him! Look out! Closed. Here, let me see if I can open it again. Don't you think you ought to leave it closed, Speed? We've gotten into enough trouble with the octopus. <sighs> ah, darn it. Guess I'll have to, Gene. Can't budge it now. Yeah. Hey! No. Now what? Somebody must have pushed that button on the other side of the wall to have moved that rock back in place. Somebody was standing there all the time listening to what we were saying. You think so, Barney? Gee, then we've got to open it again. Oh, no. I've seen enough secret panels opening and shutting in this tunnel to last me for a good long time. Come on, let's get out of here and have a nice warm bath and get into some dry clothes. Being hungry and uncomfortable is getting monotonous. This is swell, Dr. Kingsley. After that meal and everything, I feel like I could sleep a month. Well, we'll turn in early tonight, Speed. That is, if Clint and Barney finish discussing their next move with Ying at a fairly early hour. Yeah, we certainly will, Doctor. Yeah, I'm practically out on my feet right now. Uh, By the way, Speed, how would you like to go for a swim? You ain't had one in a long time. (laughs) Hey, what's the matter? Are you all afraid to laugh because you might crack your face? (laughs) Maybe it's me, but when I crack a joke, nobody smiles. And when I haven't said anything funny, you all take it big. (laughs) It's you all right, Barney. We like to see you go into a slow burn when we don't laugh at your unfunny jokes. Oh, yeah? My jokes ain't so bad. I remember once down in Chile when I kidded that Indian out. All right, all right, uh, when are you going after Marsha, Clint? Well, I've been thinking about her, Jean. We have no clue as to her whereabouts, but if we play the right cards, the very one who caused her disappearance might lead us to her. The octopus. What do you mean? Well, he thought he had her sure on that tunnel speed, that we would never be able to bother him again. And when he learns that we have escaped, as he probably knows even now because of his elaborate spy system, he may lose his head for a short time, just long enough to make a hurried move that may lead us to Marsha. And once we found her, I think we'll have the octopus cornered. Yeah, if he just gets mad enough. No other man in the world would have escaped from that tunnel, Kwan Wu, but Clint Barlow did. The man's uncanny. He can come through certain disaster without a scratch. And bring whoever is with him to safety as well. I have never seen you so upset, Master. Because the secret police were never as near my headquarters before. Dynamiting me in the chamber saved their lives. And to think it was my order that did it. Too bad that the blast caused us to lose shortwave contact with the tunnel, Master. 
I should have liked to have known what took place in there. Yes, yes. I wonder if they happened to find the secret passage behind the rock door that you used to escape from the tunnel. With their luck, it is entirely possible. Yes, they did find that, master. What? I was not told? One of the dynamiters was there when Steve Gibson happened to find it by the merest chance. The boy stepped in, pressed the release button, and the rock door shut once again. Our operator was about to overcome the boy, but he seemed to sense danger and opened the secret door once more. Then Clint Barlow, Barney Dunlap, and the others joined him. As they were about to explore the passage, our operator closed it from the inside. Good. But the secret police are going to return in an effort to open the rock door again. They are, are they? And they may succeed. Well, let them. <laughs> in fact, I shall see to it that they do succeed in opening the rock door. What do you mean, master? I used dynamite once. I can use it again. When Barlow, Gibson, and Dunlap open the rock door, they will at the same time set off a charge of dynamite from which, this time, there will be no escape. But, Master, in avenging yourself, you will destroy a very important passage to your headquarters. It is the only one that links us with this young duck. It must be destroyed now that the police know of its existence, Quan Wu. I must risk the loss of the passage, perhaps even the loss of my Hong Kong headquarters. After all, I have other strongholds. But Hong Kong is your smuggling headquarters. Oh, I can easily establish another base for my operations. Besides, smuggling is only one of my activities. However, I shall probably remain here. The dynamite will remove the troublesome secret police. Master, what of Marsha Winfield? She is still a prisoner in the native house. Soon she will be moved, but meanwhile, there is someone else we must deal with. Uh, who? Li Ying. Now that he has revealed himself to be a member of the secret police, steps must be taken to uh, remove him. Yes, master. I understand. <laughs> but you will have nothing to do with that. Leave that to me. Your place is with Dr. Kingsley. From him you may learn something important of Barlow's movements. For the end morning. Very well. And now, I shall give orders concerning the preparation of the rock chamber for Gibson, Barlow, and Dunlap. The rock chamber that will be... <laughs> their tomb. Ying, uh, you'd better return to your tea house and see if anything has happened during your absence. And meanwhile, I'm going to cable Chief Riley. Well, when are we going back to the Seong Tunnel, Clint? Uh, tomorrow, Speed. It's well guarded now, and tomorrow we'll take enough men along to break into that tunnel hidden by the rock door. Can I come too? No, absolutely not, Jean. That's no place for little girls. And don't let me catch you slipping out of the house again without my consent. All right, Daddy. Beats me how these kids can come through things by the skin of their teeth. And then want to go right back into it again. Me? I'd be happy if I never saw that tunnel again. Well, we've got to get back there, Bonnie. The longer we delay, the longer time the octopus will have of escaping. Now, perhaps by following up that clue, we'll nab him. I don't know. I got a hunch that that tunnel ain't going to be healthy for us tomorrow. Uh, you and your hunches. Clint, when are you going to see Quan Wu? Quan Wu? Or, I don't know, Speed. Depends on what we learn at the tunnel tomorrow. Why? Well, I've been wondering about him. Looks kind of funny... Him being on the dock the night those slaves were smuggled down the Siong, and then him telling Dr. Kingsley not to help us or he might lose Jean. Yeah, I quite agree with you. I think we'll have a talk with Wu at the earliest possible moment. But meantime, that tunnel is more important. Well, let's not solo in there this time. Let's take plenty of reinforcements. We will. Ying, bring every available man you can. Yes, please. Uh oh, I hope that isn't a professional call. I'd like some rest after what I've been through. Hello? Oh, yes. Just a moment, please. It's for you, Ying. Well, who knows you're here, Ying? It's probably from the tea house, Clint. I told them to reach me here or leave word if I was absent, should they want me. Hello? Hello? Yes? Yes? What? Yes, I'll give them the message, and I will be right down. Now what? What message? A message just came in over my shortwave set from Bob Gilmore. Bob Gilmore? A message for us? Yes. He said that he has located Marsha Winfield. <laughs>
Gibson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Barney and little Jean Kingsley were rescued from a secret tunnel of the octopus gang in the nick of time by Lee Ying, Dr. Kingsley, and the police. Before leaving, however, Speed discovered another passage in the tunnel hidden by a secret rock door. After a few hours' rest, the boys planned to return and search this tunnel, believing that it may lead them directly to their enemy. Meanwhile, the octopus plans to dynamite the tunnel as soon as they move the rock door. Before any of this comes to pass, however, a shortwave message comes from Bob Gilmore saying that he has located Marsha Winfield. We find Clint talking to Bob over the doctor's shortwave set with the others anxiously listening. Hello. Uh, Bob, the tea house relayed your message to us here at the doctor's a few minutes ago. I tried to reach you at the doctor's, Clint, but I couldn't. I know he has a new call. It's IS-78. You got that? Mm-hmm. Now, what have you learned about Marsha? Well, a friend of mine wanted me to look over a piece of engineering about 30 miles from my house yesterday. We drove over a seldom-used road since it's located in an out-of-the-way place, and on the way had a blowout. Yes? It was near a native house, a little more than a shack, and we went over for a drink of water after we'd changed the tire. An old Chinese woman met us about 20 feet from the house and brought us some water. While we were drinking it, another woman came out of the door. She was dressed in rags and seemed to be walking in a daze. Didn't pay much attention to her at first. And then suddenly I realized that I was looking at a white girl, Marsha Winfield. I recognized her from her picture. Golly, he did find her. Quiet, quiet, sweet. Go on, Bob. What did you do? My first inclination was to get her away from the place as quick as possible. Then I figured that it must be well guarded. The octopus would never leave her with just an old woman. So I thought I'd better report it to you before making a move. I see. That was wise of you, Bob. Uh, What shall I do? Uh, Nothing. We have more important business in Hong Kong right now. I'll get in touch with you if we should be able to get away. What? Yes, I'll get in touch with you as soon as possible. IS-78 signing off. Clint, what'd you tell him that for? You really mean you're not going to look for Marsha? Good heavens, you can't mean that, Clint. No, Dr. Kingsley. But you forget that the octopus probably listens to every conversation we carry on over short wave. His set can pick up anything. If anything does get by him, it's only because he isn't listening in at that time. That's true. I'd forgotten. And so was Bob, evidently. He sounded thunderstruck. But if I'd given him direct orders, the octopus would know he's working for us. You think Bob will try and go back to that house alone, Clint? We won't give him time. Oh, Barney? Yeah? Uh, how would you like to fly the bullet monoplane up to Siang tomorrow at dawn? Seeing as how I ain't rested up from my long swim in the tunnel, I might not look my prettiest. But for Marsha... Say, I'd fly to the moon, pal. Good. Well, then proceed to Gilmore's house, pick him up, and then have him direct you to the house where he saw Marsha. Yeah. It's going to be dangerous, just the two of you, but you've handled lots worse. You're darn tootin'. Bob and me'll clean up that octopus hangout and bring Marsha back here quick as a wink. You'll have another guest for dinner tomorrow night, Doc. Well, I hope so, Bonnie. Once Marsha is safe, my troubles will be over. Well, can I go with Barney, Clint? No, I want you to work with me, Speed. There's still a matter of the tunnel, you know. Hey, will I miss out on that fun? <laughs> Aren't you glad? I thought you didn't want to go back to the tunnel. Ah, uh, where's your sense of humor? I was only kidding. Wait till I come back, Clint. Uh, we've got to work fast, Barney. And it's even better if we're in two places at once. It may confuse the octopus uh, so much that he'll trap himself. Oh, I hope so. Then Marsha will be back with us, and we can all have a good time instead of always chasing him. Well, with the octopus captured, everyone can rest easy. <laughs> I know the British authorities of Hong Kong will certainly be grateful to the secret police. Yeah, we'll do the best we can, Doctor. And now we'd all better get to bed, huh? And you, Ying, uh, return to the tea house and get some sleep. Speed and I'll be over right after we see Barney off at dawn. <laughs> Well, 
Well, Kwan Mu, you heard Bob Gilmore's conversation with Barlow. What did you make of it? That Gilmore is most anxious to rescue Marsha Winfield. Obviously. And from Barlow's reply, it is also obvious that he thought I might be listening in. How so, Master? He and Barney Dunlap would do anything to see that girl safe. They gave that away when they so foolishly tried to rescue her from the flower boat and almost lost their lives by the attempt. Do you think for one moment that Barlow would stay in Hong Kong if they had even a slight clue as to Marshall's whereabouts? Do you think he will go to the hiding place? Most assuredly. Either he will go or he will send Barney Dunlap. You seem very sure of that. I know Barlow's brain only too well. Then what of the tunnel? Plans will go ahead as before. And no matter who opens that rock door, the place will be blown to bits. We cannot risk a slip up there, Wu. That passage leads directly to this room. Yes, master. And now, is there any change in my orders? No. Go to Dr. Kingsley's residence tomorrow morning as we planned. And see what you can learn. But be most careful. I shall. I would have no worry at all if only I had my talisman of good luck. What are you talking about? The jade setting of my ring. I told you some time ago that I had lost it. Ever since then, we have been pursued by ill luck. Ah, superstition again. You are a fool, Kwan Wu. And now, uh, send splinters to me. Splinters? The renegade aviator? He almost betrayed you once. And he has paid dearly for the near betrayal in my torture chambers. I think that he has learned how to be silent by now. And what are your plans for him? He is to fly to the house which hides the Winfield girl. Meanwhile, I shall talk to my men there over my ultra-shortwave set, giving them further orders. You do not trust Splinter? No. Not until he has the girl with him. Then he too must be careful, since it would go hard with him should she be found on his plane. Everyone is looking for her. The Chinese government, as well as the Hong Kong police, and the international secret police. Splinters will see to it that no one sees her in his plane for the safety of his own skin. You are very wise, Master. I cannot afford to overlook any detail, Wu. Now, send splinters to me. He will take off tomorrow morning at dawn. thing I love my work. Ain't decent getting up at an hour like this to fly up any river, much less the Siang. I'm not a bit sleepy, Barney. Well, you shouldn't be, the way you was pounding your ear. I had big things to think about. Couldn't sleep a wink. <laughs> oh, no? Those weren't your thoughts that kept me awake. I know snores when I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, someday there's going to be one complaint too many about my snoring, and I'll go someplace where I'm appreciated. <laughs> then you'll have to go someplace where you don't sleep. Once you doze off, the worst in you comes out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, where's that plane? You're getting too funny too early in the morning. Looks like they're getting ready to wind her up, Barney. Yeah. You know, these British are great people. We called up the port officials last night to tell them about this flight, and here they have everything ready for us, right up to the minute. Ah, uh, yes, they've been great. I only hope that we can remove the octopus from their territory in repayment. Say, if we do that, they'll be ready to give us Hong Kong. Barney, you remember to bring your revolver along? I sure did, kid. Now, don't you go worrying about me. I'll send word to you over the doctor's set just as soon as we have Marsha. Yes, and don't forget to have Bob call us when you arrive. If everything is okay, have him say, the weather is good up here. The weather is good up here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, I've got that. And uh, what if I run into trouble? Well, then talk to me yourself, because it'll be too late to hide your presence anyhow. And bring Marsha back with you and Bob, if you can get him to come. His life will be in more danger than ever if you succeed in rescuing Marsha on his tip. Yeah. Well, I'd better be getting started or Bob will go and try to rescue her by his lonesome. Uh, we'll get out the float with you. Okay, let's get going. All right, come along, Speed. Now, don't communicate with us at all while you're in the air, Bobby. The octopus mustn't know your movements, mustn't even know that you're flying up to Sion. He may guess, but he won't know where to strike. Yeah, I don't want him sending me into a spin again. Once was enough. We'll work on that tunnel with Li Ying while you're gone, Barney. And you're liable to still be in it when I come back, if I know anything about octopus tunnels. 
I suppose I'll have to rescue you guys. <laughs> you take care of you yourself and Bob Gilmore, and you'll have your hands full. Ah, oh, it'll be a cinch. You ain't going to see Quan Wu today, are you, Clint? No, the tunnel's more important. Well, here we are. Go ahead, climb in, Barney. Yep. Motor yeah. sure sounds nice. You'll have to hand it to the octopus on this plane job. He knows how to build them. Well, see, the two dealers did a job of flying it. You don't want any crack-ups at this stage of the game. You, you don't want any crack-ups? What about me? I'm more interested in staying in the air than you are. <laughs> well, I guess you are at that. But so long, Barney. Happy landings. So long, pal. Take care of him, Speed. Don't know what he's liable to do while I'm gone. <laughs> All right, Barney. And you be careful. Talk to us over the short wave set as soon as you can. You bet I will. The seagulls are getting kind of big around yeah. here. It's a plane, all right. An octopus plane. What? Yeah. Don't you recognize it? Even the light of dawn. Only it's painted black. An octopus plane? Suffering wang doodles. No matter where you go, underground or in the air, you run into something that swims or flies for the octopus. Look, he's heading up the Siong River. Yeah, he... what? He is, sure enough. Funny, the octopus has gotten wind of our flight. That lets me out. I don't crave another dog fight like that last one. No, no, no. Stay in the plane, you big ox. Don't you understand? That plane's going after Marsha. What? Sure. That shortwave conversation we had with Bob last night didn't fool the octopus at all. He guessed that we would go after Marsha and is sending one of his men to take her away before we can get there. What? Let me after that guy. Wait, wait a minute. Keep out of sight of him. At least don't let him know that you're following. And pick up Bob Gilmore before you do anything else. Yeah, because he knows where Miss Marsha is. I'll do my best, fellas. Meanwhile, keep your fingers crossed. This flight won't be no picnic. Ah!